Welcome back aliens, my name is Devin Reddy and in this video we'll talk about Spring Framework. When you talk about the enterprise market, the most famous language there is Java because when you want to build huge applications which are scalable, secure, Java is preferred. And the one of the biggest ecosystem for the enterprise applications is in Java. And the framework, the most famous framework for Java is Spring. Now when I say most famous, there are other frameworks as well, which are quite famous, but not more than Spring because it solves the problem of developers. See, Spring started in 2003. It's not a new framework, right? It's, it's old, it's been 21 years now. The reason it started is to solve the problem of Java EE. Java EE is used to build enterprise application and it was great. The only problem is it was complex and heavy. To make it lightweight, to make it simple, Spring came up with a project. And of course, initially it was a project, but later on, they added some more projects. So initially it was Spring Framework, which provides some features. And later on, they started adding more modules to it. And now when you say Spring is not just a framework or a project, it's basically an umbrella. It has multiple sub projects to it. And whenever you want to build enterprise level solutions and not just that, if you, even if you want to make a simple application, you can use Spring. One of the issue a lot of people talk about about Spring is it's heavy, It's uh, you have to write a lot of codes in Java, not with the latest version of Java and not with Spring Framework. Spring basically has something called Spring Boot and using that you can build your first API in minutes maybe two minutes, it's that fast. Spring Framework, it's fun, it has multiple modules. So let me just head towards the Spring Framework or Spring website. So you can go to spring.io and it has details about everything. So what is Spring? Uh, you can see they have different events coming up, ignore that. Uh, so what you can do with Spring is you can build microservices, you can build reactive applications, you can build for cloud, you can build web applications, serverless, uh, I mean, multiple options are there. But the beauty is if you go to the Spring projects, now this is a project and if you expand this, it's huge. When I say huge, I just have to click on view all projects. And every time I go to this place, there's a chance that there will be new project added. Example, we got Spring, Spring Boot, I was talking about it is one of the easiest way to build projects. Uh, we got Spring Framework, Spring Cloud, Spring Data, Spring Security, Spring AI. So yeah, we can also build AI applications using Spring now. Uh, we got a uh, thing which I use, Spring Web Services. And there are other projects as well, which you can see here. Initial days, we used to, they used to keep everything in one section, but now we have a separate sections for it, the extra projects. So this are the projects which we have in Spring. So basically it provides you a lot of different features. One of the best features about Spring, and that's how it started, is dependency injection. What exactly it is, we'll talk about in the upcoming videos. The plan is to actually create the entire series for Spring. And you might be saying, hey, we already have that on channel. What we have on channel is Spring 5. We're talking about Spring 6. And for that, basically, I need motivation. Of course, it will take a lot of time and I need motivation from you. Of course, I will motivate you to learn and practice it. You have to also motivate me to keep making videos. You can do that by commenting on this video. Also like the video so that I will know that, yes, I have to spend uh, enough time and energy to make this series and you are waiting for it. So let me know that by liking the video, comment something in the videos, maybe spring or uh, waiting for the next video. I need comments that give me the motivation and it also helps the YouTube algorithm to promote the video, right? Uh, so you can do that in the comments and maybe the setting the target is a new trend. So maybe let's say 50 comments, let's start slow and then we'll build up. So yeah, in the entire series, the plan is to actually talk about dependency injection, Spring Core, uh, Spring Web. You can build web application using Spring and we have talked about the project here. So we have that in the Spring. Uh, we can have web Spring Web. We can also have Spring Data JPA for, data, for database connectivity. Uh, we'll talk about Spring Boot, how do you build application. So the, the idea is to also make videos on Spring Security. Uh, we have talked about Spring Data. Also the cloud applications, cloud deployment. And again, I need your motivation there. We have talked about what is Spring. And then we have discussed that we can build applications, the enterprise application, web application with the help of Spring Framework. And before we talk about the actual topic and discuss what other components are, let's talk about the project we are going to do. Of course, right, when you are learning something, you want to do some projects side by side. Now this is the project which you're going to build. Of course, this doesn't look like a good UI, 
But that doesn't matter. We are learning here Spring Framework, not HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, right? So let's focus on the features of the backend. And just to show how it will look on the front end, of course, designing can be a different thing. You can help me in that. But this is what we're going to build. Now, we are trying to build a simple e-commerce website. Of course, we, are not, we cannot build Amazon here. That's a huge application. But a simple e-commerce website where someone can lease their products and someone can buy it. Of course, we're not doing the end-to-end -end part of sending the product from the warehouse to the client, but at least a, a person should be able to add to the cart or something like that. So this is what we're going to build, of course, from scratch and while learning a concept. So let's say if we talk about one concept and we'll see how do we include that concept in this project and slowly we are going to build this. So this is not what you will see in the first video after this. Uh, you will see something blank and we don't have anything there, we'll build from scratch, okay? But before we talk about this, uh, let's set the target. So as I mentioned before, for the first video of Spring, we set the target for 50 comments. Uh, this time, since we got a good response, let's set the target for 200 comments. Okay, that's how I'll be motivated for the next video. So please motivate me, make sure that we complete the target of 200 comments. So coming back here, this is what we're going to build. So this is the homepage. Now on the homepage, I can see certain products here. I can see a laptop or a fan or a telephone or a Dio. Of course, uh, they should have some images as well, but we'll see how do we put that here later. Uh, or you can help us if you are good with UI. You will find the link in description. So let's say if, if I want to buy a fan. So if I click on fan here, this is the detail about the fan. Uh, this is a fan icon. We got the product name, the brand, uh, description, and the price. Then we got an option of art to cart. Then we got stock available five, product listed on this date. And even I can update this. I, I should be able to update this detail. Maybe I want to say the description is not just top speed, but also silent fan or something like that. So in that case, I should be able to update it. And we should be able to delete this. Example, if I click on delete, now it's gone. You can see fan is not there. Okay, so we have to refresh the homepage. Yeah, so the fan is not there. So this is how basically you can add, update, and delete the products from the page. Also, we can uh, sort this by category. Example, here we got Dio in fashion. So you can see the category is fashion here. And if you see this telephone, this is in electronics. So we should be able to sort the products based on the category. It's not uh, complete yet, but we'll build it. We'll build to categorize it. And uh, if I go back to homepage, this is what you will see. If I go to Telesco here, that takes you to the Telesco homepage. This is the official page of Telesco. Go back here. And yeah, this is what I want. Also, I should be able to search the product and it's not implemented yet. No problem, we'll do that. Cool, so this is what we have. Now, this is what you're going to build. Now, if I want to show you the code for this, this is the code for the existing project. Uh, you can see we have two sections here. We got a backend and we got a frontend here. Uh, let me close all the code files because I don't want to confuse you with the code files. Okay, so we got a frontend and we got a backend here. Now frontend is built with React. Again, this is not a React playlist, so we are not going to focus on the React one, but we'll, I will show you how the React code looks like, but uh, not in this video, in the uh, other video. And then this is the backend. This is what we need to build. So example, let's say if I give you just a frontend, of course you will see the page, but then the page will not have any, any products because the backend is not there. So we have to slowly build this backend to give something to the front end. Okay, that's what you're going to build. And uh, let's say if you don't want to build a front end, you don't want to work with React, you can also test this with your uh, REST clients. It can be Postman or, or some other clients. Let me know in the comments with what client you have used before apart from Postman. Okay, so this is what we are going to build and this is the basically a web application. But then when you talk about Spring, we're not going to directly start with web application, we'll start with the Spring code. What if you want to build a standalone application and uh, you want to achieve the same thing where you should be able to list the products or delete the products, how we are going to do that? So we'll start with that and then we'll move towards the web part. And remember the target for this video is 200 comments. Also, if I can get uh, 500 likes, that will be awesome. Now, till this point, we have talked about what is Spring, and then we have seen the project which we are going to build. But when you want to learn a Spring framework, there are certain things which you should know and you should have in your machine. The first thing you need to know in Spring is Java. So the prerequisite is the Java language. Of course, right, when you're learning a framework, you need to also know a language on which you're going to build. So you need to know Java from start to end. So when I say end, there's actually no end, but at least you should know 
uh, till threads and exception handling and collection. So basically I'm talking about the syntax of Java, loops, conditional statements, how do you work with array, uh, working with uh, exceptions, threads, and collection. Maybe threads is not that important, but you should know it. Uh, collection is very important. And one of the most important thing is the oops concept. So oops and interfaces, abstraction, uh, those things are very important. Next, uh, when you talk about framework, we also need a build tool. So when you work on a project, there are certain build tools which you have to use. In fact, any one, either it can be Maven or Gradle. So in this particular series, we are going to use Maven. But if you know Gradle before, it will be easier for you to understand Maven. Uh, and if you don't know any of this, Maven is preferred for this series. Next, uh, you need to also know about database connectivity because anyway, we are going to connect our Spring application with database. So if you know JDBC, it will be easier for me to explain you the connectivity there. Then you have to understand Hibernate. See, we are going to use Spring Data JPA here. And then I'm not going to explain how things are working behind the scenes because that's a part of Hibernate concept. So you need to know Hibernate so that you can understand Spring Data JPA properly. And also, uh, if you can work with XML files, uh, that will be better. So get used to XML JSON because uh, of course this course is not about JSON and XML. We will be doing some configuration in XML and uh, the Passing of data between the client and a server uh, will be done with the help of JSON format. So you should know what is JSON. Now question arise from where you're going to learn this. So don't worry, you are basically covered. So in the description, you will find the videos for this. Basically you will find the video for a complete Java course where you get Java, Maven, Hibernate in one video. It also has Spring, but it has Spring 5. We are going, we are going to learn Spring 6 here. So till Spring, you can learn everything. And uh, for JSON also, there will be video. XML also, there will be video. So make sure that you complete those. So those are the prerequisites before you start with the course. Also, you need to have certain things in your machine. Example, you need JDK. Of course, right? Java Development Kit, because you're working on Java. Uh, then you also need a editor. Of course, you can use Notepad here, but then uh, maximum time you will spend in debugging and stuff. So prefer if you can use a IDE, which stands for Integrated Development Environment. Now there are multiple options here and you can use whatever you want to use. Example, uh, we can use VS Code, we can use Eclipse, we can use IntelliJ IDEA and there are multiple tools, but I can work on this three properly, so I'm naming this. Uh, VS Code is good, but it's not optimized for Java. They are still working on it. It's not there yet. Uh, so if you are happy with VS Code, please continue with it. Because I'll see ultimately we are using a Maven for a build tool and for the project structure. It doesn't matter which ID you are going to use, the project structure will remain same. Uh, you can also use Eclipse, which is open source and free. Uh, and it's one of the best tools available for Java development. So Eclipse, you can use enterprise version. And then comes IntelliJ IDEA. Now the thing is, IntelliJ IDEA is great, but they have two versions. One is a community version, and second is the ultimate version. The community version is free. The ultimate version is paid. Now, if you are sure that you're going to work on Java uh, on different projects, and if you join a company, you're going to use IntelliJ IDEA, I would suggest you to explore the ultimate version. It's awesome. Especially for students, they give you discount or free. You can check it out, but it's great. Community version is also good. And we are going to use community version here. And you will be saying, hey, you know, in community version, we don't have all the features. You know what? We don't need all the feature when you're learning things. And also if you're building a small project and if you have a small team, community version works. But of course, if you want some advanced features, if you want to boost your productivity, explore the ultimate version, at least give it a try for a trial version. So yeah, that's about the tools, the things which are needed in your machine and you're good to go. For JDK, uh, the version is go for about 17 because if you want to work with Spring 5, JDK 8 works. For Spring 6, minimum you need JDK 17. I have JDK 21 here in this machine, so I'm going to use that. Uh, again, if you want to use it, you can also use 22 version, but LTS versions are better. So stick to 21 and that perfectly works. So yeah, that's a prerequisite and the tools required for this particular course. Now till this point, we have talked about what is Spring, we have talked about the prerequisites. And then in, when, we talk, when we talked about Spring Framework, we introduced a term there called dependency injection. But that was just a name. What exactly this concept means? In fact, in this video, we'll not just talk about dependency injection, but also IOC. 
because Spring started with this concept. Of course, it has a lot of features, but then this remains the core of it. So what exactly these two terms are? So before we talk about it, the target for this video is 200 comments. Okay, so let's talk about IOC. See, when you talk about a typical application, it can be a web application or the enterprise application, See, ultimately, you want to give this application for your clients, right? So you have a client. Now, this can be a browser. This can be your a mobile application. doesn't matter. And then what you want on the screen is data. So most of the application are data-driven application. You use it for the data, right? And typically, this data is stored in a database. Now, it doesn't matter is it a SQL database or no SQL database. That's a different topic. The point is, the data is coming from database or maybe from some external service. But then how do you send your data from database to client? And that's where you write this server-side code, right? Now in Java, we can do that with the help of servlet. So somewhere in between, you need a system which will interact with the data database, right? So when a client sends a request, uh, you get the response back and then uh, your application interacts with the database, right? Now this can be a standard application. This can be a web application as well. Uh, if it is web application, you use servlet in between. So this box here represents a servlet, or this is done with the help of servlet. But now we are talking about Spring, right? And a typical application, how it will look like. We normally create multiple layers. So of course, we'll talk about this in detail uh, when we talk about Spring Web, but typically we have multiple layers in between. Uh, just to show you here. So we got a layer here. Uh, of, of course, this will be a class in Java. And then we have one more layer here. Of course, this will be a class and we have one more layer here. So the role of this particular layer here is to uh, accept the client request. The role of this layer is to do any business logic. And the role of this layer is to connect with database, right? So we have different classes for different work here, right? Typically they are called as controllers, services, and uh, uh, repositories, right? So don't go with this short form, doesn't matter. We have different layers, that's important. Now, uh, the dependency becomes here is if you have a controller here who wants to talk to a service class, basically in Java, everything is object, right? So basically we have to work with a concept of object oriented programming and everything in Java is an object. That means if you want to work with service in the controller, we have to create object of a service inside the controller. So what I'm saying is imagine there's a class called controller in which if you want to use service methods, basically you need the object of service, right? So this is a class service and this is the reference. So if you want to use the service inside the controller, you have to basically create the object of it. And Java is object driven. Same applies to the uh, service. Let's say if service wants to work with the repository, imagine there's a class called service and in this class, of course, you need to use some features of repository. We have to create object of repository here. And mind you, this is not the object, this is just a reference. We have to literally create an object by using a new keyword. That means in Java, this is only three classes, right? Imagine if you have a Java application which has thousands of classes. Okay, now that's exaggerated. Let's say you have hundreds of classes. So you have to create a class, you have to create an object of one class in another class, and not just for one, we have multiple classes there. So what if, let's say we have a philosophy here by saying, hey, you know, let me make the work of Java developers simple. What if there is some external power who says, hey, Java developer, in your application, you focus only on the logic. Let me handle the object creations. That's a philosophy, right? So let someone else take care of it. And as a Java developer, now you're happy is because you'll be saying what's difficult in object creation, right? We can simply use a new keyword and object can be created. See, it's not that simple. When you say you are creating an object, you have to manage the entire cycle of it. It's not just about creation. It's also about managing the object, destroying the object, right? And we don't do that, right? We simply create the object, depending upon how many requests we get for every new request, we create new object. And sometimes we don't need multiple objects. And still we do it. We create those objects. So what if you say, hey, let me focus on the logic. Let someone else in the world take care of it. That's the concept of IOC, which stands for inversion of control. So what it means is typically we create the object by ourselves. That means we have a control on the object creation. But what if you give it to someone else? That is inversion of control. You're giving the control to someone else. 
right? That's IOC. But then IOC is just a principle, it's a philosophy. So we need certain technique to do it. And that's where the concept of dependency injection comes here. So dependency injection is the actual implementation of IOC. So how do we implement IOC in, in Spring or in Java is with the help of dependency injection. It's a, it's a concrete technique. So a lot of people get confused between IOC and DI and they, get conf they, they think they are similar. Yes, they do the same thing, almost the same thing, but IOC is a principle, right? And design, uh, the dependency injection is the design pattern. It's the actual thing which we do. So in Spring, to achieve IOC, we use DI, dependency injection. So what we are saying is we have some external thing. Uh, he, in this case, it is Spring. Spring says, you don't worry. Every time you want an object, just ask for the object. I will give it to you. That is injecting the object. It sounds cool, right? So that means if you talk about this particular example here where you have a controller and a service. So let's say a controller here needs the object of service. We don't have to actually say new service. That's not our job here. You can simply say inject. You can ask Spring Framework to inject the object. You just mention the reference. Spring will give you the object. That is called the dependency injection. So basically there are three techniques to achieve dependency injection. One is the constructor injection. So what you do in the controller class is you create a constructor and in that constructor you pass the reference of service and you say now since I need service here, inject the object. That's one way. Uh, the second way is setter. So maybe you can create a setter methods for that service uh, reference and uh, you can do the setter injection. The third way of doing this is the field injection. So in Java, we have a concept of loose coupling. Basically what you do is uh, you don't have a tight, you don't have a concrete implementation of one class and the other, uh, you code for the interfaces, right? Uh, so if you use a field injection, somewhere you're stopping it. You're not able to mock test and all those stuff. Again, it will make much more sense once we go forward. Uh, so field injection is not recommended. You can go for constructor and setter. We are going to use field injection in this course, but we'll also focus on constructor and setter. So that's dependency injection. That simply means someone else is injecting the object in your application. And that someone else in our case is a Spring Framework. So I hope it makes some sense. And uh, once we start implementing it, it will make much more sense. So before we talk about Spring Boot, the target for this video is 250 comments. Now till this point, we have talked about Spring Framework, right? And we are excited to understand how this framework works and whatever things it promises, how it deals with that. So yes, Spring Framework is amazing, right? And whatever application we are going to build now is with the help of Spring. So let's say you want to build an application. This can be anything in the world. Even it can be a huge application or it can be a application for hello world. Typically what happens is when you want to build the application, of course you have your Java code with you. And then to make it work, Spring says, hey, you know, doesn't matter how many classes you have, I will take care of the object creation. And you are quite happy because now you don't have to worry about the objects. Spring says, I will take care of it. So let's say in your application, you, ha you have three classes and you say, hey Spring, create object of, of these three classes and Spring is happy to do that. So let's say in your application now you have 100 or 1000 classes. Can Spring handle all the objects? Of course it can. But the question is, do you want Spring to handle all the classes? You know, most of the time, we don't even want the object of few classes. Let's say you have a lot of classes here and out of all these classes, you need objects of only few classes. How do you talk to your Spring framework by saying, hey, don't create objects for everything. I don't want all those things, I just want Few. Spring says, okay, tell me which one you want. And that's where when you talk to the framework, we have to do that in the configuration file. It can be XML file or it can be a property file, but you have to talk to the framework. That means just because you're using a framework, you will not be able to run your code in the first go. You have to first do the configuration. Next part. Let's say if you're building a web application. Now, if you want to run your web application, basically you need a server. In terms of Java, uh, we need something called a Tomcat server. Of course, we have multiple options. Let's say if you want, if you're building a web application in Spring, you need to have a Tomcat server. That means in your machine, even before you run your code, you have to make sure that you have installed Tomcat, you have configured Tomcat, then only you can run your application. So you'll be saying, hey, what's wrong with that? I mean, of course we can do configuration, we can install Tomcat. 
See, the problem is when you have a long project, it makes sense to spend few hours or days doing the configuration because the project will go for a year. But what if you are doing some experiment? What if you want to get started in few minutes? See, most of the languages nowadays, they are doing that. If you talk about Python or JavaScript, they have their frameworks. And if you want to at least print Hello World, you can do that in minutes. Now, this is what Spring was lacking way back and Java was lagging way back. And that's where we got something called a Spring Boot. Now Spring Boot says, all your problems of configuration, let me take care of it. What if you can get your project running in few minutes? And that's what Spring Boot gives you. It's not a new project, it's there from a long time, but it basically solves your problem of building a project in less time. So does it mean that Spring Boot is different from Spring Framework? Not exactly. See, underlying, it's all Spring Framework, right? On top of that, you have one more layer of Spring Boot. So you can actually build application directly using Spring Framework, or if you want to make it easy, you can use Spring Boot. Again, that's an optional stuff. But this optional thing is very, very important and uh, it will make your work faster. So basically, we can use a Spring Boot, which is a opinionated framework, which means it will give you certain things the way it wants and you can simply use it to run your application. Let me show you how, what I'm talking about. So let's say if I go to the spring.io, the official website, and instead of this website, if I just say start.spring.io, it will take you to a website. Now see, when you talk about building a project in different IDEs, we have an option of directly saying a new project and you can create a Spring project. In Spring project, basically you create a Maven project. Again, we'll see that in, in some time or in the upcoming videos, but basically you have to create a Maven project at the Spring dependency, a lot of different steps, right? IntelliJ IDEA ultimate version gives you an option of creating a Spring Boot project directly. But since we are not going to go for the ultimate version, we don't want to pay for it. We have a good alternative. What you can do is you can go to Spring Initializer, which is this website, start.spring.io, and you can mention what kind of project you're building. So I'm building a Maven project. This is a build tool. The language I'm going for is Java. And then the Spring Boot version, so this is the update version. So you can see we have 3.2.5. We can even go for the RC1, but I just want to stick to the stable one, which is 3.2.5. And depending upon when you're watching this, you can just use that particular version. The group, I will say com.telisco. And the project name is, let's say, a demo app. And then the packaging is I'm going for Java. Now this, this is where the beauty lies. You know, if you talk about the Spring Framework or any web application in Java, you can create a project and if you want to deploy it on the cloud, basically you create a var file. So var, var stands for web, web archive. And then you basically push your var file in the Tomcat to run it. Multiple steps, right? Spring Boot says, don't worry, you can create a jar file. But the problem is jar file, we cannot run jar file on the Tomcat. Then how it will work? What if you don't need external Tomcat? What if the project itself has a Tomcat? I mean, that will be awesome, right? So basically Spring Boot says, if you want to build a web project, you will get a embedded Tomcat. So I will select JAL, and I'll show you what embedded Tomcat I'm talking about. And then I can select my Java version. So in this machine, I got Java 21. So I will go with that. It is LTS version, so it's safe to use. And dependencies. So what are things we need? So of course, if you remember when we talked about Spring Framework, I mentioned that there are multiple projects inside Spring and we don't need all. Depending upon your use case, you will choose one. So I will click on add dependencies. So you can see there are a lot of options here to choose from and you don't have to know everything. Uh, use whatever you need. Example, here I want to build a web application. So I will simply say uh, Spring Web. If you want to add database connectivity, you can also add uh, JPA, but we don't need that at this point. Uh, if you want to get a long box support, you can choose that. If you want to uh, use GraphQL, you can use that. Uh, so as I mentioned, there are so many options here, but I just want to stick to one, which is Spring Web and click on generate. Now, before I click on generate, I will show you how this configuration looks like. So it will give you the entire configuration. We can see we got a dependency, which is Spring Boot Starter Web here. The Java version is 21. This is my project name. And this is the Spring Boot version, which we are using. And behind this, it will use Spring Framework. I will show you the code. So I'll click on download. You can even click on the uh, generate here. So you can see in the downloads, I got this project, which is demo app. 
What I will do is I will just unzip it. So unzipping is done on the other screen, but uh, I will just open that project now in my IDE. Now you can use any IDE here. You can use Eclipse, you can use VS Code, you can use IntelliJ IDEA community version or the Ultimate version. So I'm using a community version here. Just to show you the proof, I will click on not update. I will click on about, and you can see this is a community version. And I will click on open the project. So this is the project which I've downloaded. Click on open and voila, you got your project. And the beauty is, if I expand the dependencies, I think it will take some time to download. Okay, download it too fast. And you can see it had added so many dependencies here. Uh, the For the Jackson, for JSON conversion, uh, we got, uh, micrometer for observing. We got Tomcat. You can see we got embedded Tomcat. So basically you don't need to have the external Tomcat here. And if you go down, uh, we got Spring Boot, but also we got Spring Framework. You can see we got Spring Code. So all the things which are Spring required for Spring Code or Spring Project, we got it here, okay? Uh, let me just drop it here. And now let me create a Hello World. So what I will do is just to create Hello World. Now, if you have worked with Savlet or any other language before, uh, basically, we, the, we do multiple steps, right? But let me show you the code in Spring, which will print Hello World. I'm, I'm not going to explain everything in this video, how Spring Web works. We have a separate section on that. But just to show you how to build application, I will get a class and I will name this class as Hello. I will just simply say Hello. And then I will just return, I will create a method here. And this method is responsible to print hello world on the screen. So I will say public string. I will simply say greet. And this will return hello world. A very simple method, right? Nothing fancy for server. A simple class is just that if you want this to work, you simply say here rest controller. And we have to map it with, again, I'm not explaining it here. We have a detailed topic on this. What is request mapping? What is rest controller? We'll talk about it. At this point, just go for two annotations and say, I will say uh, slash. So basically, whenever you request on the home page, it will return the hello world. That's what I want. Or maybe I can say hello world. Welcome to Telisco. Okay. Cool. And now let's run this. How do we run this? So you go back to your application, uh, the main file, and simply say run. Behind the scene, it will, of course, compile the code. It will run this on a Tomcat. Just have a look. And when you run for the first time, it will print this spring uh, pattern here. You can change it if you want, uh, but we are concerned about this or we want to focus on this. So Tomcat started on port number 8080. Nowhere externally I'm using Tomcat, okay? Uh, a very simple stuff. And I'm saying run on 8080, I got it. How do I test it? Of course, you can use a REST client like Postman or I will just open the browser and here I will say localhost colon 8080, enter. And if you can see, we got the answer. We got response, which is, hello world, welcome to the disco. It's so simple, right? And how much time it took me to run this? Of course, I was talking to the camera and doing this, so it will take, it took a lot of time. But if you wanna do this, you can do that in minutes. So you got your application up and running in minutes. That's not the case with Spring Framework. And you will see that once we start with Spring later. So this is Spring Boot. Behind the scene, it is still Spring Framework. Now the question is, is it better than Spring? Of course, right, it will help you. But there are certain issues with Spring Boot as well. Of course, not a big issue. One of the issues is by default, it will do a lot of stuff for you. So it basically follows convention over configuration because in Spring, we do a lot of configuration. Here, it says, I will give you stuff. You tell me what you want, I will give it to you. And most of the time, it also gives you certain things which you don't want. Example, if you expand this libraries here, there are so many things. Maybe I will not even going to use this, but Spring Boot says, take it, <laughs> okay? So that's one. Uh, next, since it gives you a lot of default stuff, if you want to configure, then uh, of course you have to do those configuration by yourself. That means if you want more control, it is better to work with Spring Framework than Spring Boot. Again, debatable. Uh, personally, I prefer Spring Boot. If I want to work on a project, I'm happy to do the configuration in Spring Boot. But yeah, people might prefer Spring Framework for that reason. It's still debatable, but uh, Spring Boot is awesome. So yeah, that's one of the issue and uh, yeah, that's about it. I wanted to show you what is Spring Boot and people who cry about uh, Java being slow, Java being verbose, 
Spring Boot is here. It will make your work easy. Let's try to implement dependency injection using Spring Boot. Now, till this point, we have talked about what is dependency injection. We have talked about what is Spring Boot. And then we have also created a simple project with the help of the Spring Initializer. And we got the web project, but we are not going to use this project. Basically, we'll, let's create a new project without the web and let's try to implement dependency injection. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, first of all, let's create the simple project. For that, I'm going to go to start.spring.io and here, let's create a new project. So I will click on Maven and I'm going to select Java here. The version is 3.2.5. Group ID is Therisco. Project name is my app. Of course, this can be anything, but let's say my app. Uh, the Java version I have is 21 so, and the jar packaging. I'm not going to add any dependency because when you say you want to go for web, you have to add a web dependency. But if you don't add any dependency, you will get a default Spring Boot uh, options. I will click on generate and you can see we got the download and I've also unzipped it. Now it's time to open that in the IDE. So we got this IntelliJ IDEA community version. I will simply open that project. So this is the project which I got just now and I will click on open uh, in this window. Yeah. Okay, so now you can see this is a default project. Nothing fancy, there's no web part here. Uh, if you go to the pom.xml, we just got the Spring Boot starter. Nothing fancy, a simple dependency, right? Now, what I want to do is, uh, let's experiment with dependency injection. And we have talked about dependency injection before. Uh, basically, when you have dependencies in one class, normally what you do is you create the object of it. Now we want to inject it. How we do that? Uh, so let's create a main code. So we already have a main file here. So you can see we have a class and it says my app application, weird name, but that's fine for us. And then we are saying public static void main. This is your main code, which takes the string arguments. And here we are running a spring application. So what it does is here, uh, so when you say spring application dot run, it basically creates a container. Okay, now you'll be saying what is container here. See what happens is when you talk about your a project. So let's say this is your project. In this project, you have a lot of classes. Uh, so let's say you have one class, two class, three class, four class, and let's say you have multiple classes here. And now you are saying, hey, Spring Framework, it is your job to create object of this. Spring will say, okay, uh, that's my job. I will do it. But question is where exactly Spring will do it? Of course, objects are created inside the JVM. So you'll be having this big box here of JVM. I mean, this is your project. Uh, this is JVM. And this is where you create all the objects. Now, when you talk about Spring, Spring itself has its own container inside it. So Spring will have a container inside the, G the JVM. And they call this container as a IOC container. So this particular section here, this green box here is called the IOC container. Or you can say Spring container, that's fine. Now in this container, you create all the objects. So let's say from your project, you don't want object of all the classes. Let's say you got object for this, you got object for this. So these two classes, you want the object. And where exactly Spring will create the object? So Spring is going to create the object inside this. So this is where it will create the object. So it depends upon how many objects you want and which classes object you want. But this will create the object inside this container. That means, when you want to run this application, the first thing you need is not the object, but this container. And this line here is responsible to uh, create that container. So when you say spring application dot run, it will simply run that container for you. Okay, so we have the container ready, right? But then we want the object also. And for the objects, we want class. So what I will do is I will create a very simple class here. And normally I call my participants, my students as aliens. Uh, it's just that I believe that we don't live in this real world. We live in virtual world, not physically, but virtually because we create virtual solutions, right? So we, we live in virtual world and that's why I call alien. And every time you see alien I'm writing, imagine that's a developer. Or maybe I can also say dev if that is not an issue. So let's say dev. So let's say we have a dev class here. So in this world, we all are objects, right? Uh, I know that's a, not a good thing to objectify people, but let's say in this example, Every developer is an object. So I'm an object, you're the object. And we came from the same class, let's say dev class. And what is your job? Your job is to code. So public void code. And that's our job. Or maybe instead of saying code, I will say build. That sounds much better, right? Uh, see, difference between coding and building is when you code, 
You, you write some statements, but will it run? There's no idea. But when you say build, you are actually building something. And now here, I'm going to print working on awesome project. Again, just want to print, it some, print something and that's why I'm doing this. And this is what I want to call. So I want to call this method build. Now from where, of course, the execution starts from the main. Uh, the question is how I'm going to call. Okay, let me just put that in side by side so that you can see it. So this is the method I want to call. So this build method I want to call from here. Of course, the way you can do that is you can go here and you can call build. Will this work? Of course not. We know in Java, if you want to call a method and if it is a non-static method, we have we need object of it. So that means to call build, we have to create object of dev. So what you will do, you will just come back here and you say dev obj is equal to new dev, right? And then using this obj, you will be calling build. And that's how thing works, right? So basically you call this and you run this example. If I run, if I click on run, it will create the object of dev and you, you can see we got the statement which is working on the awesome project. Is it a good idea? Of course, you, it works. And basically, this is what we used to do when you don't use Spring. Basically, you create the object by yourself. But the idea behind Spring Framework is you don't have to manage the objects. Spring will do it for you. Because when you say new dev here, what you're doing is you are manually creating an object inside the JVM, but not in the container. That means when you create this object, it is your responsibility to manage the entire cycle of it. We don't want to do that. We don't want to create this object by ourselves. We want Spring to create it. And how will you do that? It's very simple. Now, since this is a Spring project, I'm assuming that Spring might be creating the object behind the scene. I just have to use it, right? Maybe the object is already there. Maybe this is the object is already there. Why you have to get a new object for dev? Uh, so in that case, what I will do is I will not be creating this object. So I will not say new dev because that's what created the object. But if I remove it, you know, your compiler is giving you some bad words. Compiler says, hey, what are you doing? Variable obj might not have been initialized. Okay, so it, we have to initialize it. And one way to do that is just to uh, fake your ID, uh, your compiler, you can say null. And your, your ID is now very happy. At least you have assigned something. But of course, when you run this, you will get one of the most famous error in the world. Uh, and we love it. No, we just, I'm just kidding. And the other is the null pointer exception. We don't want that, right? So how do we do this? Null, assigning null is not a good idea. So we can get this object from the uh, container. Now question is, how do you talk to the container? Because now you are in this main code, container is there with the JVM. How will you talk to the container? We want to get a hold on it. How will you get the hold on it? Maybe we can get a reference of it, right? So if you can get a reference of the container, you're good to go. So basically the type of this container here. So let's say the type of this IOC container is of type application context. So the type of this particular object, of course, right, this is an object. Even the container inside your uh, JVM, which is your IOC container itself is an object, right? So for, the, for that object, there should be some type and the type is application context. So what if you can simply get application context and you can see it came from the Spring Framework application context from spring framework dot context. And we can use the reference of it. I can say context equal to, okay, we have to get the object for this. Oh, this is weird, right? Because ultimately we are saying we don't want to get the object, but now it says we have to get the object. See, not exactly. See, application context will work only when you create the object of it, right? But what if I can get the object from spring itself? Remember when we talked about this particular line at the start and I, I told you that this particular line creates the container for you. It does. Example, if I click on this run here, you can see this run method returns the object. So I'm, I just went to the source code of it. Basically, I've decompiled the file with the help of IDE. And this run method, which we are calling of spring application.class, it basically returns the object of configurable application context. If I go here, it returns the object, oh, sorry, it extends the interface called application context. That means this run is returning you the object of application context. That means we, do, we already have the object. So what you have to do is you just get this cut, put it here and say equal to. So what we are doing is we are assigning this object which returns from run to the context. Once that is done, I can simply use the context and say, so context has multiple methods here. 
And you tell me looking at this in the comments before you even I go forward, I will take a pause, which method you are going to use to get that object. Pause the video, let me know in the comments. Okay, so I, I hope you have entered the answer. So it's actually the get bean. So in the get bean, you have to mention which class object you want. So I want the object of alien class. That's it. So not alien. We are not going for alien anymore. We are going for dev. Okay. So you can see we are saying that I want the object of dev. Who has created the object? It is spring. That's what I'm assuming that the object is there in the container. I just have to use it. And I'm doing the coding for that. So now this will give me the object which is existing. I'm assuming that it is there and I'm fetching it. Let's see if that works. I will run this. And if you see, we got an error. It says no qualifying bean of type com dot underscore dot my app dot dev. Oh, okay. So we don't have this object in the container. I was assuming that there's a there's an object, but it's not there. Container is there for sure because this is what creates the container. But inside the container, the object is not there. And uh, the entire video got wasted is because Spring says I'm not going to create the object. Why it is not creating the object? Now, if you remember in the one of the topic or one of the video we have mentioned that Spring by default will not create object of all the classes and we don't even want it. Because if Spring creates object of all the classes, and if you have 100 or 1000 classes, we don't want the JVM to be burdened with all these objects, with which we're not going to even use it. And that's why Spring says, I'm not going to create the object by default. You tell me which class objects you want. And whatever you say, I will create the object. And the question is, how will you talk to Spring Framework? Maybe you need a config class, or in the Spring Boot, or we can use Java-based configuration, uh, we can actually use something called an annotation. So on top of your class, whichever class object you want, just say this class is a component. Just by mentioning this annotation here, your Spring understands that this is the class which I have to manage. So this is a managed bean. What it means is Spring will create the object for you in the container. So the moment you say component, Spring says, now I know what's my job. My job is to create the object. I will do it for you. And now let's see, just by adding that component annotation, is it working? Let's relaunch the code, relaunch this application. And it worked. Can you see that? It says working on this awesome project. So this is working, right? And uh, that's how we get dependency injection. So what we are doing is, in this code, we wanted the object of developer or dev. And Spring is injecting that dependency. Okay, now we can go a bit more layers. Example, let's say uh, we got uh, dev and then dev needs an object of a laptop. Of course, as a programmer or as a developer, you want to work on a laptop and you don't have a laptop here. You're just saying working on a project, but how? In the air or maybe Oculus device or maybe Apple Vision Pro, doesn't matter. You need something to work on, right? And we don't have it. So let's say in the next video, let's try to create one more layer uh, because in this, we, we got two layers, right? We got two classes. So main needs object of dev, it is working. But what if dev needs object of laptop, how that will work? Let's try to understand that in the next video. But yeah, I hope you got something from this video, uh, something about the dependency injection using Spring Boot, where you are injecting a dependency in this particular section. So now we know how exactly your Spring Boot helps you with the dependency injection. But now let's add one more layer. So there's a concept called auto wiring. And in this video, let's try to focus on auto wiring with the help of one more layer. Target for this video is 250 comments. Now, which layer I'm talking about? Now, just for example, let's say when you talk about developers, of course, as a developer, I need a machine to work with. It can be a laptop, desktop, doesn't matter. I just want a machine to work with. So what I can do is I can work on the awesome project, but while doing that, maybe I also want to uh, compile the code. So maybe I want to call a method called compile. Uh, maybe I want to call the method uh, debug. So we got all these methods to work with. And of course, I can't do this in my mind. We do that when you want to do a dry compilation. But technically, if you want to really build a project, you need to uh, have a machine where you can compile and debug. So if, in order to call these methods, I need a class where I can define this. And that class is your laptop class. So let me create a class here and time in I will just close this and let's create a new class. So here I will create a class called a laptop. Okay. And then in this laptop class, basically I'll be having method like public void uh, compile. Of course, you need a compiler in your machine to compile, compile something. But let's say if I have a method called compile and it will say compiling 
with 404 bugs. But now, uh, okay, this is this can be a simple joke, right? Where I say 404 bugs, where you it's not found, bugs not found, maybe. I tried, maybe I failed. Anyway, the point is, uh, I'm trying to print compiling with 404 bugs, and this is what I want to print. And now, since I have a laptop class, since I have a method now, I can, okay, there's, it still shows you an uh, error. Okay, it's there that he's here. So basically, if I want to call this compile, of course, I need the object of laptop here. So I can simply say laptop, laptop. I got the reference, not the object. And using that reference, I can call this. I can say laptop.compile. Let's say we don't have debug, just to keep it simple, let's go with single method. Of course, you can have multiple methods. So I got the laptop reference and I can call it now. There is no compile time issue. Okay, you can see there is no problem here. But by default, when you talk about the instance variables, so laptop is a variable which is an instance variable. By default, it will get a value which is null. And we don't want it, right? We will get the same problem which we got earlier. I want to show you that. I want to show you the error which we got earlier. So I will just run this and you will get, waiting for the error. Okay, so you can see we got null point exceptions because is because the laptop is by default null. Uh, let me just put this side by side. So how do we connect this? So one way is you can create the object here. So you can say new uh, laptop, right? And then this will solve the problem is because now you don't have a null there. You got the real object. So if I run this, it, it says working on this awesome project. Also, it says compiling with 404 bugs. So our problem is solved. Basically, it's able to call the laptop. But then this is not what I want. I don't want to say new laptop. And even if you want to say new laptop, there are multiple places you can do that. We don't actually create the object when you define the instance. You basically do that in the constructor of this class of developer or in the setter. Of course, this is a variable, right? So this should be private where you can create a setter method for this and you can do that in the setter if you want to use the new laptop. But anyway, I don't want to use new laptop anywhere. What I want is I want Spring to create this object and then automatically connect it here. So the first thing is what I will do is, so I will talk to Spring Framework by saying, hey Spring Framework, I know you are creating the object for dev. I want you to create object for the laptop as well. But it's not doing that. You know why? Because we forgot to do one thing, which is add component. Now, when you add add component here, now your Spring Framework knows or your Spring Boot knows, hey, dev is not the only class where you have to create the object. It's also the laptop. So now Spring Boot will create both the objects. And that's not a big deal. The big deal is how will you connect this to? Now the developer says, I want laptop. How will you connect this? See, one way you can do is you can use the application context. Remember, in the main, basically, we had this application context. And if you can get this in the developer or dev class, you can do that. But I don't want to invoke application context there. I don't want to use that there. So what you can do is you can use certain annotations. One of the annotations we can use here, or you can use one annotation which is called auto wired. Now what this does is it says, see as a developer or as a programmer here in this case, not the programmer or in the example, but someone like me, I'm doing a code now. I want to connect this to right? So basically when you say connect, that basically means wiring. Now, since I want this wiring to be done automatically, I can call this as auto wiring. And that's what the, the animation is. When you say auto wired, now your Spring Boot says, okay, I want to get object of dev, but dev is dependent on the laptop. Let me connect this to. So behind the scene, it will connect it. And now you actually got the instance for the laptop. So using this, it will get the object, but using auto wire, it will connect it. And how do we check it? Of course, to check it, we have to run it. So we'll just relaunch this application and you can see we got the same output without the new keyword. So that's the beauty of auto wiring. Okay. And you can do that in multiple places, not just here. And basically when you do it here, it is called a field injection. So when you do that on the top, it is field injection. Remember when we talked about dependency injection, we talked about three different types. Field injection, constructor injection, setter injection. So when you do it here, that's your field injection. But let's say if you don't want to do that here, what's the other option? You can use a constructor here. So I can say dev. And in the constructor, you can pass the object of laptop. And you can say laptop is equal to, um, I mean, this dot laptop is equal to laptop. If you're not sure what this line is, uh, go through the video of this keyword on, Java, on YouTube. So search for this keyword in Java 
and you will know what I've did here. Okay, so now this is how it does the constructor injection. You don't have to use auto wire that it is optional. So when you run this, uh, this also works. So this is constructor injection. Otherwise, if you don't want to use constructor injection, see if you if you just uncheck, if you just comment the auto wire and constructor injection, if you try this, you will get the same error which we were getting before. So those things are working, okay? Uh, let me try this setter injection. So what I will do is I will just create a setter method which is public void set laptop and I will say laptop laptop this dot laptop is equal to laptop. Okay, so now I got the setter injection or setter method. Let's try if this works. Now when you do that, it is still giving you an error. So by default setter will not be going for auto wiring. You have to say auto wire here. Now when you mention auto wire, then it will behave like the way we want. It will do the setter injection. We have not done for the constructor. You can do it, it will not give you error, but even if you skip that, it is by default picking it. So by, for constructor, it is default, it is optional, but for field injection and for setter injection, you have to use auto wire. Which is better, uh, constructor and setter is better, field is not. But you, you will see me using that in the upcoming uh, videos is because I want to keep this simple so that you will understand the project or you will understand uh, how Spring Framework works behind the scene. I want to do one more thing here. So what I will do is I will just go with the auto wiring field injection and let me remove or let me just comment this constructor and setter. Let's only fo focus on the auto wiring here. Now question arise, how exactly is connecting? How do it, how your Spring Framework knows that when you say auto wire, it will connect with this class object, not some other classes, because in your project, you might be having multiple classes, right? So how it knows that we have to connect with laptop only. So what happens is uh, when you say auto wiring, it goes for by type. It is not searching for name. If you're thinking it's because of this name, no, it's not because of the name. It is because of the type of the class. So since we are saying laptop, it says laptop connected. But the question is what if, you try to apply loose coupling here. What I'm trying to say is, what if you create a interface out of this? So I will say refactor, extract the interface, and let's code for the interface. Because see, in this world, there's nothing called a computer. It is either a laptop or desktop, but both are called as computer. Okay, do we got computer here? Or, I don't know, we just clicked on okay. So we got computer here, and you can see computer is not having any method. So I will say void, compile and this will be declared. Let me just put that down here. I know there are multiple things open here, but yeah, we don't have a choice. You can see on the left hand side, we got dev. Here we got computer and here we got laptop and laptop implements computer. So basically what we are trying to do is we are coding for the interface, okay? So here we got the interface, which has method called compile and laptop implements computer. Now what's the advantage of this? See, one of the advantages when you talk about developers, when you say you want to work on a project, when you join a company, your demand for MacBook, right? And that's the industry standards now. Everyone wants MacBook, but you don't get it. Uh, I'm still waiting for my MacBook. But anyway, the point is, when you join a company, they don't promise you that they will give you a laptop. They promise you that they will give you a computer. This can be a laptop or a desktop. And that's why a developer should not be dependent on the laptop. This is hard coding. A developer should be dependent on the, not on computer, uh, not on component, on the computer. And I will say comp here. And let me replace this with comp. So basically what I'm saying is, as a developer, you should focus on dependent on the computer, not on the laptop. And it depends upon the company, what they want to provide you. They want to provide you laptop or desktop, that's their choice, right? Now, when you say computer, will this work? Because see, add component, we are writing on top of laptop, right? But here we are looking for computer. And as I mentioned before, it goes by type. So by type means it will search for the type of computer and laptop is a type of computer. So if I relaunch it and you will see it, it works. So basically it is not compulsory that you should use only laptop. You can also use computer and that's the good practice to use. So we got computer here, but with this, I got one more thought. What if now, since it is searching for computer and you got laptop, that's a good thing, right? But what if there's a confusion? Okay, what confusion I'm talking about? Let me copy this laptop class and paste it here. Of course, it will, we have to change the name of it. So I will say desktop. And now you can see I got a desktop class as well. And there are so many windows open. Let me close computer. Now we know that computer is an interface which has only one method. Let me close it. We got two classes here. One is a desktop and one is a laptop. 
and both are implementing computer and the, the method also same compile and compile is because they're implementing computer here i will just write a different thing compiling with 400 404 bugs but faster and now uh, you can see we got two different implementation right now my question to you we got two classes both are implementing computer so both are type of computer both have component of, on top of it so basically in your container you will have now three objects right so this is for the dev this is for the laptop and this is for the desktop oh, it's a desktop here so basically i got three objects and now in the developer when you say auto wire with computer which object it will connect with laptop or desktop confusion right it's like you're joining a company and then they are giving you two options and you are confused because on the on the desktop you will get with the same amount of price desktop works faster uh, plus it is connected to the high power source laptop is portable so you're confused there and that's what is happening with spring now so let me re rerun this and see what spring says okay so we have not got the error but we got i mean we have we got the error not the red one but we got the error the error says application failed to start reason Field comp, this one, is uh, in this uh, particular dev class, require a single bean. I mean, of course, right, we want only one object, but two are found. And this is what happens when you are confused between two things. Uh, one is desktop and one is laptop. Which one should I pick for? And it's basically confused. How do we solve this? One of the ways you can delete the desktop class, it will solve the problem. Or you can basically remove the add component on top of desktop. So now what you're doing is you're saying in the container, you've only got one object of laptop. We don't have the object for desktop. So there will not be any confusion there. It will become the laptop part. But what if you have a component here and you don't have a component on top of laptop? In this case, it will pick up the uh, desktop. And you can see it says faster, so this desktop. But what if both has it? Now that's a problem, right? Now, in this case, in case of confusion, you can use certain annotation or one annotation. So, you know, when you have two options, sometimes one thing becomes your preference. Let's say for me, I prefer desktops, but maybe you prefer laptop. So in this case, on top of your laptop, you can use one annotation called primary. So what's the use of primary? In case of confusion, this class will be preferred. And now when you say component on both, but when you run it, it will prefer the laptop. You can see it doesn't say it's faster, so that's laptop. But what if you write primary on both? Not a good idea, but let's see what let's see what happens. When you say primary on both of both of them, again there will be confusion. But this time it is giving you different error. But yeah, it says the same thing. It says more than one primary being found among the candidates. So not a good idea. But uh, yeah, this one. One way you can put a primary on one class. What if you don't want to mention primary? What if you want to say component? Then you can decide in this level. So you can also use something called a qualifier. Now in the qualifier, you can mention the name of your class. So you can mention laptop here. Okay, not the name of the class, but the name of the instance. See, by default, this instance will have some name or we say bean name. So for the laptop, it will be your class name, but uh, without the capital letter, the first capital letter. So if it is laptop, it will be laptop, but with small l. So that's the name you have to pick up here. Okay, so when you say qualifier, in case of confusion, it will pick up the laptop. So now if you run this, we got laptop. You can also do, do it for the desktop and it works. So basically this is how you do auto wiring. So in this video, we have not just talked about the auto wiring, we have talked about primary and qualifier. And we have seen how do we code for the interfaces. Yeah, lengthy video, but I think worth it. So I hope you got some idea behind the scene how auto wiring is working. We have talked about Spring Framework, but then when we started coding, uh, in between we talked about Spring Boot and the project which we have created is done with the help of Spring Boot. And things are a bit easy, right? But what if you don't want to use Spring Boot? What if you want to work on a Spring Framework? So there are two reasons why this video is important. First, what if the project you are working on in your company or maybe by yourself, you don't want to use Spring Boot or you don't have a choice of using a Spring Boot. So this video becomes important to understand how do you work with Spring Framework. Second reason for this video is in this video, you will understand what is happening behind the scene, right? How Spring analyze the configuration and what are different aspects of this uh, configuration. So we'll talk about it. Of course, we have discussed those things in the Spring Boot as well. But when you do it here, it will make much more sense. So the project which we have here, again, a simple project. What we have done till now is we got uh, three different classes. We got developer, 
we got a desktop and laptop, and then a developer needs a computer. It can be a desktop or laptop, and that's what we are doing here. But if you see, nowhere we have done any configuration. Basically, this, the, you, the Spring Boot analyze these annotations, and then based on that, it will create a project for you, and it will make it work for you. But then, as I mentioned, there is no XML file, there is no separate Java class where you are doing all this configuration. So what if you don't want to use Spring Boot? I want to use a normal Spring Framework now. So what I will do is, I will just go back here and create a new project. So let's go to here, uh, the IntelliJ ID, of course, any ID will work. You will click on new, click on project. And I don't want to create a spring project now because when you create a spring project, it will be spring boot project. So what I will do is I will click on Maven archetype. See, when you talk about a project like spring, when you talk about different frameworks, you have to use certain build tool to create those projects. Of course, in uh, spring boot also, we have used Maven. Here also, we are going to use Maven. Of course, we can also use Gradle there. Uh, but let's stick to Maven. So here, I'm going to create a project. I will say demo spring. That's my project name. And I will keep that in downloads. Doesn't matter where it is. Next, the JDK version. So make sure that you first of all click on this Maven archetype. Or if you're using Eclipse, it will give you option of creating a Maven project. So select that. The JDK version, in this machine, I have uh, 21. I will just go with that. And then it is asking you for the catalog. See, Maven as a build tool also has its way of creating a project. It will give you a basic structure of a project. Now, based on different framework, based on different services which you want to use, they provide you certain archetypes. Archetypes basically your project structure. So they provide you different archetypes which you can use. Uh, of course, you can build this archetype or you can build this project from scratch without using that particular uh, template but they give you certain templates to use. And there are certain templates which they have inbuilt and there are some templates which have been uh, sourced. So example, if I click on catalog here, you can see there's an option of internal, then also Maven Central. So there are certain templates or archetypes you can use it from Maven Central. So if I choose internal here and if I expand this archetype, there are limited options. You can see, uh, you can actually at least count it. Uh, there is there's a template for uh, a J J2E application for portlets, for quick start, we are going to use quick start and we have web app as well. But if you click on Maven Central, you will see a lot of options. You can see it is loading here, loading done. And if I expand now, there are so many options here. You can just, sometimes it is confusing which one to choose and that's why we are not going to use this. Maybe there is already application available for Spring Boot, as you can see it is here. Spring Boot 3 REST API archetype. So you can use this archetype, it will give you a template to work with. I will stick to internal and let's create a quick start project. So I can just click on quick start here and the version just stick to it. There are certain additional properties, we can skip that. Advanced settings, this is where you can mention your group ID, which is already com.telisco. The artifact name is demo spring and I can click on create here. And I will go, I'm going to create a new window because maybe I want to use the old project code. So this is my project. This is my spring project. Now, you know what? Basically, this is a spring project, but only with a name. Nowhere in the project we are using spring feature. See, when you say spring feature, basically we have to add a dependency for spring. And we don't have it here. If you can see, we don't have a spring dependency. We have to add that. So that's one. Next, if you see the uh, external dependency, of course, we don't have anything here. We don't even have the configuration for Spring. We have not done for Spring Boot as well, but here we have to create a configuration file to make it work. So now what, you, what we will do is, let's create a simple code. In fact, we can actually use those codes which we already have. So maybe I will just try to reuse. So let's go to the Spring Boot app, and I want to use these two classes, dev, and, uh, okay, let's only use dev. I will just copy this and paste it here. So we got dev class. And we don't need all these annotations now. We don't need uh, auto wire, other stuff. Or maybe we don't even need a computer. Maybe I could have just typed it by myself. Sometimes being lazy is a additional work you get. Okay, so I just wanted these two things and I don't even want all these packages. A simple class, nothing fancy. 
you can see we got a dev class which has a build method and it says working on the awesome project maybe you can just type it instead of copying it from the older project and now i want to create object of dev inside this app so this is your main code the main java code First, I want to check if this project is running. I mean, this is the step, important step you should do. Whenever you create a new project without typing any code, just run it to check if it is working. That's important. So here, I don't want to print hello world. Uh, we just want to, okay, I just want, I don't even want the comments here. So what I want here is to create object for dev so that I can call build. So the idea is to call build, but for that I have to create object of dev. So I will say dev obj equal to new dev. And then I'm going to say obj.build. So this should work because we are creating the object by ourselves. Nowhere we are using Spring yet. So it says uh, working on the awesome project, so we are happy. But then we don't want to say new Java, new dev here, right? This is what I want to get from Spring. I want Spring to create this object. Now can I use, uh, we have seen in the Spring Boot, we can, can we use Spring, I mean, can we use component here. First of all, we don't have this component option is because we don't have Spring Boot or Spring Framework here. And even if you use Spring Framework component, it will not be able to configure that. So this will not work. So how do we make it work? The first thing is, if you want the dev here, we have to work with the container. Remember when we have talked about a project where you can have multiple uh, classes? And then you also have something called a JVM here in which you will be having a section where you will be having heap memory and stuff. And then inside that you will be having your IOC container. And then uh, inside this you will be having objects. But unfortunately we don't have the object yet. So how do we got, get this object? So even before you get the object, the first thing you need to get is the container. How will you get the container? And we have seen that right before. If you want to work with the container, we have to create object of application context. You need object of application context and we don't have the object. First of all, we don't even have this interface in the project. If when I say control space, you're not getting the package of it. Reason, this is not part of a Java. This is a part of Spring Framework. So if you want this to work, we need to get the external libraries for Spring. And how do we do that? So we have to add this Spring dependency. So we already have a JUnit dependency. Apart from this, we need to get the dependency for Spring. But not everyone remembers the dependency name and the artifact ID and the version number. We don't know that, right? Or maybe some superhumans knows uh, this by heart. I don't know. So how do we get it? So it's very simple. What you can do is you can go to one of the most famous plays for the dependency, which is called a Maven repository. You can just go here and search for, in fact, it already had a spring context. Is it so famous or maybe they are tracking me what I'm doing? They got so many uh, libraries, you know, uh, why it is only promoting spring. Maybe even they're tracking me. So here, basically you have to search for spring context. And you can see this is what I want. So when I click on this, I can select any version. So normally I prefer the version which doesn't have any vulnerabilities. And uh, you can see they give you warning as well. 5.3 has the vulnerability. Uh, we can skip that. 6 is a version we, which we are going for. Uh, which one to choose? First of all, make sure that you don't have any uh, security issue here. Second, go with the version which is not latest. But if it is latest and it is used by so many projects, that's fine. You can go with this, 6.1.6. .6. So you can see this version, basically you can just copy this. And if you're not using Maven, you can even get it from the Griddle. So you can just use that. So I'm using Maven, I will just copy this and replace this dependency which we have written with the new thing. I don't want to market this Spring uh, Maven repository. So yeah, so this is how basically you create, uh, you get the dependency. Oh, but it's not coming here. Why it is not coming here? It's because we have to reload the changes. So in IntelliJ, you have to load this Maven changes, but in Eclipse, it will happen. Most of the time it happens by default. So I will click on load Maven changes. And now you can see we got the dependencies for Spring Context. And once you have that, let's go to our app and let's say control space. Okay, there was some, some issue with the importing. It should normally work, but I don't know what's wrong. Or maybe I'm writing the wrong spelling. Or maybe IntelliJ has some issues. Anyway, so I, I got the context. I will say this is a this is a context equal to. Now, how do we create this object? So let me just comment this too. 
for time being. So how do we create this object? So of course you can say new application context, but application context itself is a interface. So you can't get object of application context. In that case, we can go for the classes which implements application context. And one of the class is class path XML application context. We are going to use this because initially we'll start with the XML configuration. We can do it with annotations as well or Java based configuration. Let's go with uh, XML and that's it. You got this object. And now once you do this, this line basically creates the container. So our job is done. The container is ready, but with that container, how do I get the object? It's very simple. You can simply say context dot get bean. And here you can mention what bean you want. Maybe I want the bean of dev dot class. Our job is done and it should work. Let's see if that works. Let's run this because we got the container. I'm expecting the object is there. I just have to use that. Let's run this and no, it's not working. So it says bin factory not initialized or already closed. So it says before accessing bin via application context. First of all, what is bin factory? So the way you have application context, the container is created with the help of bin factory. It manages the bin uh, the container. So in the earlier versions of uh, Spring, we used to use bin factory, but now we use application context. So it says something is wrong. I mean, it's closed. I'm not able to create the container. I mean, it's creating a container, but it is closed now. So how do you configure your container? Because in the container, we don't have this object of dev. And that's where you have to create a XML configuration. But how do we do that? So it's simple actually. In this bracket, you can mention the XML configuration name. So I will say spring.xml. But we have to create this XML file. Okay. And if you run this with just, by, just by that statement, of course, this name can be anything. It says the XML is not found. And where it is searching for it, it is searching for that file in the class path resource. Okay, uh, since it is a class path, we have to go with class path. So what I will do is in the main folder, I will create a directory called resources. Normally it is there, but maybe it is not showing that in the IntelliJ idea. Just check if you have resources folder. In this resource folder, you will create a file called spring.xml. And this is where you have to do the configuration. And if you just create a file, and if you do nothing here, and relaunch it. This time it should not say file not found. It should give you some different error. It says line number one, column number one, premature end of file because we have not done anything. But what is this configuration? Now we are basically trying to create a Spring project without Spring Boot. And of course for that we have to do a lot of configuration. And to achieve that we have basically created the project. And in that we do have a dev class here in which we have a method called build. And what we are trying to do is we are trying to call the build but for that, we need, we need object of dev. And then we want Spring Framework to create the object, which is actually not happening because if I run this, this is what you are getting. We were getting the error, which says uh, premature end of file. Uh, which file I'm talking about is this spring.xml. Because if you want Spring to create the object, we have to do the configuration. And this configuration will be done in the XML file. And this is empty at this point. I don't want this to be empty. We have to write some configuration using which you can create the object. And if you have this question in your mind, why we are using XML when we are happy with Spring Boot, uh, there are two reasons. One is what if your project which you are maintaining is a legacy project. In that case, of course, they will be having or they might be having XML configuration. So you should know. Second is if you want to understand what is happening behind the scene for Spring Boot, this configuration will help you there. Okay, so let's get started. Now, if you want to do this configuration, even before that, when you talk about this line number uh, 10 here, and when you say you are creating a context behind the scene, we got the container. So we do have a container ready. But in this container, we don't have the object yet. So if you want to get the object or if you want Spring to get the object, you have to mention that here. And every class which Spring manages, they're called Spring Beans, right? Or Manage Beans. So what I will do is, since we want to create beans, I will use a beans tag. Now this is how you work with XML. If you're new to XML, basically you can compare XML with HTML. Uh, HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. XML stands for Extensible Markup Language. So basically in the HTML, you have some tags which you can use. And who understands those tags is your browser. So in the browser, it is it has a definition of all those tags which you're using. Maybe you're using HTML tag, body tag, or a P tag, or a div tag. So basically your browser knows those tags because they have the definition of it. In XML, you can use any tag which you want. 
there's no compulsion that you should use this tag or those tags. Even if I want, I can use the Naveen tag here. I mean, that's my choice. I want to use Naveen tag, I can use that. But when it comes to Spring Framework, we have to use certain tags which are which has their own definitions. And we do that with the help of DTD files, which is document type defini definitions. You don't have to get into that much. Just imagine XML, you can use your own tags, provided you have a definitions for it. Now, we are using some tags here, and we do have a definition of definitions for it, and I will show you that in some time. Uh, but we have to use a beans tag because you'll be having multiple classes and multiple objects. And inside this beans tag, you can create multiple bean tag. Right, so you can have one, uh, depending upon your requirement, you can have multiple bean. Now in this bean, you can mention which class bean you want, which class object or which class you want Spring to manage. So I can mention the class name here with the help of class attribute and you can mention the class name which is dev in this case. Now simply class name will not work, you have to basically provide the qualified name for it. So in this case it is com dot dev, which is the qualified name. So you can see dev belongs to com .telisco. that's a package name. And then optionally, you can also provide the ID for it. So let's say ID is dev. You can use any name, doesn't matter. I'm using dev in this case. Now where this will be useful, example, if you go back to your app in this line number 11, what we are doing is we were using a dev.class in the earlier example. You can also use dev here. So earlier, basically we were using dev.class. Here we can use, in double quotes, we can use Dev. But you just have to make sure that since we are using dev, this getbin returns you the object type. Just typecast it with dev and that should work. Going back here, so now we do have a definition, right? Or we do have the bean created. So the configuration is done. Let's try. So what I will do is I will just relaunch this and see what happens. Okay, still it is giving you error. It still says uh, it is invalid, but why? This time it is giving you some different error. It says line number four, which is this, beans. It says cannot find the declaration of element beans. Oh, this is weird. So basically, uh, we don't have a definition for it. As I mentioned before, you can use any tag provided you have a definition for it. For this bean, we don't have a definition. So in this case, you don't have to buy a definition. What you can just do is, you can just go to Google and search for Spring 6 bean configuration XML and look at this file or this link. Click here and it talks about the configuration. Just go down and search for this one and you can simply copy this and replace the beans because in this if you can see there's also a bean tag here or beans tag here just replace it and we are good okay beans not two times only once and i will just remove this so what we are doing is we are providing the definition for beans here okay and with this if i relaunch it hopefully this will work okay hopefully i said but it's not working there's some problem it says a uh, line number four, there's some issue with the passing, mm, some problem with the first line. Is it the issue? Okay, so maybe there was some issue with this line here. Okay, I'll just simply get rid of this. Maybe there's some extra character which I can't see. Anyway, so if I relaunch this, we have provided the bin definition and this is working. It says working on the awesome project. So by doing this, what we are doing is we are asking our Spring Framework that uh, you are responsible to create the object for dev and which we have done. And that's why you are getting this object here. So that's our first one. How about one more class? Let's say in this particular project, let me create one more class and let me name this class as laptop. Okay, a simple class, nothing fancy. And maybe in this, in this class, I want to have a method called compile. So I will say public void compile. And in this, I'm going to print compiling. And now if I go back to Spring, you can see we are just mentioning dev here, right? And one more thing, what I will do is I will just comment this section. Now, how many classes we have in our project? Of course, we have three classes, but then we are concerned about the two classes because app only has a main method. So we have two classes, dev and laptop, which we created. A normal class like dev, a normal class like laptop. And now if I run this, Tell me what, just think about it. If I just run this code, how many objects will be created inside the container? Or how many classes object will be created inside the container? Is it zero? Is it one? Is it two? So let me know in the comments. Okay, so if I run this, let's see. Okay, first of all, how we will see? We, we don't even have an idea, right? We are not printing anything. See, the thing is, if you look at the XML file, when you execute this line, it goes to the XML file. In the XML, we are creating the object only of one class, or we are saying only one bean tag. 
So it will create the object only of that class which you have mentioned here, which is dev. Okay. And to prove that, what I will do is I will just have a constructor here. I will say public dev, which is a constructor. And in this, I'm going to print dev constructor. And I'm going to do the same thing in the laptop. So I will have a constructor here. Of course, this should not be dev, it should be laptop. And here also, I'm going to replace this with laptop. Okay, we have a simple class, simple constructor, nothing fancy. Okay, and now if I try to run this, so if we don't get any output, that means none of the object got created, but let's see what happens. So we only got dev constructor. That means we got one object and that too of the developer. Reason? In the Spring XML, we have mentioned only that. What if I create for the laptop as well? So I can just uh, reuse my code. Instead of saying copy paste, reuse sounds good. And we don't need that much of space between being closing. And here I will say laptop. And here the class name is laptop. And the moment I do that, and if I run this, let's relaunch it. And you can see now it says dev and the laptop as well. Both got created. But we are not using them in the code, right? We are just saying execute this line create the container and as soon as the container is created, it will simply look at the XML file and say, okay, we do, got, we do have two beans here mentioned, let me create the object for them. Okay, so and then in your container, you basically have two objects, one for your dev and one for your laptop. But the question is, what if you mention the dev one more time? So we'll just copy this and paste it here and let's say dev one, we got different ID. So now let me know in the comments, how many objects it will create? One two, three. Of course, it should be more than two or two or more than two. So let's try. And you can see it is calling the dev constructor two times. That means it, it, it depends upon how many times you mention bean. If you say once, it will get one object. It will, it, if you say two, it will say one more time, it will create two, another object for dev. So we got two objects for dev, right? On one for your laptop. So that's how basically you can configure your Spring Framework to create the object. Now uh, we can go for the next step, which is what if in the dev you need object of laptop. Now that will be tricky, right? Because now your dev, initially we were dependent on the Spring container to give you this dev, right? Dev object. And now inside dev, if you want a laptop object, now that's where the dependency will come. So till this point, we were able to work with Spring Boot. But then we want to also explore how do you work with Spring Framework without Spring Boot. And then uh, to achieve that, what we have done is we got this dev, we got this app. Uh, basically, we were trying to create the object for dev. So when I say we are trying to create the object, basically I'm asking Spring Framework to give me the object. As you can see, uh, we have done that uh, in the configuration. So if I show you the configuration, which is spring.xml, we got three objects here. So every time you want the object from Spring Framework, if you are not using Spring Boot, we have to use some configuration. We are using XML here. You can also do that in different ways. But in XML, if you are doing that, we can use bean tags. Uh, you can see we got a bean tag with the ID dev and the class name is dev. Uh, we got another bean tag, which is dev1 and the class is dev. Then we got laptop of class laptop. So in total, when you run this application, your Spring Framework will see this and say, okay, it's my job to create these three objects and it will do that for you. And in the container, basically in the IOC container, or you can call it a Spring container, you will find these objects. You can see we got uh, three objects here, two for dev and one for laptop. Why this happening is because we have done that in the bean configuration, you can see here, three different beans. And the IDs, for the particular first object, the ID is dev. For the second object is dev1 and for the third object laptop, it is your laptop, right? So these are the IDs for it. Now, what we want to do is, let's say in the dev class, I have some properties. So in this particular video, let's discuss how do you work with the injections, the setter injection and the constructor injection. To do that, uh, of course, what I want ultimately is to have the laptop object here. Okay, maybe I, I, I mean, I just want to introduce a reference. I want Spring to give this object because at this point is just a reference, it's not the object. So let's say in the build, if you try to say laptop.compile, which is a method of laptop class, it will not work. Reason is laptop, this one is just a reference. We have not assigned an object here or we have not instantiated here or we have not specified the memory here. So by default it will be null and when you run this, it will give you 
our favorite error, which is null pointer exception, and we don't want it, right? So ultimately, we want this object to be passed. But at this point, I will just comment it. We'll use it later because this will this will not work. And to understand how do you inject, let's start simple. What I will do is uh, let me create a simple variable here, and uh, maybe the variable name or variable. Uh, name is age. Of course, you can go with any name, doesn't matter. But let's say I'm saying age here. And in this build, I want to print the age. So whenever someone calls the build, uh, I want to print the age. Or if you don't want to do that from here, we can do one more thing. See, uh, app is a main class, right? This is where you have your main method. And if you say you got this object here, let me just uncomment this. You got this object here of dev class, and you're calling build. Let me say I don't want to call build now. What I just want to do is, I want to print the value for age. So what I will do is I will simply say s out and obj.age. Now since it's an int variable, let me show you that. Uh, let me just minimize this thing. We don't need that. Uh, let me just put that here on the side. Yeah. Okay. So if you see age is an int variable, and if you, when you try to access this, it will try to pick up the default value. So what do you think the default value for age is? Of course, it's an int value, so default value will be zero. And when you run this, you will get zero. Let me just try this. So run this app, and now you can see it prints zero. Yeah, we got this output as well is because we were working with the constructor. Ignore that, we got this zero here, right? Now I want to assign some values to it. And we can do that, right? So we can simply say int age is equal to some value, eight or 10, because nowadays children at the age of seven, eight, they are doing programming. Uh, it's fun and weird at the same point. But anyway, the point is we have assigned a value to it. And if you have noticed, I'm not using private modifier here. That's on purpose is because I want to use this variable directly here. Not a good practice, but since we are into learning stage, we want to see what are things happening behind the scene. So I'm doing that here, okay? And uh, so we can pass it. Now what I will do is I don't want to, uh, I mean, of course, we should run this first just to see if this is working. And you can see we got eight. So you can assign the value from here. Or you can assign the value from here as well. You can say obj.age and you can set whatever value you want to what, want here. Let's say 18. And uh, if I run this, uh, it should be 18 is because initially you have assigned 8 when the object was creating. Uh, but then later on, when you are running this, after the object creation, you are replacing the value with 18. And that's why it is 18 here. Now, let me just make this variable as a private variable because that's the uh, ideal way. And I don't want to assign the value from here. Not a good idea to assign hard-coded value, hard values. Now, since this is a variable which is private, uh, if you want to access this from outside, example, if you here, if you try to see that, it says uh, age has a private access. So we can't directly access it. We need a getter and setter for that. So what I will do is, uh, I will just create a getter setter after this constructor here. So right click and say, hey, I want a getter setters for this, for this particular variable, and I got it. So you can see we got the getter, we got the setter, okay? And if you want to assign the value, this is not a good way. You can simply say set age. You can set the age as 18 and whatever value you want to assign. And here you can say obj.getAge, right? And now if you run this, uh, what you're expecting is, of course, we want 18, and that's what we got here. But what if you don't assign the value? Let's say we are not assigning a value here. And if I run this, uh, you can see we got zero. Cool. But now the point is, I want to assign this value using Spring Framework. So I don't want to do that here or here. I want to assign some value with the help of Spring. So I want to inject the value. How do I do that? Now, since we are saying we want to, we want Spring to do it, we have to do the configuration in this Spring.xml file. And how do we do that? See, when you are creating this object here, what you can do is, in this particular bean tag, there are multiple options. You can assign properties because ultimately these are called properties, right, for, for the object. So you can define a property. Now, this is a inbuilt tag inside this Spring. So you can say, a property and then in this property you can assign a name of our property so which property you want to change i want to change the value for the age property with what so you have to assign the value as well so let's say the value is uh, maybe different value 12 i think this is the ideal age uh, to start programming not 8 so anyway so uh, we got age as 12 and now let's run this and let's see what happens if you run this you can see we got 12 that means we are assigning Okay, when I say V, uh, Spring is assigning the value of uh, 12 to age variable, right? So that's what, that's what is happening here. 
So when I say when I'm, I'm creating, the, I'm getting this object, the object which got created inside your container, now it has a age variable and the value is 12. So the moment you create this instance, it will have the value 12 because of this setting here. But what about the dev one? Is it applied there as well? Let's try. So what I will do is I will just go back here and say dev one. And if you run this, uh, you can see it is not for dev one. So when I say dev one, which is uh, this particular thing here, the value for age is still zero because we have not assigned the value for that. And how do we know that? So if you see the bin, we are not assigning a property here. Okay. And since we are not using it, we can also remove it, right? So we can just go back here and say, go back to dev because we don't have dev one at this point and run this, it will go back to 12. So this is how basically you use set injection, but we have one more, which is constructor injection. How do we do that? So what I will do is I will create one more constructor here, uh, which is a parameterized constructor. So I'll just right click here and say, Hey, generate a constructor for me, which will take int uh, age as a parameter and you got it here. And I want to inject the value of age, not with the setter, but with the constructor. So that means I will just go back here in the spring.xml file. And here, instead of using a property, because property will use setter, I can just come in that section and we can use something called a constructor argument. And in this, you can specify the value as whatever value you want, let's say 14 in this case. And instead of, I will just say self-closing tags, yeah. So instead of using a property, I'm going to use a constructor. This time it will use this particular constructor. And you can see when you say dev constructor, it was getting printed here, right? Because initially we were using a default constructor. Now, since we are using a parameterized constructor, I will just say dev one constructor, just to differentiate between the parameterized and the default one. Okay, and now let me run this. Now what will happen is with the, with the help of this constructor argument uh, tag, we can assign the value with the help of constructor. And you can see it says dev one, right, which is the parameterized constructor output, and the value is 14. Cool. So that's how basically you can use constructor and setter. Okay, but there are certain things which you have to remember. In the property, we have used name. In constructor, we are not doing that. It's because we have a constructor which takes only one parameter. But if you want, you can also specify name here. There's a name property here if you can use that. You can say age. But since we only have one parameter, you can skip that. If you have two parameters, and if you want to specify the sequence, you can also use index. Uh, you can specify for index zero, index one. So at this point, we just have one. But let's say in case if you have two, two uh, parameter here, let's say age and salary, in that case, uh, you can specify the index zero for age and index one for salary. So you just have to say constructor arguments two times. Cool. So that's how basically you use a setter injection and the constructor injection. But then that was for this simple variable, right? What about a variable like laptop. Now this is not a simple variable. This is a reference variable, right? Which is you have a class reference there. And how do we achieve that? So what I will do is I will just uh, come in this constructor. So we don't want to work with age anymore. So I can just come in that section. Let's only focus on the laptop. Now, when I say focus, what I want to do is in the dev, when you say build, right? Example in the app, when you're calling this build, build will call the method called compile. And with those settings, okay, let, let, me, let me also comment this age. I don't want to print age. Uh, let me run this. There's no age now. It's just a constructor. And you can see we got an error. It says the laptop, uh, they cannot invoke is because we got null pointer exception. It says this laptop is null. Okay, null is because we have not created the object. We just got the reference of it, which is here. So what I want to do is, we know that in the container, we do have the object of laptop. We have it here. We just have to inject this to the developer object, right? The instance. And how do we do that? Of course, we can use a spring here. So don't you think laptop is also a property? What I can do is uh, for this particular dev, I can simply specify a property, but this time not for the age, but for the laptop, right? And then we can assign a value to it. Okay, hold on. Now that's a problem. For the age, we can assign the value because that's a int variable. That's a primitive variable. Laptop is not a primitive variable, it's a reference variable. You can't simply assign a value to it. So what to do? So instead of assigning a value, we can use something. So if I say control space, you can see we get two options, not one. We get a ref and we get value. So we can use ref for the reference. But the question is, what should we specify in the reference? Now that's a question. If you go down, we do have this laptop object here, right? 
and the ID for that is laptop. So the same ID, so instead of using laptop, let me just try one more thing, I will say lab one. So this is the ID we need to use here. I mean, we can also use laptop, I just don't want you to get confused between laptop, laptop, is it a class laptop or the instance laptop or the name laptop? So I've just changed the name of a bean, which is uh, initially it was laptop, I say lab, lab one, and that lab one I'm using here. So what we are trying to do is, we are saying, hey, I'm creating this object. Okay, so when I say I, Spring, uh, when I say, hey, Spring, create the object, Spring says, okay, let me try to create the object for dev. But the moment it, it is trying to create the object, it will create the object for sure. But it will see at the property and say, hey, you know, the, we need to get the laptop uh, reference here. And where do we find it? So the name of the reference is lab1. So it will search the container by saying, hey, do we have any object of the laptop or any object with the name lab1? And it will find that it was it is there, right? And it will try to connect it. So basically what we are doing is we are doing a wiring here. So we are wiring the laptop object into the dev object. So that, that wiring is what is helping to do that. But will it really work? Let's try. So what I will do is I will just run this and we got the error. I was not expecting the error, but we got the error. Let's try to solve it now. So the error, if I go up, and it, it's good to get errors, you get something new every time. Uh, it says bean property laptop is not writable or invalid. Oh, okay, okay. See, when we specify the property for the age, we have used getter setters for it. For the laptop, we have not specified the getter setters yet. My bad. So what I will do is uh, we need to get the getters and setters. In fact, we need setters, not getter, but we'll have both. They come in the parcel. Uh, so I will say generate and uh, getter set for laptop. And now we have it. Okay, I don't think it should complain now. Uh, let's relaunch it. Oh, it's working. You can see it says compiling. So that was the issue. We have not specified the getter setters. And what we have done is we have specified a property for laptop and we are saying that the reference is lab one. Cool, right? So this is how basically you reference it. Now this is a setter injection for the reference variable. What about the constructor? Let's try. So what I will do is uh, let's go back to the same constructor which we are using earlier, but this, instead of saying int age, let me say laptop, laptop, and here this dot laptop should be equal to laptop, okay? So instead of age, I'm going for the, uh, the laptop now. And in here, we can specify, a con in fact, I will do that here. I will say constructor arguments, and then instead of using a value which we have used for int, uh, for the integer variable, let's use ref and say the same thing, which is lab one, and our job is done. So this is the constructor injection. Let me try this and it works. You can see it says dev1, uh, which is the constructor for the parameterized constructor and we got compiling. So this is working. This is the constructor injection. Now, which is better? It depends. If the variable is something which is compulsory when you create the object, it's better to go with uh, constructor. But if the variable is optional, you can go with setter because uh, if you say you want to use a constructor, that means you need to have it when you are creating the object for dev. Setter, you can set it later because we can call the setter method later, not the constructor. So yeah, that's how basically you work with setter and the constructor injection with the help of primitive values and the reference values. So I, I hope uh, it was fun. Now till this point, we were able to achieve constructor and setter injection. It's time to talk about auto wiring. If you remember when we talked about Spring Boot, we have done this in Spring Boot, we have done with auto wiring. But here also without Spring Boot, let's try to explore it. And even before we do that, if you remember the Spring Boot videos, we have talked about different classes and interfaces because in this case, we only have laptop and dev developer. Uh, what we don't have is computer interface and desktop implementation of it. So let's create those and let's get forward. So what I will do is I will just go back here and say, let me just copy and paste or maybe use the same uh, laptop class, but this time we'll name it as desktop. And in desktop, we'll change certain things. I will just close this part. And in desktop, what I will do is when I say uh, the constructor should be desktop created. And in the compiling, I will say compiling with uh, compiling in desktop. Okay, so these are the changes I've made. So in the laptop, it says compiling. I will just change it to compiling in laptop. Okay. Uh, nothing fancy, just two different classes for the same concept. And when I say concept, these two are the, are the same type, right? So they both are computer. So what I will do is I will just extract the interface out of it. 
extract the interface and we'll name this as computer. Uh, you can do this in different IDs, otherwise you can just simply create an interface and uh, have this method which we want. So if you go to computer, okay, void compile. So I wanted this method, I don't know what, I made some mistake while refactoring it, doesn't matter. So you can see we got the interface, uh, which is computer, and both these classes, the laptop and desktop, need to implement computer. So I will say implements computer. If this is not happening by default in your IDE, just try to manually type it. That should not be a problem. So we got the interface computer and then we got two implementation laptop and desktop. Okay. Just to go with this concept of coding for the interfaces. Now, since we have made those changes, I also want to change my developer. Now developers should not be dependent on a laptop, right? So developers should be dependent on a computer. So I will just make mention computer here. And uh, here also, I will just say this is a type. I will say comp even comp works. Okay. And then since we have made those changes, I have to also change the, in fact, I will just remove this particular constructor of parameters constructor of dev. And then we have to make two changes here. So when I say two changes, basically I'm, I want to change the getter setters, not for laptop this time, but for the computer. So I will just say generate uh, getter setters for the computer. I will say, okay. And now we got this two getter set. I mean, we got these two methods. And then uh, here also in the build, I will say com.compile, not laptop.compile. Because as a developer, it doesn't matter which one you want to use, you, which one you are using basically, desktop or laptop. It should work, right? Uh, so we made few changes and will this work? That's a question. Let's try. I have not made any changes in the uh, spring.xml file. So there's no configuration change. Let's see if this works and let's see what breaks when we do that. So yeah, we got the error. And if you see the error, it says error creating a bean def, of course, but why? Uh, it says cannot resolve to a constructor. Yeah, because we have removed the constructor. And I think in the XML file, we are still using this constructor. So what I will do is I will just remove everything since we know now how do we use it. So let me remove everything. Okay, so dev is basically empty now. And we got a laptop and the name for the ID for the laptop is lab one. What I want to do is I want to set some properties, right? So we have to basically set the property for uh, the two things. If, if you go to dev, I will just close this. We got two properties. We got comp and we got age. And maybe we don't even need age now. Let's only focus on comp, okay? Uh, of course, even if it is there, it should not make any difference, but I just want to keep the code a bit clean. So let's say we have only one dependency, which is of computer here. And if I go back to the XML file now, the dev needs to have a computer object, uh, the property. So I will say property. The name of the property is comp, but what should be the value? Of course, you cannot set a value is because this is not a primitive type. This is a reference type. So instead of value, it should be ref. The question is what it is referring to. Now, computer is an interface, right? So if you look at developer, it is dependent on a computer and computer itself is an interface. So I can't simply create an object of the interface, right? So I have to look for the implementation. And in this case, we got two implementation. We got desktop and we got laptop. But if you look at the bean creation, we are not creating the object for desktop. We are just creating the object for laptop. So basically in your container, when you run this, if it, is, it works, basically you will get two objects, one for your developer and one for your laptop. Okay, so we'll get these two objects. Now laptop itself is a computer, right? So can we just inject laptop in this developer when it is asking for uh, the comp? Yes, we can. So what we can simply do is we already have the object created for laptop, which is lab one. We can simply refer it here. Our job is done, right? So now if I read on this, I hope this time it will work. And if not, let's debug it. But it works. You can see it says uh, working on the awesome project, laptop constructor, developer constructor, nowhere it's saying desktop constructor is because we have not created the bean here. And then it says compiling in laptop. So perfectly makes sense. But how about I want the object for uh, the desktop as well. So I can say bean id and i can say this is desk one and i will say class the class is com dot telesco dot desktop and then in here okay we don't have any property there so now we got two objects and now if i run this look at the output basically you will also get the desktop constructor so it depends upon how many beans you mention here okay so now you even got the desktop object here Okay, so in total, we got three objects, but in developer, which object we are using, we are using the lab one. Again, we have done this before. We know how it is referring now. 
But yeah, if you want to say this is desk one, that's your choice. I mean, you can mention what property you want. Do you want a desktop or do you want a laptop? So you can change that in XML file. And now it says compiling in desktop. So the way you change that, it will basically inject that particular object in the developer. So it will inject this, not this one. Okay, things are working out. But what if I change the name here? So let's say uh, the ID for laptop is comp. Okay, and uh, will this work now? Of course, I have to change here as well. It will work because it will not be using comp, it will be using desk one. But what if I say comp? Will there be an issue if you have the same name? Uh, of course not. See, this comp is basically referring to the developer variable name, which is comp. And the second comp, this one is referring to the name of the bean or the ID of the bean, which is laptop bean, which is comp. And now if you run this, of course it will refer to the laptop. And you can see it says compiling a laptop. So our theory is working. But don't you think these two names are same? When you say name is comp, uh, the reference also comp. What if I just skip this part? I mean, I, Spring is so awesome, right? Uh, if Spring is that awesome, I want Spring to actually connect that automatically. Uh, what we are doing is we are doing wiring and I want this wiring to be happening automatically. We have done that in Spring Boot. Here also, if I just comment it and if I run, uh, let's see if Spring is happy about it. No, no, Spring is not happy. Spring says it's still null, null point exception. It's because we are commenting it and we are assuming that it will do auto wiring, but Spring says, no, 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 I will not automatically do it. You have to tell me to do it. So what you can do is you can just in the bean tag, you can add one more attribute called auto wire if you can see. Auto wire and you can say by name. Now what it will do is it will check. Okay, so in this particular developer class, we got only one property of comp, the computer property. The name is comp. What I will do is I will search for this name in this particular container. So in this container, do we have any object with comp? Yes, so we have this name here. So for this object, we have comp. For this object, it is desk one. So it will search, hey, do we have any object with name com? And yes, we do have it, uh, which is here. So it will try to connect it. And that's auto wiring. So if I run this, your spring is happy. It says compiling in laptop. He's happy. So basically that's how you use auto wire. But the problem is you can't use desktop here because you can't have two things with the same name. Example, if you, if you say both are comp, uh, there will be a confusion. And you can see a huge confusion. It says bean com is already used, right? So we cannot use the same ID two times. And that's why they're IDs, right? It should be unique. Uh, so we can have it comp and comp one. But let's say uh, if you want to use desktop as well, one thing you can do, you can remove the IDs or uh, you can change by saying, hey, I don't want to go by name. I want to go by type, even you can do that. So this time I'm not saying by name, I'm saying by type. So when you're searching for comp, it's basically searching for these two components here and says, okay, we got laptop and we got desktop, both are computer. What I will do time being is I will just comment this laptop and let's see if that works. So by type, it is searching for the type of a computer and desktop is a type of computer. But the problem starts when you have both. Now, if you see, we got two beans. Of course, they have different name, but it doesn't matter. We are not even searching by name. We are searching, searching by type. The type, of computer and desktop and laptop both are computers and now if you run this your spring is not happy your spring says hey you know i was searching for one but i found two there are two beans which are claiming that they are computers i can't i can't select one it, i don't want to be biased as a programmer we can be biased not the framework so what we can say okay in case of confusion give me the laptop so i will say primary is equal to true. So you can use the primary attribute. So primary says in terms of confusion, go with this particular bean, which is the laptop. So we are saying primary is true. And we have done this in the Spring Boot as well with the help of at primary annotation. But here I'm using the attribute and it says uh, compiling with laptop. Uh, so now I hope you are able to connect what we have done in the Spring Boot and what is happening here. Of course, XML is not something we love about, but I just wanted to explain you what is happening behind the scene. So now uh, this laptop object is becomes the primary one. We can do actually one more thing, which, which we have not talked about, which is the app.java. In this, if you see, we are saying get bean. And when we say get bean, we are asking for the ID, right? I don't want to mention the ID. What if I mention the type of the object I want? I want the object of, or not computer, I want the object of dev. 
Now, will this work? So we are not searching by name here. We are searching by type. And when you do search by type, you don't even have to typecast it. So it reduces the number of words you write. And if you run this, it works, right? So you have a choice. You can get, you can get bean by name or you can get bean by type. So in this case, uh, if you see the XML file, the name is not important. The type is important. So you're searching for the object by type. So that, that's how basically you work with the auto wire concept. So that's it from this video where we talked about the auto wiring and I hope uh, the Spring Framework without Spring Boot makes sense now. Uh, enough of Spring Framework now. Let's focus on Spring Boot mode and then we'll move towards the project. So I hope you're enjoying this series where we are talking about Spring and Spring Boot. Uh, and it's time to focus more on Spring Boot. Now, till this point, we have seen Spring Boot and Spring and then we were able to achieve the same thing in both the projects. So basically the demo spring, the project which we have created is for the normal spring without Spring Boot. And then the My App is basically the same thing with the, with the help of Spring Boot. If you can see the classes, we got the same number of classes and interfaces. We got computer, we got desktop, we got dev, laptop, and then the main class. If you go to the demo spring, the same thing, we got app, which is the main class. And then we got a computer, desktop, dev, and laptop. And we are doing the same thing. So if you, if you go back to your uh, desktop, or maybe if you go, go back to your developer, you can see in the developer, we are doing the same thing. We are calling a method of the computer. And if you go to my app, I think it will be done the same thing. Yeah, so we have the uh, computer object in dev, and then we are trying to call compile. Both are same, right? But if you look at what is different is the configuration. Now, both are doing the same thing, but the, the configuration is different. If you look at the project with normal spring, if you want to configure this, we have to use a XML file. Of course, there are other options as well, but we have gone for XML. So in the XML, we have to mention everything what we wanted. If you want to get a bean, you have to mention that. If you want to uh, have uh, auto wiring, you have to mention that. So everything need to be done in the XML file. The problem is most of us don't like configuration. Even if you, See, sometimes we don't have a choice. We have to do configuration. But then when you have an idea, if you want to implement something and if you spend most of it, most of your time in the configuration, somewhere you lose, lose a track of the project or you lose the interest or you spend time debugging your configurations. Example, I have worked a lot on XML, so I find it easy now, or maybe I'm comfortable to work with XML. But if you are new to XML files or XML uh, configuration, even if a small spelling mistakes will create issue. Of course, it will not give issue here. Example, if I make a mistake uh, here, because of the IDE, I can, I'm getting the error. But if I'm not using an IDE, and if you run this, if you use a simple IDE, which is not showing you this error, and if you run this, and then you spend your a lot of amount of time debugging what went wrong, right? So that's one of the issue with the configuration. On the other hand, if you talk about our project of Spring Boot, there's no configuration file. Of course, there is a configuration file, which I want to show you, which is the application.properties. And of course, you can set your properties here. But at this point, we have not done that. We only got one property, which is optional. You can just also remove this. Uh, apart from that, there's no configuration index in the property file or the XML file. We are doing those configuration with the help of annotations. And sometimes it is easy to work with annotations. And at least uh, it is easier to debug. So you know what is going wrong where. Now, I just want to compare of the, these two projects. If you go back to your Spring project, you can see whichever class I open, nowhere we are using any annotation. Not even here, not in dev, not in laptop, not in app. Uh, there's, no con there's no annotation anywhere, right? And whatever we have to do, we have to do that in XML. In XML, what we have done is we have created these beans and we have using auto wire also. We also specified primary here. If you want to compare this with the Spring Boot, we don't have XML, but if you look at the classes, we got dev class, on top of that, we are using add component. Uh, so instead of using a bean tag, we are using add component. Then we are using add auto wire for the auto wiring. Uh, we are using add qualifier. Uh, we can also use primary, I think, when we go for the desktop or laptop. Okay, we have not mentioned, but you can do that. So you can mention primary here. So we can mention primary here, and that is say, that is similar to what we have done here, okay? And so basically what we are doing is we are using different annotations. How do we start the container? So if you go back to your main application file or main file, uh, using this line, we are starting the container. In case of Spring, uh, the normal Spring project, 
we have to use this new class path XML configuration and this will start the container. So both are doing the same thing, but in Spring Boot, we are doing less configuration. But the magic is whatever you are doing in Spring Boot, behind the scene, it is using the Spring Framework. Okay, so yeah, ultimately we are using Spring Framework even if we are using Spring Boot. So those are the changes in these two projects. And as I mentioned before, we'll only focus on the Spring Boot from now. Before we go ahead, I want to talk about more things. See, uh, ultimately we are going to build a project, right? And we have discussed this in the first few videos. So we are going to build a project and the project which you're going to build is a web project, right? So whatever we have done till now, that's basically a console project. And now we want to work on the web project. So whatever annotations we, are, we have used or the configuration we have used, that's for standalone project. Now, when you talk about web, things are a bit different. How it is different? First of all, when you want to work with a web project, and if you're not using Spring, if you're using normal Java, and if you want to build a web project, so what's so special about web project? Other thing is the web is hosted on the server and it will accept the request from the client. So in this case, uh, we do have a client here who will send the request to the server and server will respond back. And this thing is happening on the internet with the help of HTTP protocol. So we have to use this protocol uh, to achieve this, okay? And this is hosted on the server. So that means the application which we are building should be capable enough to accept the request over the internet, which is your uh, HTTP request. Right? So this has to be something special. So you can't simply run this on JVM. Uh, JVM is only for the machine. Now, if you want this to work on the server, basically we need something called a, a web server or a web container basically. And what you work with Java or what you use in Java is something called servlets. Okay, and servlets run in the web container. We also call that container as a servlet container but which container we have to use, which software we have to use, which tool we have to use. And the name of the tool is Tomcat. So basically we have to use Tomcat to run the servlets. But hold on, we are talking about Spring here, right? We want to use Spring. So even if you are using Spring Framework, ultimately behind the scene, Spring is going to use servlets, okay? And it will run on Tomcat. So if you want to make a web application using Spring, behind the scene it will get converted into servlets, which will run on the Tomcat. So it's important for us to use Tomcat as well. Now the question is, if, you're using, if you want to use a Tomcat here, we have to install Tomcat, we have to run our project. Uh, Spring Boot says you don't have to worry about that. In the project itself, in the project folder of in your IDE, you will get the embedded Tomcat. So you will be having Tomcat inside your project. So you don't need external Tomcat. Uh, those were the beautiful days where you have to do a lot of configuration for the Tomcat, uh, set the port number, make sure it is running, uh, create a var file of your project, then put it on inside Tomcat. You know, listening to it looks a lot of steps, right? And literally it was a lot of steps. But now because of embedded Tomcat, you don't have to worry about it. With your project, you will get the Tomcat. You can run it anywhere you want on the machine, not on your car. Okay, come back. So uh, basically we uh, have Tomcat here. Next, we need some layer which will accept the request. Uh, so if you remember in the first few videos, we have talked about different layers we are going to create. We have a controller layer who is responsible to accept the request. Uh, then we have to use service layer and repository layer. Now these are normal classes, but then this controller is a special class because it was going to accept the request from the client and also respond it. Uh, and we have to understand how this works. So even before we start with the project, we'll focus on how do we create this controller. And to achieve that, we have to first understand Spring MVC. In fact, Spring Boot MVC. We'll be using Spring Boot here to achieve that. Now, till this point, we have worked with Spring Boot and Spring Framework, but that was for the standalone application or console-based application. Now, we want to focus on the web. See, the project which we were discussing is actually a web project. And of course, we have seen the project before, but uh, if you talk about the layers, we do have a client here, right? Now, this is a client. And then we have a server with different layers and then we have a database. Of course, we are using database here so that we can get some data and we want to store that data for the permanent purpose. So that will store in database and then we can fetch it. Uh, we are using a server which will accept the request from the client, which will process the request, uh, maybe get, getting data from the database. So there are different operations here. The client is someone who is using this app application. So you are the client, I'm the client. 
So whoever opens this application or the website on the on the browser is a client. Now this client is not just a web application. It can be a mobile application as well. So maybe you can have one more client here, which is your mobile application. And then this mobile application can also send requests and get response. Okay, so basically in the mobile application, the layout will be there. What you are going to send from the server is just data. And most of the time or most of the application which you are building now follows this approach where basically you only send the data. So think about a mobile application, maybe any, uh, any application which is your favorite. Uh, example, if you are watching a sport, it can be any sport. And if you don't want to watch the match, you, but you want to check the score. So we have certain applications which will give you this code. But if you open that application, of course you will get the layout and you will also get the data. But let's say internet is not working. So that app will give you the layout, but that app cannot give you the data because data is coming from the server. That means app will already have the layout. What you are going to send from the server, it is just the data. Same goes for your client. See in the earlier days, you know, if you go back way back in the time, uh, when you send something from the server, the server has to send two things. First, the layout and also the data, right? Uh, so when I say data, it can be simple data. But what about the layout? Layout has to be done with the help of HTML and CSS, okay? And that's what you will make your page look beautiful on the client side. So server is responsible to generate both. But nowadays what we are doing is we are using two different applications for the for the front end and for the for the back end so what you do is you use certain certain things like react or maybe angular js in this you basically have the layout ready which will go to the client and then you will send the request for the data from the server and then server will send the data and this data can be represented with the help of json or maybe xml okay so that means as a back end you are responsible to send only the data the client can be a browser which has React application uh, loaded. Of course, you will have to send that from the server itself, but as a separate uh, thing. Or maybe your front end, or maybe your uh, client is a mobile application where the layout is already there. What you will send here is again JSON. Now there are different formats like JSON XML. Uh, JSON is very famous, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation, uh, which is a very simple and good looking format data which you get on the client side. Okay, so when I say good looking, not exactly it will look good. It's just that it's simple to understand and uh, simple to represent. Okay, so basically, uh, this is what we are building, right? Now, we are not concerned about React here. Of course, you will get the code uh, in the upcoming videos. We are concerned about building a backend. How do you build a web backend? So we are going to create this controller. This is what is important. Now, how we are going to do this? Now, this has to be a special a special uh, project, not, a, not the project which we are doing, because in this project, we don't have the web feature. How do I know that? See, when you go to the pom.xml file, we are saying that it is a Spring Boot starter project. In the starter project, you will not get web by default. You want web. If you remember, when we went for the Spring projects, the web was a separate part. So we have to add Spring Web here. Of course, you can simply add a dependency that will, that will make your job good. But I don't want to add dependency now. Again, it will be more confusing. So what we'll do is, and of course you can do that. It's just that I'm avoiding it. So what you can do is you can go back to your browser. Remember this page, this uh, particular website, which is start.spring.io. This is where you can create a new project for web. So I will create a Maven project and then the language is Java. The Spring Boot version, so when we have started the videos, it was 3.2.5, now it is 3.2.6, upgraded version. And okay, so I will change the group ID, which is com.telesco, project is simple web app. And then we are going to create a packaging of jar and the version which I'm using in this machine is 21. So I will go with that. Next, we have to add dependencies. This is Spring Starter Boot or Spring Boot Starter will be already there. You don't have to add that. What we have to add is web. So we'll be using Spring Web, enter. Apart from this, I'm also going to add the dev tools. See what happens is every time you make a change in your code, you have to restart your server. What I want to do is I want to have a live reload and that's what you get here. So basically you can also, it also improves your application restarts. If you want to restart, it will provide you live, re uh, live reload that will help to speed up. So we just need this too. Of course, we don't want to include database at this point, but if you want to do that, you can add one more dependency for our databases. Maybe uh, the MySQL driver, if you want to use, or Postgres. I'm going to use Postgres, but if you want to use MySQL, that's your choice. 
Uh, but at this point, we don't need any of the uh, DBMS or databases driver. So I will simply click on generate. This will generate the project for me, and that's what is here. Uh, we just have to unzip it and load in your project. So I'm going to unzip this. So unzipping done, and now we have to basically open that in the IDE. So I'll go back to the IDE. I will say open the project. So this is the project which we got. I will just click on open. Uh, I will use a new window or maybe this window I just want. I don't want this window anymore. And you can see, uh, okay, we already have demo Spring, we'll close that. So you can see this is your Spring project. And the beauty is, this is a web project, right? And I have not done any coding yet. In the normal world, uh, I mean, before Spring Boot, if you want to run your uh, web application, basically you have to run a server. It can be a Tomcat server or some other servers. Basically, first you have to run the server in your machine, and then you can basically run your project after the configuration. But now, I have not done any coding. Still, I will go back to my main. If you can see, we already have a main code here. I will just right click here and say run without doing any coding. And it should work. And it worked. If you can see, it says spring, awesome, this uh, text here. And it says the server started. The server started on port number 8080. So that means even doing any code, it is running. At this point, I will just stop it. I just want to show you something. I will just go back to my browser and I will just go here, localhost colon 8080. Why 8080 is because we were running the project on 8080. I will say enter. At this point, it says this site cannot be reached. It's because the server is not running. But what I will do is I will just run this now. Let's run the project and uh, yeah, bit fast, cool. Uh, it says the, it started on 8080. I will just say enter. Can you see that? We got something. Of course, not the output we were expecting, but we got something, right? We are not getting that page which says uh, this site is not reachable. You are getting something. It says 404 because we are sending a request for the home page and we have not handled the request. How do we do that? How do we handle the request? Maybe I just want to say welcome to Telesco. How do I do that here? And for that, basically, we need someone on the server who can accept our request. The request is going to the server, but there's no one on the server side who can say, hey, you know, let me handle it and let me return welcome to the Lisco. Let's create that particular person there. Not a person, some service. The way you can do that is you can right click on your project or you can right click on your package and create a new Java class. And you'll be saying, seriously, we have to create a Java class to handle the request? Yes, a simple class can do that. Let me show you. Or maybe I'm just lying here. Let's try. So what I will do is I will say uh, maybe home. I want to. I want someone who can handle the home page request. Now question arises: Who is that particular person? Can I say person here? Doesn't matter. Who is that particular person who can handle this? And that's where we have talked about the controller. So we need a layer here, a class maybe who is a controller who can handle your request. So I will say this is my home controller. And in this home controller, I can accept the request and respond. But the question is, if you want to do that in Java, how do you, how do you make something work? So basically we need a method here. So I will create a method and this method returns a string because I want to say welcome to the disco, right? So I will say public string, it returns a string and the method name can be, let's say, greet. So someone is coming to the home page, I will say greet. And I will simply return, welcome to the disco. That's it, simple class, simple method. And you just save this and restart and see the magic. So I will just restart this, go back to my page and the magic, nothing happened. That's the magic, nothing happened. See the thing is, Spring is awesome. Spring is magic, but not entire magic. We have to do, we still have to do some configuration. Uh, not much. The problem is, see, this is a normal class, right? Now Spring has no idea that this class is responsible to handle the request for the home page, And we don't want Spring to guess because once you start expecting your framework to guess something for you, it becomes uncontrollable. You, you don't know what's happening behind the scene or uh, if something is buggy, it will be difficult to debug. And that's why you need control. 
So what I want to do is I want to say, hey, you know, this is the normal, not a normal class spring framework. This is someone who, who is a controller. So you just say add controller. Remember in Spring Boot, we have used add component. In the same way, if you want to create a controller, just say add controller. Will this do a job? Uh, see, not exactly. See, on the website, you will be having multiple requests. We are requesting homepage. Maybe after some time, you want to have contact us, about us, add to cart, or maybe all those features, right? Everything is a request. Request with, with different URL. What URL I'm talking about? See here, you get URLs, right? Like we can have about, or maybe you can have contact. So this is important. At this point, I'm not passing anything, so that's blank. We can only say slash, enter. So I want to do it for the slash. So for every request, you can create a different method which will respond. So at this point, I'm requesting for this. If someone requests for the slash, which is the home page, I want this to be get, getting called. And to do that, we have to use a method called request mapping. Okay, so this is the annotation, not method. So we have to use annotation, which is request mapping. And in the, back, in the bracket of this, we can say for which request. For the slash request, I'm to, I want to call this. So that's request mapping. Now, will this work? See, we, we learn from errors, right? And we will get errors here. Let's see, but what error you get? I will just refresh this, and it says, okay, it still says 404. Uh, that's weird. But if you see, it is also saying something. It says no static resource. Welcome to the disco. Something different. Okay, so it says welcome to the disco, but no, it is not showing the text. But it says no static resource. Welcome to the disco. See what happens is a uh, controller behind the scene, and this is how Spring Framework was built before. And depending upon your use case, you can customize it. So what it does is it says, okay, I am going to call this, and I'm calling this method. Okay, the method is getting called. To show you the proof, what I will also do is I'll say I am here. Just to show you that this works, I'll just restart the app and go back here, say refresh, it's still not reloaded or done. If I show you the console, it says I'm here. That means this method is getting called for sure, but still it's not working. The reason it is not working is what your Spring Framework does or Spring Web does is, it says when you call this method and when you return welcome to the disco, it will look for a file called welcome to the disco. But why file? Remember when I talked about the old days when a server used to send the layout with data and that layout is a page. So it is searching for a page called welcome to the disco. In our project, we don't have that page and we don't want to return the page. We want to return the text, right? And to achieve this, what you can do is instead of using a controller, you can use something called a REST controller. Now REST API is a concept where you return the data from the, from the server to client. So REST stands for representational state transfer, you basically transfer the state, the data from the server to client, not the layout, only the data. And if you want to do that, automatically you can use REST controller. This is one way. Uh, the other way is you can send here, you can use one more annotation by saying, hey, I'm not looking for the page, I'm looking for the body, the data. So you can say response body. So what it will do is it will return the data now. Uh, I hope this will work if the annotations are correct. Go back here and refresh and you got welcome to the disco. So basically what we are doing is we are returning the data, not the page. But if you want to create the pages, you can do that with the help of Thameleaf or a JSP. You can create those pages here and you can return them by mentioning the names here. But we don't want to do that. We don't want to return the page because the page is there in the React application. What you want to return is the data. And I don't want to use response body from now. What I'm going to use is rest controller because we just want to return data. So we can say rest controller and even that works. Do I have to restart the application? We'll do that quickly and say refresh. It works. So that's how basically you return for the slash. What if you want to do something else? Maybe you want to return for the about page. So if someone is requesting for, let's say slash about, you want to return something for that. Slash about will not work now is because we're not handling it. So if you want to handle that, it's very simple. You can say public, return something, and I will say about method, and you can accept, you can return, we can use our tagline. We don't teach, we educate. Okay, so I want to return this, this is a tagline, and then I'm going to say request mapping, and this mapping is for the request about. So you will say slash, about here. So for different requests, you specify different uh, methods. 
And there's no compulsion that this about should be same as this one. It can be different. Restart the server, reload, and it says we don't teach, we educate. Okay, so that's how basically you can have different methods here. And that's how you use Spring Web. But then if you see this image, we have multiple layers here. We got the service layer, we got the repository layer. How do we create those things? Of course, we'll discuss that in the upcoming sessions, but just to give you a hint, for different layers, you will create different classes. Okay, so for service, we have different class. For, for repository, you will be having a different class. And they will also have their annotations, not controller, but something else. Next, there's no compulsion that you should put all the requests in one particular controller. You can have multiple controllers here. Okay, and that's the beauty. So you can have multiple controllers. And let me create one for you. So maybe I will just say this controller as uh, a login controller. And in this, I can handle the login request. So request mapping, not request, request mapping. I don't need this import. Request mapping for, let's say, login request. And this has to be a controller, a REST controller to be specific. And here we can have a method. So I'll say public. It should return a string. Of course, it should not be a string, but at this point I'm saying string, and I will return something. Because we're not focusing on logic here, we just want to check how can we have multiple controllers. And I'm going to say login page. Okay, nothing fancy, just a login page. Uh, and I forgot the annotation here. Okay, now by doing this, what, what, do you, what do you think? Will this work? And why I think it should not work in general is, we have multiple controllers, right? And multiple controllers has different requests. We got login here, we got slash, and we got about. How your Spring Framework knows for which request we have to go to which controller? Don't you think that's a confusion? We can have multiple controllers. We can have 10 controllers, 20 controllers. We can have 100 controllers. How your Spring Framework knows which one to call? First of all, let's check if this is working, and then we'll discuss how it is working. Or, I mean, if it works, maybe I'm not good with creating a suspense. So I'll just restart this and about is working, but what about login? Even login is working. So how it's working? So what happens is Spring MVC, basically, or Spring Web, basically has something called a front controller. Now, whenever you send a request from the client, the request first goes to someone who is here. So there's one more layer here, which you can't see, which Spring gives you. And this layer here is your front controller. And this is not something which you create. Spring will create this for you. And this front controller sees all the request mappings. So it creates request mapping for all the controllers. And it knows for which request it has to send the request to which controller. And that's the job of your front controller. Okay, And then the request goes to the uh, controller. So that's about the introduction. Can I say introduction? Yes, because when we start working on the project, you will see more. But that's how the controller works. Maybe you have other questions. What if you want to send data from the client to the server? We have not done that. We are sending data from the, uh, from the server to the client. What about from client to server? In that case, we have to send data here. This is where you will accept that data. Now, till this point, we were able to work with Spring Boot. And also, we have created our first Spring Boot web project. And of course, we don't want to discuss everything about web. We want to do that once we start with the project. But there are certain things, some basics we have to understand. In terms of basics, we have talked about how do you map a particular request. So we have done for two requests here, one for the home page, if you can see here, and one for the about page. And in fact, we have done one more. If you remember, for the login as well, we have done this. So in total, we got three requests, right? Now, in this request, basically what we are doing is we are sending a request from the client to server. And then on the server side, basically we are mapping it and returning a data. Now, when you return login page or when you return uh, this text like welcome to the disco or we don't teach, we educate, basically what we are doing is we are sending the text back to the client, right? We are not sending a HTML page. In fact, we have talked about it. When we use REST controller here, it returns the data. But if you remove the REST from here, it will return the page name. So basically, your Spring Framework will see, OK, it says welcome to the disco. That means I have to search for a file called welcome to the disco, right? And then it search for the file. But we don't have that file. We just want to send data. We don't want to work with the UI part here. We just want to work with data. That's, that's more important, right? And it's working. But let's say you don't want to return a normal text. See, most of the time when you talk about any particular application, you want to return data for a particular entities, 
right? Example, if it is an e-commerce website, uh, you want to return the products, right? And product will not just have a name. Product will have other details as well. The product ID, product name, uh, product price, product category. So it will have all those things. Now, same goes for, let's say, if you want to book a flight. In flight as well, you'll be having flight details. You'll be having a timing, you'll be having a flight number, and all those details. And think about any application. We normally work with an uh, entity. And in the world of Java, we represent that with the help of objects. So that means if I want to return some details, it can be multiple entities, not just one. So if you talk about the e-commerce website, if you search for a particular product, let's say if you want to search for a laptop, now it will give you a list of laptops. So not one, list of laptops. Now the idea is, how do you send that data from server to client in which format? Will you send as a normal text? Of course not, right? Because on the client side as well, if it is a React application or a mobile application, they cannot accept a normal text. It will be difficult for them to convert that into a UI or read read it from the text and that's why we have to use a json format it can be xml or json uh, nowadays we are using json so we'll use that so basically what i want to do now is i want to return the data not the data normal data i want to return the object the object will have the data which i have to return back to the client now this is tricky not in terms of spring this is tricky in general so what i will do is i will create a new controller and this controller is responsible to return uh, let's say products. So I will say product controller. And we are going to use this later in the project. So I will say product controller. Okay, a simple product controller, nothing fancy. And then this is responsible to accept the request for the products. So when I say public uh, return a string, at this point I will say string, but we'll change it later. And I will say get products. So maybe I want to return all the products in the database. Uh, and of course, in this video, we're not going to work with database. We are just going to return the dummy data, which we have. So it's a list of products. And I want to return something here. At this point, I don't have the data. Now, since we are not working with database, let me create some fake data. And the way I will do that is, first of all, I need a class which will represent a product. So when I say a product, what it would have? Product ID, product name, uh, let's say price. Let's say we have this three. So I'll just right click here and say new. I want to create a class which will represent a product. And this will have certain things. So it will have private. We can also use Lombok here. Then we don't have to type a lot of things. So what we can do is we can get the Lombok so that, in fact, I will first of all type this. So I'll say private int uh, broad ID, then private string broad name and private int price. Let's say we have this three. Later on, we can have we can increase this. So at this point, we got three, and now I want to use Lombok. Why do we need Lombok? Is is because when you use a private variable, of course, I have to create get a, get a status for this constructor as well. So instead of that, I can simply use Lombok library, which will help me to create those things behind the scene, uh, which will make it a bit easy to read. And how do we get Lombok? It's very easy. You go to pom file and you add the Lombok dependency here. So somewhere here. Okay, but I don't remember the Lombok dependency or the group ID and the artifact ID. What you can do is you can go to your browser, search for MVN repository and search for Lombok. This is the project Lombok. Lombok. Let's get this and go with the version which, is look, which looks stable. So this one, it got 3000 use. So I will just pick up this one, copy this and paste it here. Okay, now once you do that, of course I have to remove this line as well. Uh, I will save this and you can see there's an option of Maven reload. I will do that so that in my dependency, I will get Lombok as well. So if you expand the external libraries and if you search, you will find Lombok somewhere. It should be in org Lombok is L. Okay, it's project Lombok, is it? Yeah. So you can see we got Lombok here, right? Now, once you have that, you can go back to your, we can minimize this. We don't need external dependencies. Reduce the size of it. And go back to your product control, not product controller product. And here we can add an annotation called data. So this will give you the get status as well. And now once you have this, you can go back to your product controller and this is where you can return the data. Now normally if you talk about the layers, if you remember we have talked about different layers, right? We got controller and if you, uh, if a controller wants the data, now it will not ask data from database. It will ask data from the service layer. Now this is where we have to introduce new layers because you, can, you should not be writing any business logic inside the controller. Controller is just for accepting the request and responding to the client, not doing any business logic. Okay, so we have to get a service layer which will have a business logic. So what I will do is I will create a service layer here because see, when you talk about, oh, what, what I'm creating, Let me delete this file, not needed. Yeah, so here from get products, what I want to do is I want to get all the products from the service. 
I don't want to write the logic here. So let me create a new class and this class will be responsible for the logic. So I will say product service and I want this to be in different package. So what I will do is I will put all the controllers. If you can see, we have multiple controllers here. Controller should go in controller package. Uh, the service classes should go in service package and the product goods should go in the model package. So there's a concept of MVC, model view controller. So the job of a controller is to accept the request from the client, respond it. So in view, we basically return the page. Now here we are not returning a page, we're returning data, but still it's a part of MVC. The model represents data. So if you talk about the product here, this represents the data, right? So this is model package. So I will say new, I want to create packages, uh, one for the controller. Now this package will have all the controllers. So you can just move that there, refactor. And I want to create a service package as well. So I will create a package which will have the service because in future we are going to get multiple service classes. So I will just move that here. And then I want to create model as well. In fact, once we start with database, we will also create a repo package, not a class. I want to create the package. This is for model and we'll move product to model. Okay, so now we are creating those packages. It will look good and also easy to find. So all the controllers will be in controller, all the models will be in model, all the service will be in service. Okay, now in the service class, basically I want to create a method which will return me the list of products. So it's a list of products and I will say get products. You can have different name, but that's fine. And we can return it. Now, since product is not part of this package, I will just import this and we got it. And we have to also import the list. So we got it. And now our job is to return the list of products. Now the question is, where do we find this list? We don't have a database. So time being, we can create some dummy data. So I can create a list of data. So what I will do is I will say list of uh, product. And I will say products is equal to, and let me create uh, the product like this, arrays dot as list. And I will say new, product. Okay, I want to have a constructor as well, which will accept this. So what I will do is in the product, I will add one more all argument constructor here uh, so that it will create a constructor for me. So this is a feature of Lombok. I'll just go back here and say, I want to create the list of product, which will accept the first one product ID. Then I, I will say iPhone price is let's say 50,000. Okay. It's not accepting all arguments constructor. But anyway, we'll try to run this and see what, what goes wrong. So, and then I will also say new product and this time we'll add 102. And let's say we only have two now. We just want to see right if it's working or not. I will say Canon camera because that's what I can see on this on, on the desk. And then I will say price is 70. Okay, so we got this two data. It's not working because of Lombok. I think when you run this, it will it, will, it has to enable the Lombok uh, Thing. Just see if this is working. Okay, there's no compile time issue. So of course that's a Lombok uh, problem. And it says 8080 port is not uh, working. It may be because the port is busy with something else. What I will do is I will change the port number. So this is the problem with uh, with my machine. Every time I close my IntelliJ IDEA, it's not able to close the port number. It may not be issue with you. Uh, so it says 8080 is busy. So what I will do is I will change the port number. So we can do that. So if the port number 8080 is busy, I will say server dot port is equal to 8081. So now this time it will run on 8081. Even 8081 is busy. That's weird. That's weird. I don't know where I'm using all these ports. So I've, I've not restarted this machine from a long time. So maybe that's the issue. Uh, and I've not closed the runtime properly. So 8086. Okay, there's some other issue then. It's not the problem of this. So what I will do is I'll just try to solve this first. Okay, Lombok is not working properly as expected. I'll say Maven reload project. Okay, what I will also do is I will also make this as a component. And it looks like most of the IDE problem, not this. And for the service class, we can also use component or we can use service package or service annotation. So basically for different layers, we can use different annotations. Ultimately they are same, even service package, service annotation uh, behind the scene is a component. You can see when I go over here, it is also a component. But uh, it is similar, but there are some differences which only works for a specific use case and it's still giving this problem. So maybe Lombok is not working. So what I will do is, it's fine. Uh, we can just remove this and create guest letters. It normally works, I don't know what's going wrong there. So I'll stick to my basic thing. So we'll right click here and say generate. And let me know if it is working for you on your machine. There might be some issue. Uh, right click, generate constructor for all. 
Okay, so we got the constructor now, and now it should not be an issue, and you can see this is solved. Some issue with the Lombok. Okay, once we have done this, uh, next we have to return this products. So basically we got the products, we can return it. In fact, I can add one more now, since it, look, it is looking good. Uh, I will say 103, I'll say sure mic, and price is let's say 40. I'm not sure what's the, or oh, maybe 10. Okay, so we got three products now and we are returning. So as you can see, all the logic we are writing in the service package. In the controller, nothing. Now what controller will do is, controller will get this data from the service. So in here we have to create a product service and we'll name this as service is equal to new product service. Now this is what we don't want to do, right? We don't want to create the object by ourselves. We want Spring to give it to us. And once you got the service, I can simply say service because service will return the products. So when you're asking for the controller, controller will say, okay, let me get it from the service. So service.getProducts, but it will return the least of product, not one, it will return the least of products. Now this will not work is because we are not writing at rate auto wire. So we need the object so we can ask for it. So the object will be created inside the Spring container because of this service annotation, which is component behind the scene. And you can simply uh, auto wire it. Now some, some certain things are missing here. On top of this, we have to say rest controller. And on top of this method, we have to say request mapping and for which request. So whenever I say slash products, I want this. So whenever you say slash products, you have to return this. So simple, right? Uh, will this work? That's the question. Let's try. So what I will do is uh, this time, I hope it will work. I will just relaunch this. I know why it is saying the port number is busy. Okay. Okay. Now this time problem is different. It says uh, product required for a bean of type int could not be found. The parameter is zero of the constructor in model required a bean of type int that could not be found. Okay, so let me go back to the product. It's fun to debug the applications, right? So it says prod ID, we are returning int for the first one. And in this service, we are passing int, not an issue. Okay, is it required to have a no argument constructor? Okay, this time we got another error. It says port number 8086 was already in use. Okay, let's solve this. Looks like there's some issue with the IDE. What I will do is I will just close this. Okay, reopening done of the IntelliJ IDEA. Let me just port, change the port number to 8090. I don't know why all the errors are coming today. <laughs> there might be some problem with the ID or maybe I've done, I'm doing some mistake. Let me in the comment if you can find my problem here. Sometimes you can't debug your own stuff. Uh, Okay, it doesn't look like a problem of the server. Is there something wrong with the code? I'm not sure. We are writing REST controller. We are saying that this is a service. We are returning the products. Mapping is done properly. Uh, the product service. We are returning the products. We have added its service here. Things are looking good. I don't see any problem. Is it the issue with the Lombok library? Let me just get rid of Lombok library. Restart package Lombok does not exist. I'm not even using them. Remove, launch, nup. I'm not sure what is going wrong and things are getting lengthy. So I will just restart the entire system and it will work and let's try to see what was wrong. Okay now, now this is a part which I'm recording later after some time, in fact, few hours. And we know something, right? Whenever something goes wrong, if it is not working, uh, after trying for making some changes, if it's still not working, we, what we do is we restart our system. So I've done the restart and I've also ran it. It was working, so I'm just doing that once more in the video. So I will just relaunch this. Nothing changed, you know, port number is still same. I just restarted my system. There was some issue with the, uh, maybe the system or the IntelliJ, I'm not sure. But now it's working. You can see it says Tomcat started on 8080. Now, how do I test it if it's working or not? So one thing you can do, you can open your browser and go to localhost 8080 and search for products. Okay, still not working because the port number we have changed, it is 8090, enter. And now you can see we got our products. 
so I, I also installed a plugin in my browser, which is Pretty Print. Maybe because of that, I'm getting this option, but you can see we got the products here. I know this doesn't look good because in the real world, we want to see the page, right? Uh, the design, but then we have talked about it. We are not concerned about design here. We are concerned about the data and we got it here. This one way of doing it, we can also get this data on another tool. So whenever you want to test your APIs, basically what we are doing here is we are building APIs, which will be used by mobile application or it will be used for uh, a browser using React application or Angular. And this will send requests to the API, API will send the data. So this one way, another way you can also use is Postman, but how exactly we use Postman, we'll talk about that in the uh, next video, but at this point, uh, we are able to run that on the browser. Just wanted to finish this video with working output. So basically we were able to get the products, right? So if I go back to the browser and if I hit the URL for the products, it will give you the list of products. Of course I can prettify it and you will, you will get in this format. Now basically you got all the thing, which is your server returning to the client. Of course the data. Now basically we are fetching everything, right? And that's what you can see here. What if you want to fetch one? What if you want to add something in this list? Now this is something we are going to do in this video. But before we do that, uh, I want to talk about the other type of uh, API tool which you can use, not just your browser. Because see, when you talk about REST API, and if you want to basically work with data, what we normally do with data is we send data. So you have your client here, and then this client will send data from a client to server, then it will also accept data from server to client. What we are doing here is basically we are sending the data from server to client, right? But we do certain other things as well. We send data from client to server, right? Uh, to store something in, in the database if you want to do that. Uh, Sometimes we want to, so basically we are fetching and we are storing, right? So we got two things, fetch and send or store. Next, what if you want to update? What if you want to delete certain things? Example, the product here, I want to, maybe I want to delete this 103. Maybe I want to update this particular price here. So this thing you can do with the help of some type of request. Now REST API basically uses a protocol called HTTP. We have talked about it before and it has certain methods to work with. So basically your REST API uses a protocol called HTTP, which has certain methods to work with. So if you want to fetch something, we have a get method. If you want to store something on the server, we use post. If you want to update something, we use put. If you want to delete something, we have delete. Apart from this, we have other methods as well, but these are four we normally use. Now, we also use something called a CRUD short, which is for create, read, update, delete. So we can create with the help of post, uh, we can read with the help of get, we can update with the help of put, and we can delete with the help of delete. So these are the methods which is available. So REST uses HTTP, and we are going to use this. Now, by default, when you say, when you pass a URL in the browser, it sends the get request. Now, this is what we have done. But what about post, put, delete? Now, this is not something you can do with your browser, right? So you can't simply use your address bar to change the method name. Now, this is where we have to use certain API tools to do that. One of the tool, we have multiple tools. One of the tool is Postman. So if you know how to use one tool, it is easier to explore the other as well. So here, what we're going to do is we are going to use this particular Postman. Uh, if you want to get this, so let me just talk about this. So this is a postman. These are the logo looks like. So if you search on the Google, uh, I can also get take you to the website. This is the official website of postman. You can get it from here. Uh, it's free. It, they also have a paid version, but we don't want it. We are going for free version here and it works. Okay. Of course, I could have used some advanced recent tool, but that's fine it, if this works. So how exactly we are going to hit the URL? It's very simple. You can say localhost colon in 8090, that's our port number we are using, uh, slash, then you have to say products. Now, if you observe, we have a method called get here, right? Apart from this get, if you expand, there are multiple methods. We have post, put, patch, delete, head options. We are going to use only four. So let's say we have a get request. And when you say, when you click on this send button, it will send the request and you will get the response. So this is a response you got. Apart from response, you also get a status code here, which is 200. Now there are different uh, status code options available uh, in the series of 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. If you have seen one of the most famous uh, code which you get is 404 for resource not found. Uh, so that is a part of this status code. It, it comes under 400 series. 
So if something is wrong with the resources, it will send you 400 cities. If something is wrong with the server, it will go for 500 cities. If everything is going well, it will go in 200 cities. Uh, so that's how we have different cities. And we'll talk about it, these cities in the upcoming videos, but we are getting the status code as well. This is a response time, which is 200. And yeah, and this is the size of data which you're getting back. So basically, this is your data here. Apart from the body, you also get some headers from the server. Uh, this is the header. So the type of data you're getting is JSON. That means you can also ask for the XML data if you want. Uh, but by default, it will send the JSON data. So let me go back to the body and you got the response. If you have more, you will see more. Uh, you can also check this in a text format and this is how it looks like, but we want to see that in JSON format, which looks good. And that's what you got here. Okay, so this is what we have done to get data. But what about you want to, let's say, get one, not all, one. Something like this. I want the products for sure, but let's say I want the product with the ID 102. Can we do that? So we can simply say slash 102. This is how basically you also build your REST uh, APIs, right? So you simply say products, which is a URL for all the products, and slash the ID, which is the which you want to fetch, 102. And when you say send, it should fetch only one record. Now this is not working, and you can see we also got a status code called 404 or 404. Uh, the resource could not be found. We have talked about it. And this is the error which you got. Again, not a good looking error, but that's fine. Uh, it says not found. Let's solve this. I want to return one data. How do we do that? So I want to hit this URL. Now, to achieve that, we have to create one more method which will accept this particular URL. Products will only uh, accept products, not the slash and the number. So what I'm going to do is I will say public. And this time we are not going to return the list of products. We are going to return only one product because we are accessing the uh, unique field, which is product ID. So I'm going to say product, return one product. And instead of saying get products, I will say get product by their ID. So we can just use this name. You can also say product, get product that works. I will say get product by ID. And here I will accept the ID. So whatever ID I'm, I'm sending from there. So I will say prod ID, whichever, whatever you're sending from the client. And based on that ID, I'm going to fetch. So who is responsible to give me that? So I will say service. Hey service, it is your job. So I will say get product by ID. I want this method in the service layer as well. Uh, and then I'm going to pass the ID. Now, unfortunately, we don't have this method ca called get product ID or get product by ID in the service layer. And if you see the service class, let me just close the application properties. We don't need that now. If you go to the service class of product, we only got one method here, right? Which is get products. I want this as well. So I can ask my ID to give me that. So I can just click here and say create method. And we got the method now, but it has to do the actual work, right? Now this is tricky. How will you get this particular data? Now the data is something in the list, right? Which is in this added list. So I can say return. And this has to come from the products. So it's a products.get. Now I'm not sure in which particular method I can get that. I just want the product based on that ID, right? So basically what we can do here is we have multiple ways. We can use normal for loop, enhanced for loop to get the data, or I can use the Java stream API. If you're not sure what stream API is, you can find the link in the description. If it is not there, let it me know in the comments. I will just put that. So what I will do is I will say, Hey, I got the list of products from this products. I want to create a stream because using stream, you can filter the products. So I'll say filter dot, uh, I mean stream dot, and I can apply a filter now filter based on what for any product, which I get from the stream, if the product get product ID, if it is matching with the product ID, okay, the moment we get this and I don't, I, I just, I just want to stop this search once I get this product and I will say find First, because stream has no idea that we, we have a unique uh, product ID. Stream says, okay, I'm, I will filter this, but there might be chance that you will get multiple. So I will say find first to get the first element and then find first dot get. Now this will return you the product. Okay, so this is the logic. Of course, you can also use normal for loop. And if you have that logic with you, put that in comments so that others can see it. And if you're not sure what stream API is, you will get the link in description. Okay, so this implementation is done. Uh, in the controller, I'm asking the service to do that for me. And now I want to check if this is working. Let's restart the application. Okay, it's still working and done. 
Now, where do we test it? So of course I can do that in the browser. So I'll say products slash, I want to mention 103 and we got the error. Okay, still not working, something is wrong. Now what is missing here? Most important thing, we are missing the request mapping. So the request mapping has to be done for the slash products slash for 103, right? We have to do the mapping there. And now after doing the mapping of 103, let's see if this works. And this time I'm going to test that in the Postman. So I will say send the request for 103, send. Okay, it's still not working. It says optional uh, int parameter product is present, but cannot be translated to null due to declare as a primitive type. Okay. So what's the next problem? Okay, first of all, there are two problems, okay? Uh, I wanted to show you that problem, but then I, then I realized I have to first talk about this one. See, the problem here is you are passing, you're, you're writing 103, right? Which is the hard-coded values. Don't you think we are not going to search for 103 always? We might want to search for 102 or 101 or 1010 later. How are you going to change that? So I don't want this to be static. I, I don't want it to be dynamic. So what you can do is you can use a syntax call. You can put a curly brackets here and you can put your variable name or the some text there, which is for ID, not the number. Now what Spring will do is whatever is, is coming in the browser. So which is this, it will convert your 103 or it will store your 103 here, where it will map it. And that has to be mapped here in the prod ID. Apart from this, you have to also use a annotation called path variable because we want to match it now. So you want to match your prod ID with this prod ID. So you have to use this annotation called path variable. Okay, there are a lot of lot, uh, annotations will be coming up. And uh, once you get used to it, you will remember. But since we are accepting the value from the path of the address bar or the address, the annotation name is path variable. And by making those changes, we have solved two problems. And now let's see if this works. With 103, send, it worked. For 102, send, it worked. For 101, it worked. For 105, which is not there, it will give you the usual uh, error. But then this time it's not saying that it's not found. The request has been sent. It's just that uh, the data is not there, right? Uh, you can also solve this. You can handle, this, handle these exceptions uh, by uh, handling it on the server side, but we're not going to do, do that now, okay? So this is what you got. Uh, you can do one more thing if you want. Uh, in the service, when you say get here, you can say find first dot or else you can pass a new product with a dummy value. Let's say one, 100, no item, and the price is zero. So what we'll do is if the item is not found because 105 is not there in this, right? So at this point you can return with uh, no item. So now if I restart the app, there's one way, of, one way of handling it, not the best way, but one way. Now if you send request for this, you will see you got 100, no item, zero price. Okay, but again, not a good idea or not the best solution. So what we have done now is we have basically fetching the data with the help of slash with the product ID. Next, maybe I want to send data and store that in this, uh, in that, in this list here. So how do I do that? What I want to do is I want to create a method which will add the product. So basically we have to send this product from the client to server. So I'm doing that in the service now. So I'm going in the reverse order. Uh, for the get, we have we went from client to controller, controller to service. This time we are coding from service. So I want to basically first of all accept the product, and I will say prod here, and I want to save this product in the list. The list name is products dot. I want to say add, and I want to add. Let's say I mean I want, I want to add this product. Okay, so this is done. Uh, now we have to make the changes in the controller. So in the controller as well, I will create a method which will return nothing uh, and we can say add product which will accept the product from the client and this is beauty right because on from the si client side you are going to send json on the server side it will be getting converted automatically in the object format in fact if you observe when you are sending the list of products or even a single product you are sending the object format right and what you are getting on the client side is json who is doing that someone is converting the data from Java object to JSON from JSON to Java object. And that's where you got a library here. So when you add a Spring Web, you by default get one of the library called Jackson. So if you expand this, 
there's a Jackson library here. Now this Jackson library is responsible to convert your object into JSON from JSON to object. So it does that for you. So I will say product prod and we can simply use the service layer service dot add and pass it. So you, if you observe, we are not doing anything in the controller, right? Controller job is just to accept the request. Uh, if you want to do certain things, ask your service layer to do that. You don't do it, right? So this is fun, but we have to do the mapping as well. So I will say request, uh, request mapping and this time we'll do it for the product. So we're not saying products, we are saying product or we can also say products, that's fine. Sending a request for the products, right? But here's the problem. If you see this products and this looks same, right? That means for two different methods, we are using the same URL. Will it work? It will not. There will be confusion, right? And that's where you have to, you can use those methods. Remember post get, but we have not used this method, right? This is get request. This is also a get request. We have not mentioned it. It's because by default, the methods are get, get methods. If you want to use something else, we have to mention that. So you can give a comma here and you can mention the method type or uh, you can use some specialized annotation here. So what you can do is instead of using request mapping, you can say get mapping. So here also instead of saying request mapping, you say get mapping. And for the post, instead of saying request mapping, we are going to use post mapping. Now these two mappings are different is because of their methods. The URL looks same, this one and this one, but the methods are different, right? So the controller and sub is done. Now let's try to work with the client side. See, for the post request, we can't simply use the address bar. You can create a React application using which you can send this data. Otherwise, you can also create a form. But again, you have to do that in the JavaScript. You have to do some code to achieve that. But we're not, not going to do that. We are going to simply use Postman. So after making these changes, I'm going to restart the application. And I, I think it might fail because of the way you have defined the list. Let me just check that later. Uh, let's go back to the Postman. And now instead of sending a get request, we have to send a post request. What is the URL? The same URL, the products, right? We're not changing the URL between the get products and uh, add product. We're just changing the method here. Uh, this is a response. We, we're not supposed to touch the response. We have to touch the uh, URL. I will click on send and you can see we got an error. Unsupported operation. Uh, okay, it's, it's with the list, right? So if this is the error I'm talking about. But uh, okay, we'll talk about this error later. But one more thing, we are not sending any data, right? So basically we have to send the data as well in the body here, okay? Now, how do you send data? It's very simple. You click on the raw here and select uh, JSON because you're sending JSON data and you can enter your JSON data here. But if you're not good with JSON, that's fine. What you can do is let's send the request for 101. Uh, so this is a history. You can just get your old URL and you can hit that. So we got this, I will just copy this and uh, go back here for this for the post request go to body raw and json put your data here and update it so this is 104 i want to create a new one let's say um, what i have in my on my table let's say ac remote and the price is let's say 2000 i don't know how, how much, what's the cost of uh, ac remote so let's say we have 2000 and now we just have to send it Again, we got the same problem. So we are sending data. There's no problem with the sending data. The problem is, I think, when you create as list, it creates a immutable list. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say new add a list. And I'm going to pass this add a list inside this. So it will make it mutable. It's not able to add the data. So new add a list, that's what I added here. Let's restart the app. And now, hopefully this will work. I will say send. Okay, something worked. We have not gotten a response because the, in the controller we are using void, right? It's not returning the data. But you got status. It says 200. How do I verify this? That's tricky, right? The way you can verify that is by sending a request for the get. Let's get all the products. And, okay, no, it's not working. You can see we got zero, null, and zero. It's not getting added. Uh, what's wrong? Let me just check my controller. I know the error. I got to know the error. But I want to show you that. What I will do is I will just try to print whatever we're accepting on the client on, on the server side. And let's see what you are getting. That will solve the problem. So server is start done. I will send the same request, which we have done before. The body is still intact. I will just send. We got the same response. But if you see the, okay, 
Well, my bad, my bad, my bad. Now, since I thought we are using Lombok, which we are not doing that, I should have added to string method because in Lombok, you get that by default. Now, since I'm using Lombok from a long time, it normally works. So I will say to string and restart. It was printing the address. I don't want the hash code. Uh, let's say send. And this is what you're getting on the server. So that means what you're sending from the client is not actually getting received on the server side. It's because to achieve that, we have to use one annotation called request body. Now, since you are sending a body from the client to the server, you have to use this annotation called request body. Now, this will try to uh, match the data which you are sending and put that in the product, uh, the prod thing here. Okay. I hope this time it will work. I hope. And you learn from it as right? You know now why, why certain things, why we are using certain things the way we are. And now send same response, but on the client side, if you see, or on the console, if you see, you are getting the data, what you're seeing from the, from the client. And now uh, let me send the get request, send, go down, go down, and you can see we got 104. Good, right? The only problem is we are using a list in the code. It's not showing in the, in the database. The moment I restart the application, that you will lose this data. But anyway, the point is, we, it's, it's working. So now we know how to use get, we know how to use post. We also know how to get the data using one. How about put and delete? Uh, let's try to do that in the next video. So till this point, what we have done is, we now we know how to use Postman to work with the APIs. Uh, we have sent the get request and post request. It's fun. So just want to show you the product controller once. So we got three mappings. Uh, get mapping, get mapping, and post mapping. Now it's time to write the code for the update and delete. So what we have done till now is basically we have this products uh, page or the controller, and we are sending a request to get all the products. We are getting that on the client side. It can be a browser or it can be a, a API client like Postman. And then we are also fetching one product details or we are able to add new products. And we have done that in Postman. So if I open my Postman, so this was the request, right? So we have sent the get request we are using which we were getting the uh, products. We have also done with the post request. In the post, basically we are sending data as well. So what we'll do is uh, before we go for the update and delete, let me add this product and then we'll do that. And I can't do this now. So if I send a request, it says the server is not running. So I have to make sure the server is running. So I will just restart the application. And hopefully this time there will not be an issue uh, because I'm recording after a long time. And if you see here, uh, it's running. It's running on port number 8090. If I go back to Postman, first of all, let's say get the products and this time it will show only three because see, we are not storing this data in the database. Every time you restart the application, uh, you will lose your data. So basically we have the hard-coded link list or we have the hard-coded list, which is in the service. This is what we are returning, right? This products. Now I want to add a product. So if I click on the post, which is having this data, which is 104. And when I click on send, you can see we got 200, okay. But again, if I say get, it should be having four records and we have it. So now uh, let's try to update something. Let's say I want to update the price for the sure mic. I don't want the price to be 10,000. Let's say, let, let's make it 12,000. How do I do that? See, for the update, what we have to do is we have to change the type of the request. First of all, let me just have this data with me. I will just copy this. And next, I will change the type of method. So instead of saying get and post, we'll go for put. So put is used for the update. And I will go to the body and I want to say, I want to change this data. So this is the new data which I, which I have. Okay, so how do I make it work? If I click on send now, it will not work because we don't have any method which is accepting a put request. So you can see it says method not allowed. So how do we solve this? It is actually simple. What we can do is let's go back to the controller and here let's create a method for the put. So I will say public void, I don't want anything written or maybe we can simply return the data or we can avoid it. So I will say void, void, void. Okay, that was not intentional, but anyway. So I will say update uh, product and here, so when you say update, basically you are sending the data as well, right? So we have to accept the data in the product prod. It can be named, doesn't matter. And I want to use the request body annotation. We have used it for the post as well. 
Uh, this, this is responsible to get data in the request and send that in this reference. So here, what we can do is we can say, hey service, uh, I got this request and I want you to update the product. Okay, so I'm doing that and I will simply say prod here and that's done. But the thing is, we don't have this method in the service. So what I can do is I can just click here and say create a method update product and we got it this. The tricky part when it comes to doing this manually with the help of this list, it's tricky. See, in the normal world, we store this data in database. Now, because of a module called Spring Data JPA, it becomes very easy. So we'll see what exactly Spring Data JPA is in some time uh, in the upcoming videos, but here we have to do some manual work. But uh, trust me, once we start with Spring Data JPA, we just have to change one line and it will work. Okay, but then here, uh, I'm not sure about the code. Let's try. So I will say products dot, uh, I don't want to add now, I just want to update. So do we have a method which will update this? Unfortunately, we don't have it. So we have to go in a manual process. So if I want to update a particular list, I will say get, can I set the value to, yeah. So basically this is what we want to do. We want to set the product on a particular ID, but I don't know the ID where to set this. Right? That's a tricky part. So the way you can get the ID is this. So you can run the loop. Maybe I'll just, I can use a normal loop here. I can just run the loop here from int zero to i less than products dot size i plus plus. I just want to get the ID, right? Or the index. So I will say int index. I want the index. Index will be originally zero. Um, but this is a problem here, right? So, okay, we'll talk about the problem in some time. Basically, I want to iterate and if I want to check if the products dot get i dot get product id is equal to prod dot get product id. If this is matching, I will set index to that particular i value, right? Since for only has one thing, we can just remove the curly brackets. And I got the index and the product. So basically what we have done is we are setting so when you say set, it will replace. Basically, we are changing the data or the object with the new object which we got here. So we have we are writing such a, such a, such a lengthy, lengthy code, right? If you have a better solution, let me in the comments. This is not the best solution. But once you start with data JPA, this will become easy, okay? Uh, I know I'm creating suspense here, but you will see that later. And let me know if you have a better, better solution to update the product list. Okay, will this work? Let's try. First of all, I want to map it also. So I will say put mapping and here, I will accept the request for products, the same uh, list or the same URL, but then with a different uh, method. And once we have done that, I will just refresh this. The problem is once, once I restart the application, we are losing that fourth uh, object because again, we have to add. So let's say we only have three records. And now if I go back to my postman, let's send the get request first of all and see what are the data we have. So you can see we have this data and I want to change the, let's say this time, let's let's change the second one. Okay, and let's change the price for this. And for this, I'll be sending a put request. You can see we have a put request for the same URL and the body, I want to change it with this. But then the, instead of saying Canon camera, I will say Canon only. Let's remove the camera and say send. Okay, it says unsupported media type. Okay, if I check the data, okay, let's debug this. So what I will do is I will just try to print something here and I just want to check if this is getting called. Not sure what is going wrong and click on send. Okay, same error, but is it printing that? No, it's not even coming inside this. So you can see it is not printing, I'm um, here. That means the update method itself is not getting called. Oh, I think I got the problem. So I'm sending text, I should send JSON. Maybe that was the issue. Oh, such a simple problem. So I was thinking about something else, not looked at JSON here, it was text. And now we have solved it. So you can see we got an update says 200. And now after making the changes, I will say get products and boom. Can you see that in the second data, we only got Canon now, we don't have Canon camera. So this is working, so put we have done. The next step is to do delete. So now how delete will work. So basically for delete, we have to send a delete request and okay, question arise how we are going to delete this. So we'll say product slash, and then we'll give an ID. So instead of sending the object to delete, we can send the ID, or product ID. So maybe 101, 102, 103. Let's say I want to work with 102 and I want to de delete this. So when I click on send, it should delete that particular object or the product. 
from the from the products. Okay, so now it says method not allowed. That means we have not done the mapping yet. So let's do the mapping. So here I will just create a method. So public void, or uh, maybe if you want to return something, you can do that. Or uh, you can return the status. But at this point, I'm just trying to keep it simple. So I will say delete uh, product. And here, instead of accepting an object, we have to accept the value. Uh, the same thing we have done here, right? So we are accepting a particular value and we can do that with the help of path variable. So let's do that here. So here I can say, I want to store that in a value called product ID, but we have to use an annotation called path variable to accept the value. And then the mapping should be, okay, what do you think? What should be the mapping? The mapping is delete mapping. Uh, we have to specify the URL, which is products slash, and then we have to pass the number, right? So we have to accept that with the help of this curly brackets, and we have done that. You just have to make sure that this name is similar to this. Otherwise, you have to mention in the bracket what new name you are using. Uh, since it is same, we don't have to do, do that. Okay, next, how do I delete it? I don't want to delete that from a controller. Controller will send, send a request to the service. Service will say, okay, it's my job to delete, but I don't have this method. So we'll create that method. So I will say uh, delete product, accept the product ID and delete it. But unfortunately, we don't have this method in the service. So I will click here and say create a method in service. Now, how do you delete? So we got the product ID, but we are not sure the index number because if you want to delete from the list, which is products dot, if you say delete or if you say, okay, what's the method for deleting? Remove. So we can say remove and we have to pass the index number. Okay, but I don't have the index number. So how do we get the index number? We can use the same logic. Or maybe we can create a common method where you can pass the product, it will give you the ID, right? Or I can just use the same code multiple times. Not a good idea, okay? This is not good. I'm repeating the code. So basically, uh, I'm not following the dry principle if I'm, if I'm correct. Do not repeat yourself, I'm repeating myself. But you got the point, right? So you can basically create a method which will accept the object or the ID and it will return something. But in this case, I'm not getting the object, I'm getting the ID. So first we have to get the ID. So from this product ID, I just have to match with this. So instead of saying this, I have to say product ID. And here I can pass the index, okay? So what I'm doing is I got the product ID. I'm running a loop to check if the product ID is matching with any of the product ID. If it is matching, then remove the index. See, one of the problem I was talking about here as well is what if the ID which you are passing is not found? In that case, what it, you know what it will do? It will delete, delete the first element. Uh, technically, you should return by saying that the item not found. But at this point, I just want to keep it simple. And whatever ID I'm mentioning, I'm expecting this should, it, it is there, uh, so it will work. But again, not a good code, not a perfect code. But here we are not, we are not here to work with the logic. We are here to understand how Spring Boot works, how Spring MVC works, how the layer works. Right, logic is not that important at this point, just to keep it simple. But you got the point, I'm showing you the problems as well, you can solve it. And if you have done that, uh, let me know in the comments what solution you have used. Okay, so this looks good. Uh, I'm not sure if this works, and that's how the development life is, right? You're not sure what code will work and what will not work. So you run it and see it. So let me go to my postman. First of all, let's get all the products. You can see we got three products. And now I will send a delete request, send, no problem, we got the status code as 200. And now, let's send the get request once again to see how many data we have. We only have two. Now you can see 102 is gone. So that's how basically we achieve the cloud operations. And that's what we have done, right? So we have done with the get request initially. We have talked about the post as well. Now we have done with the put and delete. So that's how we achieve with the cloud operation using Spring Boot. Now, in this video, we'll focus on Spring Data JPA. So why do we need it? See, let's go back to the project which we have, which we are doing. And we have done a lot of things here. And just to reiterate, basically we have, uh, we are building this, app, this application, this is a general architecture, where you have a client. In this case, we are using a client as Postman. So that's our client, right? Now, we can either use a mobile application to interact with the server, we can either use a client like your uh, React application, or we can use a API tool called Postman or any other tool, using which you can send data to the server and you can get the response, and we have done that, right? The request goes to the front controller, then from that it goes to the controllers, and we do have our controller ready. So if you see, we have a product controller which has multiple mapping happening, and then this controller, if you want to do some work, any logical work, that will be forwarded, the request will go to the service. Now it is the job of a service 
to process any data or if you want to calculate something, if you want to do some processing, it, everything will be done in the service layer. And service layer is expert in this thing. So when I say expert, basically you have to code it, right? So that's the job of a service layer. And then what if you want to work with database? Now at this point, we have not worked with database. You can see the data which we have, we have basically hard coded it in the service layer. Not a good idea, don't do that. We want to store this data in the database, right? So of course we have to use some database. It can be uh, H2, it can be Postgres, it can be MySQL, your choice, doesn't matter. We can even switch this DBMS uh, when we want to do that. But let's say I want to work with H2 here, right? So when I have all these layers, I mean, when I, when I have a service layer, controller layer, they're doing their job. And now I want to talk to the database. Now that's where we have to work with the repository layer. This R here is your repository layer. Now, the job of repository is to connect with the data database, okay? So let's say if a client says, hey, you know, I want all the products. So request goes to the controller. Controller says, okay, I want all the products. It will ask this service. Now, till this point, we are hard coding it, right? But now what I want is I want this data to be coming from database. And to do that, we have to do the coding in the repository layer. So this is where we have to do all the coding. Now, if you go back to the old days, the way you work with the repository layer is this. Basically, we have to use something called JDBC, which stands for Java Database Connectivity. Now, using this JDBC, we can basically connect the Java code with the help of database, with the, with the database, right? And to do that, we have to write seven steps. Now, it goes in multiple ways. Basically, you have to uh, load the driver. We have to connect to the database or DBMS, then you have to basically uh, create a query because when you talk about DBMS, it, uh, we're talking about relational data databases here. We have to use something called SQL. So we have to create the query, we have to execute the query, then it will give you some results which you have to process and then that's how you basically work, right? You have to follow seven steps. And all this code, I know we have to write lengthy code. This will be done in the repository layer. So basically this is where you have to do all those things. Now things got a bit simpler with the help of uh, Spring JDBC. Now there's something called Spring JDBC inside Spring Framework. You can use this and it will help you to uh, reduce the number of lines you have. It will make it more standard to reduce the bugs. And it's good. So instead of using normal JDBC, we can use Spring JDBC. It will help you with the uh, JDBC template. It's good. But what if you want to make it more easy? See, ultimately, if you want to just send data from your uh, service layer to database layer, because what we are doing in this application is just mostly CRUD, right? So if you just want to use CRUD, which is create, read, update, delete, uh, we can use some easy way to do that. And that something can be done with ORM. So there's a concept of ORM, which stands for object relational mapping, okay? So what we are doing is we have objects. So in the Java world, everything is object, right? So if you talk about a laptop, if you talk about anything, anything you want to represent, even humans in the Java world are objects. Bad thing, but yeah. So everything in the Java world is object because it's an object oriented programming. So if I want to represent this remote, that's a object. If I want to represent maybe uh, this bottle, that's an object, right? Everything is an object. And the way you create object is with the help of class. So first thing you do is you create a class, which is a blueprint. And then from that class, you create the object, if that makes sense. Now this object will have two things. The object will have the data. Uh, so the object, will have the data and the object will have the behavior with the help of methods. So in this case, we don't want to talk about methods. Let's focus only on the data. Now, when you say data, what data we have? So basically we have uh, example, let's talk, let's talk about this product here. Now, if you go back to any particular product, which we have it here, a product will have the product ID, a product will have a product name, it will have the price, right? This is the data I'm talking about. So every object will have a data. So in this case, we got uh, product ID, we got product name, and we got price, right? So we got these three things. This is the data I'm talking about. This is the Java world. In the database world, what we do is we have a table, right? We have a table structure. Now this table will have a name, so table name. Uh, then this table will have the number of columns and they will have a column names, right? And then they have data as well. So each data will be one row. So this is the RDBMS world. This is the object world. Now what we want to do is we want to basically connect them. We want to map them. That is object. So this is object. These are called relations 
and we have to basically map them. And if you can do that, that's ORM. Now, how do we map it? It's very, very simple, right? When we talk about object, object has data, as I mentioned before. So just an example, the object will have data. So example, we got uh, the ID, I will say PID, and the, the ID we have is 101. Then let's say we have a name for the product, I will say P name, which is iPhone in this case. And then we got a price, and the price is 50,000. So if you can see this data is stored in that particular object, right? Here is the object. I want to store this data in the table. Of course, you can write the queries. Uh, if you are familiar with SQL, uh, we have something called insert query. So you say insert into product table where, uh, not where, but values are this 101, iPhone, 5000, you can do that. But what if you don't want to write the queries? I mean, think about this. You just have to learn Java. You don't need to learn any other, other language. I'm, I'm talking about SQL here. So can we do that? So yes, that's where we can use ORM, who simply says, hey, you know, give me the object. It's my responsibility to store that in database. So it will basically convert your, or not convert, but translate your object into SQL query. And then you can save that in database. So your object data here becomes one row. So 101 goes here, the P name, iPhone goes here and your price goes here. So that's your one row. If you have multiple objects, you will get multiple rows. But the question still remains, who is responsible to create the table? Who is responsible to specify the number of columns? Who is responsible to name the columns? Are we going to do it? What if I say you don't have to do it? Someone else will take care of it. And who is that someone else? Of course, the ORM tool. So basically we have to use some tool to make it work. Now that tool, is it a magician to know everything? See, the thing is the table name can be, we can get the table name from the class name, right? We have a class name product. So we, if you can see, we do have a class called product, right? So we can get the class name as your table name. What about the columns? Each variable becomes a column. We got the column as product ID. We got the column as product name. We got the column as price. So the whatever uh, variables you have, you make them the, the column names. And what about the rows? Each object is one row. So if you have 10 objects of 10 different products, you will get 10 rows. That's how basically you do the mapping. And who is responsible to do all those things for you is the ORM tool. Examples, we got uh, Hibernate is a very famous one. Uh, we got Eclipse Link. Uh, we also got MyBetis. MyBetis is not fully ORM, but yeah, you can use it. Uh, but the most famous one is Hibernate. It's full-fledged. Uh, ORM tool and it, you will find everything there. So this is a good one, good tool to use. So we got Hibernate. But we, if you see the title of the video, it talks about JPA, not Hibernate, right? So why? See, the thing is Hibernate is a good tool, but let's say in future, you want to move from Hibernate to some other tool. You basically have to do a lot of changes to your code. It's because all these tools don't follow the same standard, or maybe they are, but how they are following the same standard. So what we got is we got something called JPA, which stands for Java Persistence API. So JPA are just standards and Hibernate basically implements those standards. Eclipse Links basically implements those standards, right? So all the most of the ORM tools implement JPA standards. So in future, if you want to move from Hibernate to Eclipse Link, it will be easier. Imagine if you do, if you know how to drive one car, it is easy to drive other cars because they follow the same standards. Right? That's why we have something called JPA. Now in the world of Spring, now Spring since it's a big project, it's got a lot of modules inside it. They got a special tool or special module called Spring Data. Now when you talk about Spring Data, it deals with data, but we want to specifically mention, I want to use JPA. So the module name becomes Spring Data JPA. And when we use it, the storing of the data in the database becomes very, very easy. Okay, you will see that in the upcoming videos. But I just wanted to give you the walkthrough, what are we going to do and why JPA is so important. So with the help of Spring Data JPA, we can store this data which we are doing in this service layer in the database. Which, DB, which database we are going to use? We are going to use H2, which is uh, in-memory database, easy to set up, easy to use. And for learning purposes, it's a good tool. So we are going to use H2 and we are going to use Spring Data JPA to store this data in the database and to fetch data. It will be fun and easy to work with. So now let's implement Spring Data JPA in this project. So the ultimate aim is to basically store this data in the database and also fetch from it. Now, if you can see, we do have a controller for all the different uh, requests. We got get, 
post, put and delete. Basically, uh, the request goes to service and then from service, we have done, uh, basically we have done the hard coding of the values and that's what we are getting, right? Now we want to work with database. So what are the things we need? The first thing we need is a database. So basically, we, if you see, we have talked about different layers. We want to work with database. So we have to choose a database now and we are going for H2, as I mentioned before. Uh, next, to connect database with our Spring application, we need uh, the connectors as well. But once you get... Uh, so yeah, we need a connector as well. So we'll get that. So we need a connector between these two. Uh, so that's that is basically your H2 driver. So we need this. Also, uh, we have to create a layer, repository layer, which will make it work. So again, let's try to do that in this video or we'll divide it into two parts. Let's see how it goes. So the first thing is you need to get H2 and the driver. Also, the Spring Data JPA capability. Now, how you are going to add that? See, if you want to add a basic feature in your project or uh, any external libraries, you have to do that with the help of pom.xml file. So if you open this, what we got till now is we got uh, web, and that's it, that's the main thing we have. Of course, we have DevTool as well, but that is optional. Apart from this web, we need to get the data JPA and H2. Now, when you create this project for the first time, you know, if you remember how we get created this project, so I will open the Chrome and we'll go to start.spring.io. Uh, remember when we created this project, we have, to we have to specify some values here, and then we have to add a dependency. If you don't do that, let's see what dependency you get by default. So I will click on explore and I will increase the size a bit. So this is, okay, this is Gradle. I want the Maven, so I will say explore. Okay, now you can see by default, you only get the Spring Boot Starter, not even web. So for that, you have to add web. So what you do is you go to add dependency and you say Spring Web, that's the first thing you add. And once you add Spring Web, you will get Spring Starter Web. So you get this. But what if you want to work with JPA? In that case, you click here and search for JPA. So you get the option of Spring Data JPA. You can click on this. And now you got two. So I will click on Explore. And if you go down, uh, yeah, so we got Spring Data JPA. This or something we need. Apart from this, I also need H2. So we got H2 Database Driver. Click on this and it will give you this driver. If you click on Explore, uh, not just driver, it will also give you a runtime. So basically it will give you the H2 database. See, H2 is in my database, right? So if you work with some other databases, let's say uh, Postgres, MySQL, you need to basically install them on your machine, then do some configuration. It's a good thing because in the real life project, we do that. But since we are into learning phase, H2 works for us. It's an in-memory database and you don't have to do a lot of setup. You just add the dependency and your work is done. It will give you some default settings. Just use it and make it work. Okay. So we don't have these things in our project, right? So one thing you can do, you can again go to start.spring.io and copy this dependency. So you can copy this and you can copy this. Uh, that's one way. Or instead of going for start.spring.io, we can search for Maven repository and here you can search for it. So I'm searching for Spring Data JPA. I will click on this. That's the first one we got. And then we have to choose a version. So which version to choose here? Now you have to choose a version which you are already using in your project for web. So I will go back to my project. And in fact, you don't have to mention the version because we have mentioned the version here as a parent. So you can, it will simply use this. So you can mention the uh, driver or you can mention the dependency without the version. So I can pick up uh, 3.2.6 and copy this. Okay, looks like this is not the one we are looking for. Okay, that's that's one of the configuration we have. Uh, if you see, we have two options, Spring Data JPA and Spring Boot Starter JPA. Now, since we are working with Spring Boot project, we have to use this, not that one. And again, I will select 3.2.6. Uh, yeah, this looks good. So I was looking for this boot uh, word. Uh, this is important, so I will just copy this. Go back to the project and paste it here. And of course, I can get rid of this particular version number and reload the Maven changes. Okay, this is done. The next thing you need is the H2. So I will just go back here and you have to get for H2. Uh, again, the same website. I will search for H2, click here. And which version? So you can see there are a lot of vulnerabilities. You can go with this one. Or maybe latest one also looks good. I will click on this. Uh, I just need to verify if I'm getting the right one. So yeah, so just com.h2 database, h2 artifact. Okay, I'll get this and paste it here. So these are the two things we need. So I will just remove this. And 
Now, by doing this, of course, you have to re reload the Maven changes. By doing this, you are basically making sure that in your project now you have data JPA and also you got H2. How do you verify this? What I will do is I will start the project to see if certain things are working out. Otherwise, we have to make some changes. Okay, so we got the error. It says uh, failed because we have not specified the URL. See, whenever you add any driver, we have to make sure, not just driver, whenever you add Spring Data JPA, basically it will ask you for the URL for the uh, database. See, whenever you connect with database, we have to specify certain things. Uh, it's not just for H2, any DBMS. You have to mention the JDBC steps where you have to specify the connection URL. Uh, so that's something it is. it says it is missing. So where should we put the URL? So that should be done in the application properties. So let's go down. So in order to do that, you have to say spring.datasource.url and you can mention the URL here. So what's the URL? So it is JDBC colon, then you have to mention the database name, if it is MySQL, SMySQL, Postgres, Postgres, but here we are saying H2. Then in H2, we have to mention it is an in-memory database, mem. Uh, we can also get a full storage. It is also option, permanent storage option is there, but you're going for in-memory, so we'll say mem. And then whatever database name is, so I will say testdb, or maybe I can say telisco. That's our choice. We can mention whatever database name we have. So that's done, right? Now by doing this, let's start the application because that's what it, is, it was looking for. And uh, I hope it will work. Okay, we got another error. It's not able to find the driver. Uh, should I remove this version? I'll remove the version. Let's also mention the driver name. I thought it will pick up. Let's try it. So we'll say spring dot data source dot driver class name. So then things you have to mention for the properties. So it's org dot h2 dot driver. I hope this will work now. So basically we do this in the JDBC as well. So you have to mention uh, the URL, you have to mention the driver name, also username, password, but I want to go for default one. If it is not accepting, we'll type it. We don't have a choice. So let's restart the application. So let's learn from the errors. Okay, more errors. Okay, looks like I made a mistake while mentioning the driver name. Okay, looks like it's not org. It should be, okay, just com dot It is there. Cannot load driver. Let me check the dependency once. Okay, looks like I've got it. It should be runtime. Because if you see, when we were trying to do this, it says runtime. In the dependency, I got it test. So I forgot to change the, the scope. Let's see if this works now after making those changes. Uh, so basically you have to make sure that your H2 is there available in the runtime. Okay, looks like there's no error. Yeah, there's no error and the Tomcat is running. So yeah, so sometimes it's good to get errors. You learn certain things there. And now what we have is we have the H2 database ready. We don't have data in there yet, but the database is there. But how do I access that database? So since we, we are not installed in the system, one way to access it is using the URL. So I'll say localhost colon 8090 uh, because that's the port number we are using slash H2 console. So to access the database, we have to say H2 console, enter. It will give you this page and you can see there are certain things which are mentioned here. So we have the driver name, which is this. The URL, we have the database name as the disco, so I will use that. Uh, the username is by default SA. I have not specified that in the properties. The password is blank. Test connection, it says successful. I will click on connect and that's our database. Nothing is there because we have not done anything yet. But at least we have the JPA uh, connected and we got H2 connected. And now it's time to create that layer, the repository layer. So now we have our H2 ready. You can see we have the, we have the entire console here. But if you see, we don't have the tables which we want. So it got some tables, but not something which we want. So if you expand this, nothing is there for us. What table I'm talking about? If you remember the theory, we have talked about the table because we have a class called product and I want a table which will have this data. So the table name should be product, uh, the column should be the variables of the product and the data will be of course rows. So how do I get that? How do we create this table? And for this, we have to do some changes in the code. The first thing you will do is, we'll make the changes in the, uh, which basically will create a repository layer. See, service is not responsible to work with data. It is responsibility of the repository. So what I will do is I will create another package here where you will have all the repositories. So I will just right click here and say new 
a package and we'll call this as repository or you can also say repo that works now in this package you will have all your classes interfaces for the repository now the question arises: what kind of file we are going to create is it a class or the interface see logically it should be class right because we have to write a lot of code uh, to work with database for filing the query and having different methods for different actions but what if i say we can do that with the help of interface and you'll be saying okay we have talked about that in the inter in the theory uh, spring data jpa will help you in that uh, definitions and yes so what you can do is uh, you can simply create the interface here i will say class but we'll select interface here and we'll name this as product repo okay now simple interface nothing fancy now in this interface we are going to define the methods oh we can't define methods in the interface we can using default but we have this interface and we can declare methods but ultimately it has to be defined somewhere but jpa will take it of it or spring data jpa will take it of it we don't have to worry about those definitions but what should be the method names let's say i'm not even mentioning the method names let's keep it blank but one thing i will do i will just say at repository here remember when we talked about uh, controller we have on top of that we have at controller on service we have at service repository layer will have at repository it gives some extra features to it but since i want spring data jpa to take care of everything what i will do is i will extend a class called jpa repository in which you will mention the primary key so basically you have to mention two things uh, first the class name which we are working with and second the primary key type which is the integer so just these two things and our job is done okay what are the methods let's skip it let's say if you don't enter it let's see what happens now that's one thing we have done with the repository next in the service i'm going to use this repository so i will say come back here and we got the product repo let's create the repo as a reference variable and let's say auto wired so that will get this object first of all we don't have a class right so spring is responsible to create the object of this class or this interface so basically someone has to create the class of it and then spring will create the object of it and who is that someone who will create a class for it it is your uh, spring data jpa i will go back here and now since i don't want this i will just comment this part we don't we, we don't need those things and when you say get products who is responsible to give you the products let's see i will say repo dot the moment i say dot can you see that we have so many methods now mind you we are using that repo variable which is the type of uh, product repo and in this interface we don't have any method since still when you say dot it is giving you a lot of options question arises from where you're getting all, all these methods if you go back to repo we are extending with jpa repository now this particular interface has all the methods which are which we are getting there right uh, if not in this if you see we have also it also extends least uh, cred repository this has some more methods uh, if you go to cred repository this has some more methods if you go to repository this has nothing but yeah but you got the point right so we we are getting all those methods because of this jpa repository which i have mentioned here so let's go back here and let's see which method will help us so find all uh, looks like a method which will give the list of products and that's what we want if you can see i will say find all okay next uh, we need to replace this and as i mentioned before right we don't need to write this all this lengthy code once we start using jpa uh, we want a product based on a uh, id so i will say repo dot find uh, all okay not all i want one so i will say find by id and pass the id here but it is giving you an error it is it it returns an optional so i will say or else return me a blank object that works for me next we have to add a product so of course we don't have that now so again i will use the repo to add the product now which method we are going to use so if you can see if you scroll down some method should be there which looks good yeah save looks good right so i will use save and pass the object no errors we are happy update lengthy code right let's remove everything repo dot now the thing is we don't have any method called update if you see if i click on if you type i update there is nothing the only method you can use is save for both for saving as well as updating we use save so what this will do is it will check if the data is there if the data is there it will update if it is not there it will create as simple as that delete no lengthy code just remove this and we can say repo dot delete delete by id because we have to pass an id so i'll say prod id 
and our job is done. It's so simple, right? Look at the code here in the service. We have, we don't have any hard-coded values. Everything is coming from the database. Looks good. Okay, uh, is it done yet? Let's try to run this and let's see what errors you get. Run this and, okay, what do you think? We will get the error or not? Oh, we got the error. Let's see what the error is. It says, not a managed type. Which one? Product, is it? If you go back to the product, this is a component, but still it says not managed. Why? Because if you see, the error is because of the Hibernate. See, uh, under, under the hood, it is implemented with the help of Hibernate, it, it follows GJPA standards. So if you want to have a class of which you want to create a table, we have to use one more annotation called entity. Okay, so this is the annotation we have to use. Now it should be happy with it, oh, but I think we'll get another error. Let's see, and we got it. This time it says, okay, not the same error. You can see it says entity product, looks good, has no identifier. Oh, that's weird. See, the problem is every table need to have a primary key. In this case, we know it should be product ID, but we have not specified it. So you have to mention this as ID. So you have to mention, hey, this is a primary key. Okay, so prod is a primary key, prod ID. Let's rerun this. I hope there's no problem. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, no problem. If you scroll here, Tomcat started. To test it, I will just refresh this and say connect once again. Okay, but if this time if you see, we got a product table. This is what we want, right? Let's run the query. So I will say select uh, star from product. And as of now, it is empty. We want to add some data. How will we do that? Of course, you can run the insert query here, or we can go back to our postman. Remember postman? Yeah, it's here. So first of all, let's get all the products and let's see if what we get. So we got empty because we don't have any products and table, it is empty. Let's add some data. So I will say post. Uh, we do have a body here, which is this. I will say, I will start with 101 now. Send, okay, it says, okay, there should be one product now. How do we test it? Let's go back to console, run. Hey, it's working, we got database connectivity. It is getting stored in database. Let's store one more. I will say two, this time I will store uh, a water bottle. And let's say 200, click on send, it works. Let's try to fetch all the data and this data is coming from database, as you can see. Let's also verify the database and it's working. But hold on, we have not implemented any of these methods. Where is the query? How are you getting all these queries? If you can see, this is empty and we have not even created a class and that's the magic of Spring Data JPA, uh, which is creating a class for you behind the scene. But maybe you want to see the queries here. We are getting the products, but what queries it is firing behind the scene? If you want to know that, you can add one more property in the application properties. So we can say spring dot data source dot show SQL equal to true. I hope this is a property name if I'm not wrong. Let's relaunch it. The problem is every time you relaunch, you will lose the data because you're using in memory database. Let's see, I will say get, we have not got any data and we have not even got the query. Maybe the property name is different. Mm. Is it spring.jpa.showsql? Okay, yeah, it is showsql. If you can see, uh, it is actually creating a table for us, right? So this is the query I'm talking about. So for every query now, so even if you say, uh, let's say if you want to say get all the products and see the query here, it says select query. What if you want to add a product? So I'll click on send, we have added the product and look at the query, it is insert query. So that's how basically it's, it is working behind the scene. We can see the query as well. What if you want to change the username password of your H2? We can do that. So I will say spring dot data source dot username. And let's say the username is Naveen and spring for the passwords. I will say spring dot data source dot password. I will say the password is Telesco. Now after making those changes, just restart just to secure your H2 console. Okay, it started. And if I want to access the H2 console now, if I use a default username password, if I click on test connection, it failed. So we have to use Naveen and Telesco as a password, connect, it worked. So that's how basically we can change the username password and we can do all the setup for H2. So I hope this makes sense. Uh, there are certain more things in, H2, in the Spring Data JPA, maybe if you want to customize these methods, 
Uh, we got default methods, but what if you want to have some customized methods? Uh, let's try to achieve that once we do the project itself. You know, we can do those changes. Now, till this point, we have talked about what is Spring Framework. We have talked about Spring Web, Spring uh, Boot. Now, it's time to focus on the project. Remember, in the first or second video, we have talked about the project which we are going to build. Now, to build this project, of course, we have two sides of it. So if you see this diagram here, or this uh, drawing, kind of. So on the left-hand side, we have this thing, right, which is your client. A client can be React application, a client can also be a postman to test your APIs, or maybe we can, we can use Swag or Swagger. But when we talk about client here, which we are using, we will be building a React application. And of course, I don't want to code the entire stuff. We have a code. Let's understand the code first, uh, what we have already done. So this is actually ready for the first video. This is something we want to build. Of course, right, we want a database. We want to have different layers. And when you want to get something from the database, we have to build all these layers, If you even if you want to store it. Now, of course, we'll do that step by step. But what we have ready is this React. So in this video, let's understand only what the front end should look like and uh, we already have these things and this is how it was looking in the first or second video but now since we want to build the back end as well since we don't have back end now we'll build it but if you run this front end without the back end it will give you some issues i'm already running it but what i will do is i will stop it now and let's redo again so basically this is your front end uh, project which are opening in vs code and if you see we have this this is a simple react application with the help of wait um, and if you open the package.json, these are the things which are needed there. Nothing different in a simple React application, what are things we need? Those things are here. And let's head back to the flow. Now, people who are very new to the world of React, of course, this is not a React session, but just want to give you some intro. Uh, basically, if you want to build a front end, in the earlier days, we used to have, in, with Java, basically, we used to use JSPs or theme leaf or maybe a simple HTML, CSS. But then, Nowadays, what we do is we try to separate these two and we try to connect them with the help of APIs uh, so that the front end can change. It can be uh, for mobile, we can have mobile applications. For browsers, we can use React, Angular, Vue.js. There are multiple options. Uh, maybe in every six months, you get new framework there. And then we also have uh, API clients to test it. So the back end is pure back end. There's no front end code there, right? Now, if you talk about React, why React got so famous is because it focused on the component building. So whenever you talk about any, any application, we can build the application, but then there are a lot of moving parts. If you change one thing, it might affect other, and maybe you are reusing the component, but basically you're not reusing it. Let's say you have something on one page and then the same thing is there on the other page. You have to basically rewrite it. And let's say after, after a few days you want to change it, so you will change in one part and you will, it will not reflect on the other part. So what if you can build components which you can use it anywhere? So it's like building components like Legos and then use it where you want. So that's the basic idea. And this component will have its own layout. They have their own functionality. So you build the components and just use it. And the beautiful thing is, uh, basically, you just build one page. It's not like you're building multiple pages. So we have this thing, right, which is SPA, which is single page application. Basically, what you do is you create one page and you have everything there. Every time you click a button or there, uh, it, the data changes in the same page. So basically, you don't see that the, your page is reloading because you're just changing the data of the page. So uh, the way you can do that is you can build components. So we have this common page, which is index.html. Uh, we also have that here. So if you see, we have index.html. And throughout the website, you will see only this page, which is index.html. And what is there in this page is whatever given by your root. Okay, so we have this root uh, div, and this thing will keep changing. Okay, why we got this? Okay, so my copilot is running. Ignore that. Uh, disable, okay. So I'm dissolving the micropilot completion. Okay, so we got this root. And then the way you can change this data is with the help of main.jsx. Now, JSX is a new thing uh, for normal HTML CSS designers or uh, developers. We got JSX where you can have your own tags. Now, when I say your own tags, uh, it's not like you can have any tag. Basically, you can have tags which you can define and use it. So I'll show you in some time what I'm talking about. So basically, this is a new format. Now, this file is responsible, a JavaScript file, you can say. This file is responsible to load the data, right, in this page. Now what this file is doing, so if you go to main.jsx, it says this basically will be filled 
with the help of app. Now look at this. This is a tag I'm talking about. Now this is not a simple HTML tag. We don't have tag called app. Uh, so basically, these are the custom custom tags which we use. And if you can see, all the React tags starts with capital letters. Capital A here. For React, we got capital R here. But what is this app? Now, if you see here, if you know JavaScript a bit, it says import app from app.jsx. So basically, this file is used. Again, I'm talking in terms of Java developers. We are not into JavaScript. So someone is watching from JavaScript world, they're like, hey, what are you talking about? I'm in a perspective of someone who is new to the world of React and JavaScript. Okay, so I'm going, moving to app.jsx. Now this is where the actual fun happens. Uh, so in the JavaScript world, everything happened with the help of functions, right? So we, have, we got a function here, and the name of the function is app. Now, whenever you want to return a component, your component is something which you return to a page, right? So this is where you are returning it. So this is your component which you're returning. Now in this, basically you just have routes for home page and for add a product. Now if you remember the image or the page which was running, we got different buttons here. One of them is home and one is uh, add product. When you request for the slash page, it, it will return you the home page. When you click on add a product, that's a URL, then you will get add product. But what is this home? Again, for this home, this is the component. So I'm jumping on the component section, a separate component section. And if you click on home, now this is responsible to fill the home page. How it is doing that? See, in the home page, you'll be having different products, right? There, there, there'll be a list of products. And to do that, of course, in the UI, you're not storing data. Data will be coming from the server. Of course, you've got layout, uh, you've got color scheme, everything in the UI, but data is coming from the server. How will you request data? And that's where you got this URL, which is localhost colon ADAD slash API slash product. When you hit this URL, you will get data, and that data, you will basically set it in here. So if you see, when you get that data, we are calling this method called set products. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at this code with you, okay? So ignore that. Yeah, so set products is here. Basically, this is a use state where uh, when you call this method, it will change the value for this products here. And with those products, once you got these products, you will run a loop. So you can say we have, uh, we have a map function basically. So it will iterate between each element and it will basically show that on the page. So what we are showing, we are, okay. So we are showing the name, then we are showing the brand, and with a lot of CSS in between, we are, say, we are showing the price. Now this is what we want to show on the page, and of course you also have a button called Add to Cart. Okay, but then if you run this, so let's run this. We are not talking about Add Product now, because in this video, let's only understand the home page. Now, how do we run this? So once you, you will find the link for this project in the description. So what you do is, to run this, you open this into your VS code or any different ID and go to terminal on the same path. So you can see this is ecom frontend one for the first video. To run this, you will say npm install. You will say npm i. Uh, you can also say install, but i works. I will say enter. So this will basically download the packages which you mentioned in the uh, package.json. And once you have it, you can basically run this. So you can say npm run dev. And of course, all these things are actually mentioned in the package.json. So if you can see uh, in the script, we got dev. So basically, this is the thing we have to use. So npm run dev, enter, and it started. So your front end is working on this particular port number. So I will click on this, and this is what you got. It says something went wrong. You know what went wrong? The backend is not there. Okay, how do we check that? So it's very simple, you can also use this URL, which you have used here, and you can just paste this in the browser, and you can see it says this site cannot be reached, or if you try this in Postman, it will say 404, or the server, server is not there. So we want to make sure that the backend is ready. How will you do that? Of course, it's a very simple thing. You go to your Spring Initializer and create the project. So in this video, we just understood the front end what the code is. And of course, with every new different video, the front end might change. I will let you know if, if I'm using a new front end. And that link, you can use it in the, or you can get it from the description. So now it's time to build the back end for this application. So we got the front end ready and we have talked about it in the last session or in the last video. But now let's build the back end. So I don't want this match message which says something went wrong. Let's make it work. Okay, so when you say backend, how do we do it? It's very simple, we have done this before. We have to create a Spring Boot web project, a new project, because we don't want to make changes in the older one. So I will say Maven project, Java, uh, the version remains same. The group ID is, as usual, com.therisco. The project name, the artifact ID, uh, I will want to make it as ecom project. I will say one, 
uh, okay, let's say Ecom project will make keep making changes in the same project, and uh, the jar packaging, the Java version 21. Now it's time for the dependencies. Now since this is a web Spring web project, I will need a web. I don't want to create a ref repository here the way we have done in one of the video. It's because I want some customization. So I will prefer web. Uh, the next thing is I want database connectivity as well. So I will say JPA is needed. Uh, next, I will need uh, dev tools for the fast reload. And Lombok also, let's try Lombok. Something went wrong last time when we tried it. If it doesn't work, we'll remove it. Uh, and okay, what else we need? Uh, H2, database is also required, right? So I will say H2. Of course you can use a uh, database like Postgres or MySQL, that's your choice. I'm using H2 here, which is lightweight for our use. So we got Spring Web, we got Data JPA, we got DevTool and Lombok and H2, only these five dependencies. With this, I will click on generate, it will give me the project. And you can see we got the project here. So I will just unzip it and open that in IntelliJ IDEA. Okay, so this is the project which we have to open. This is what we have downloaded. And now I'm opening this in IntelliJ IDEA community version. So I will click on open and uh, it's here. Okay, so basically this is your blank project. Of course, nothing is there. And the port number, which is by default port number is 8080. And even before making any changes, I want to check if that port is empty so that I can use it. Uh, so what I will do is I will just open this main file. Nothing changes, right? It's a simple project. Uh, it might not work is because in H2, we have not specified the data, data source. But let's see if without data source, does it work? So running this and, okay, it's running, great. And it's running on port number 8080. This is what I wanted. So we are good. Uh, port number 880 is working and now we can make the changes. Now, what are the changes I want to make? First of all, of course, I want a database. So I will just make sure that I have the properties for database. Uh, so the first thing we have to set is the URL. So I will say spring.datasource.url is equal to JDBC colon, we're using H2 colon mem colon. Uh, then we'll mention the database name. So I will, I will still go with the list database. Uh, next, I want to specify is the driver class name. So I will say spring .data source, And we have done this before. So we can just directly use it. Driver class name, it is org.h2.driver. Perfect. Now, what are, whatever the things happens uh, with the JPA, I want to see the query as well. So I will say spring.jpa.showsql. I'll make this true. Apart from this, uh, there's one more thing, right? So who is responsible to create a table in the database? So basically in the JPA world, the JPA takes care of creating a table. So there are multiple options there. When you say you, JPA should create a table, uh, we have an option of create, which will create every time you run this, or it will update. So if the table is already there, it will simply update it. In the terms of H2, we don't need to set that, but if you are using Postgres or MySQL, which is permanent database, uh, we need to set it to update. So I'm doing it so that if you want to use it for Postgres or MySQL, uh, you can use that. So I will say spring.jpa.hibernate.ddl auto. Let's keep it to update so that it will not create every time you restart the application. So I think we are good. Uh, everything looks good. These are the properties we have to mention. Now, once you have your properties ready, what's the next thing you will do? So of course, now we have to create the controller, the service layer and the repository layer, right? So we'll do that step by step. But there's one important thing, the model. How will you represent your data, which is a product? So basically now we need to represent how your product will look like. So what exactly, when you say we have an e-commerce website, we have multiple products, what are the details we need in a product? Of course, there are multiple properties will be there. One of them is image, but let's not use image now because it's a complex topic. So in the upcoming videos, we'll see how do we work with images as well. But at this point, just to keep it simple, the things which I need is ID. So the first thing is ID, which is also your primary key for the table. Uh, then we'll name a name of a product. So we'll need a name of the product. Uh, I will also need a description for the tape for a particular product, a long description. We, we, do, we don't want to show that on the home page or the first page, but let's say if you see, if you want to see about a particular product, in that case, I want to see the long description. Uh, so that should be here. So these two things will be string. This is also going to be same string. Uh, then uh, I need the brand of the product. Let's say if we talk about a car. So let's say if I if I drive Expresso, which is Suzuki. So that's the brand. Then also the most important thing is price. Every product needs a price there. So this will be integer. So brand will be string. 
but this will make it integer. Then also, uh, we might want to categorize the products, right? Based on, is it a toy? Is it a car? Is it a lab, I mean, electronic device? So in that case, I want a category as well. And on which day it got released? So I don't want to do anything with the release date, but let's say in future, if you want to sort by which product came first and which is the latest one, uh, you can do that with this. Now for this, we are going to use date. Uh, bit tricky here is because by default, the date format will be a uh, US format. We want to use the Indian format, which is DDMMYYY. Uh, so we'll see how do we do that. And also if the product is available, of course, a lot of properties, but you have to just define them once. So availability, uh, which will be Boolean if it is true or false. And the last one is quantity. How much, how many, how much quantity we have that product in our stock, right? So this is something we'll keep as int, category will be string. So these are the properties we'll need. Apart from this, we'll also need image, but at this point, I don't want to put image and we'll put, put a question mark there, but we'll work with image data. So we'll update our product uh, class and we'll add image there as well. But at this point, I want all these properties. So let's create that. So the way you can do that is the first thing you need different packages. So I need a model package. Then uh, let's get all the packages here, just making our project set up properly. We need the controller. Oh, I created a class. So I need a controller package. Then I need the service package. Then I need a repo package. Okay. Uh, again, for repo, you can say it's a DAO, or you can say repo, repository, you can use different names there. Uh, I'm using a repo here. And in the model, basically, I have to create a product. So I will say, in fact, before I do that, I want to make sure one more thing, if I'm getting the output on the page. So what I will do is I will create a simple controller here. So I will create a class, and I will call this as a product controller, simple stuff. And on this controller, I will say this is rest controller and request mapping. By default, every request should be passing from API. Uh, so the URL will be localhost colon 8080 slash API slash whatever you mention in the methods. So now I want a simple method which will greet me. So I will say, I want someone to greet me, right? So I will say greet, return, hello world. Now when this will be called, so whenever there's a request for home, so it's a request mapping. This is for the home request. Okay, this is what I want to return. If this works, then we'll continue, right? Otherwise, if this is not working, then we have to uh, debug what is going wrong. So let's do this step first. So it's running the project, and how do I check it? Of course, I will. I can do that from the uh, Postman, or let's use a browser. So I will hit this URL, but without products. I just want API, enter, and we got hello world. So this is working, right? At least our uh, spinning application returning something. But I don't want hello world. Of course, when I say products, if it is products there, it should return the products, which is not there yet. So I will get the controller later. But what I, what I want to do now is create the model. Let's complete that first. So I'll say class. I want a, what went wrong? Uh, I will say new class product. Now in this product, I want all those properties, right? And I also want to use a long box. So I will be using that. So I'll say private int id private string name. What else we have description? So private string description, private string brand. We also need price, private in price. Then we got categories. So I will say private string category. Uh, then we got release date. So I will say private. In fact, price should not be int. It should be big decimal because the price can be any big amount, right? Uh, so let's be, keep it big decimal. And here we'll say date, uh, release date. We have to import the date. So it's a control space from util. Yes. And big decimal came from math. Okay. Release date. Then what I want. I want available and quantity. So I will say private int quantity. Okay, so so many properties, right? And I don't want to create get us just for this. So I'm, I'm going to use Lombok. So on top of it, I will say data. And I also want all arguments constructor and no arguments constructor. That's it. So this is basically the product which you got. Now, will this work? Of course not. Uh, if you want to get the table, one thing you have to do is you have to create this as entity, because JPA needs entity. 
And on top of ID, we have to say at the rate ID, right? That's your uh, primary key. Cool, looks good, right? But will this work? Uh, of course, you cannot send requests from the client is because the control is not ready. We don't have products controller, uh, but at least I want to see the table in the H2 database. So I'll just refresh this to see if something happens. Okay, there's no error. And if you can see, it is also creating a table. So it says tab uh, create table product and you got available uh, brand, category, description. So it goes in alphabetical order. And that's why if you can see the sequence is not matching, we got first uh, the primary key, which is the ID. Then it starts with this uh, alphabetical one, A, B, C, D, N, P, uh, then quantity, release date, and then primary key, which is the ID. Okay, so uh, these are the things we need. And uh, how do you verify this? It's very simple. You can just go to your console h2 console so you can say localhost 8080 slash h2 console and we have not set the username password so default will be sa and uh, no password click on connect and you can see we got a product table which has all these values of course data is not there but how we are going to load the data let's see that in the next video so basically in this video we just make sure that we have our structure ready for the project which is ready here and uh, the database is empty. We'll add the default data, some data to start with. And yeah, looks good. So now it's time to focus on the controller because now we want to return the products, right? Now, first of all, we don't have products on the table, but let's see what happens when you don't have a data in the table and still even when you try to fetch it. Of course, we'll get blank, but let's do that. So let's go to the product controller. And here we want to create a method which will return you the list of products and the URL would be slash products. We have tried that before, right? So if you go back to your browser and here we are asking for products, it is giving you 404. We don't want this. So I will go back here and let me say create a method which will return the list of products because we don't have one product. We'll be having list of products. So list of products, get all products. Of course, you can have any method name, doesn't matter, but still let's give it proper. And we have to also import this. Okay, let's set the URL. So we are going for the get mapping because we are going for the get method. So get mapping and the URL will be products. So the actual URL will be API slash products. So we are seeing this for the first time in this particular or the last video and this video, but we are using the request mapping on top of the controller. So basically whenever you talk about this controller, this controller follows slash API slash products. Okay, so now let's return the products. Now, but who will do that? Of course, we don't want your controller to talk to your database directly, right? So we need some layers in between. So I want my service layer. So I will have a service object here and I will say, hey, get me all products. But unfortunately, we don't even have this object. We don't have a service object. So let's do that quickly because now we know how do we create those layers, how do, what annotation we use. So I will go back here in the service package. I will say new Java class and this will be product service. And this product service will have an annotation called service. Now, since we have this as a service, I can create a reference here by saying a private product service, and I will say service. Of course, I can use field injection here, which is on top of the uh, variable, or you can use a constructor or you can use setter to do that. I will use field injection, not a good idea, but uh, it looks, it keeps your code smaller. I would encourage you to use uh, this uh, constructor injection. So create a constructor for controller or a setter in the controller and then implement it. Okay, so now uh, we got this auto wired, so I can simply use this, but I don't have this method called get all products in the, in the service. So I will ask my ID, hey, you know, I want this method in the product service. It will say, okay, we'll do that, but give me the code. But again, I don't want service to talk to database and I don't even want to return the hard coded values. So this is where you need to uh, basically create object of the repo. We don't have it. So in the repo, let me create a interface, class or interface. We have talked about this before. So basically we have to get the interface and here we'll say product repo or repository, whatever name you want to give. And we got it. And this will basically extends JPA repository, which will take two, two uh, types. One is a type of 
class you're working with or the type of entity you're working with and next is your primary key the primary key is of type integer so let's stick to it and now let's have the methods in fact we don't need to add methods because we have that from jpa repository right we can simply use those methods in the service but we need to use an annotation called repository again i'm going a bit fast because we have talked about this in the previous sections so let's talk about product service here and now in this let's create the object for product repo i will say repo and on top of this we have to say auto wired okay now once you got your repo i can simply call the methods right so i can say hey repo uh, you will be having some methods to give me all the products so it has it has find all uh, and then this will return you the list of products so i have to say return the list of products so simple right uh, so database says i am done we have a database already service layer says okay i will get it from the repo repo says okay i will get it from the database controller says okay i will get it from service and it will return the products to the user that's what we are expecting right and expectation is not a bad thing so let's try let's try let's see what goes wrong and what goes right if something goes wrong we'll correct it so let's get back to the browser and here let's say refresh it worked okay we got a empty array reason is because we the table the database itself is empty how do we get uh, it solved okay so what we can do is we can add some data in database of course we have multiple ways of doing that one uh, you can basically add the product from the from the page here there should be add button uh, but i can't see that i have this button see here nothing is working but let me just refresh this still not working okay there's something still broken we'll solve this we'll solve this problem uh, but then we want some data when you actually hit this url i want to see that here so that i can use it in my front end in fact i also want to check this in the postman so i will click on send uh, it says not found because i have to hit the api if i click on send it says method not allowed okay we are using post my bad i will say get and we got empty okay so we want to have some data in database how we are going to do that so multiple ways are there as i mentioned you can have a button in your page or you can go to s2 console and from here you can insert some statement but there's one problem you know if you insert the queries from here from your h2 okay i will show you what i will do is i do have the query ready with me okay and this is some random data which i have about cars so we'll just use that query here uh, so again you can see i can i'm adding different cars here again all this data is given by my team so I'm, i have not actually read what they're talking about cars what is their perspective towards car uh, but yeah so we got this we got uh, tata nexon uh, swift creta thar so we have different cars here so i want to add this data so when i click on run of course you will have this data in database but we got an error it says description not found okay so basically we are using uh desc and my team is using description so let me just use that okay so now let's run this and okay it says product available okay there are a lot of changes in the query so we'll say available also there should be issue with uh, the quantity because i'm using quantity and click on run okay still missing id 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 okay it should be auto generated i have not done that so basically uh, it says not null because in the query i'm not assigning the id if you can see i'm as i was assuming that it will be auto generated and for that we have to do something so let's get back to the code and this is how you do development right nothing is straightforward so here i will mention that i want to do auto generation so for that i will use generated value annotation from jpa persistence and here i'll mention my strategy which is control space generated type identity okay so now we have to restart the application so it will reload your s2 basically okay that's done let's get back to this i will also copy this so that i don't have to type it again refresh connect and paste and this time it should work and it worked can you see that it says something updated count 5 i will check that the database okay we have to fire the query to get the data so i will say i will just have it somewhere where should i keep it i'll keep that in sublime okay sublime is messed up with this <laughs> okay uh, not copied properly okay no issue let's let's make the changes later but uh, i want to remove this now i will just keep it copied and i will say select star from uh, product 
And now if I run this, we got the list of uh, cars. But I want these cars on the browser. So I'll go back to the browser, which is I'm already in, refresh, and you can see we got the data now. So this data is actually coming from database. But one thing if you realize, the format of the date is not something I want. I want a simple date format where I will see the day first, then month, and then year. So we want DDMMYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYYY
So what is this? See, the server is running on port number 8080. First of all, let's check if the server is running. So I will just go back here, run, server is running, right? But the server is running on 8080. So if you head back to your diagram here, so the server, which is this, is running on 8080 port number, and the front end, React, is running on 5, uh, okay, what is running on? It's 5173. And they are basically running on two different port numbers. Now what happens is, for the security reasons, uh, it is not allowed to send a request with, a, with, with some other address. Maybe there will be some malicious uh, website which is trying to access the resource. So that's why they say, okay, hold on, uh, you can only access from the same resource. And that's why we are saying it is cause, which is cross origin resource sharing error. So from the, from the same origin, you can access it. Cross, you cannot. And that's what is happening here. So we're getting this error. How do we solve this? Now, of course, uh, there are multiple ways of doing that from the server side, from the client side. Let's only focus on the server side now. So if you want to solve this problem, before Spring Boot, we were supposed to do a lot of configuration. But now in Spring Boot, what you simply do is you go back to your controller, on top of your controller, just say at the rate cause origin. Okay, that's it. Nothing changes. By doing this, just restart, and I don't see any error in the console. That's a good thing, okay? Now, let me go back to the uh, browser and hit this URL without the front end. It works for the same resource or when you're accessing the, from the browser directly. But when you try to access through the browser or to, through the front end, let's refresh and you got the data. So that was the issue and it was giving you error. So whatever data was there in the database, now you can see on the front end. So what is this? Uh, okay, so I have to go back to 100. So this is how it looks like. I will go with the dark mode. This looks good compared to the white mode. Doesn't matter. Okay, so we got different products here. And as you add more products, you will see that here. Of course, when I click on add product, this feature is still not here. Uh, so in the upcoming videos where we talk about add product, we'll change the front end as well. Home is this. If you click on the disco, it will take you to the disco homepage. Okay. And if you click on categories, it's not, it's not enabled yet. Uh, cart is also not working. If you can see, search will also not work. Add to cart button from here will also not work. So we have to enable this. Also, when you click on each product, I want to see their description. So let's say if I click on Swift, so what exactly the cart features are. So I want to know those things. So maybe the features like easily damageable or not safe card. On the other hand, next on safe card. Again, I'm not promoting a card or saying anything. It's just that. Opinions. Anyway, so let's go back to the front end and let's see what is happening in the front end, how you are sending the request. So this is the page on the home page. When you refresh the page, it will hit this URL, which is, uh, which is mentioned before. And whatever data you get, it will be set in the products. And using that products, we are running a map. And for each product, we are basically running, uh, it's like a loop kind of stuff and you are fetching each element and you're printing or you're showing on the screen, okay? Uh, it's looking beautiful because of the CSS, otherwise it's simple stuff. Now, how do you make other things? Basically, if you see there is also add product, but uh, it says coming soon, there should be some more code here. And uh, for search also, we'll, we'll have that. So it's navbar, I think it's not implemented yet. So yeah, so in this video, we have talked about the cause origin, which is mentioned here and we have solved this problem. So now the front end and the back end is connected and now we can focus on the next parts. So now it's time to go one step forward. So basically in the last video we have seen how do you get all the products on the screen, right? But now what if you want to know about each product? What I'm talking about is, let's go back to the front end. So I have changed the front end for this video. So you'll see that in, in the description and uh, let me open that uh, new code in VS Code, yeah, okay. So this is the front end too, as you can uh, go with the names. So the first one was one, this is two, so this is a different UI. Nothing much changes, only one particular change. So if I click on SRC, you can see there's a folder called components. Inside this component, there's folder called a uh, product. So basically, uh, let's go back to, first of all, the home. We don't have navigations here, right? Navigations is, is here. So I can basically get into get on the products and I can call this product, which is here. Now what is happening in the products is, so basically your client will send a request to the server for one product, not all. Of course, you will get all first because of this page of home page. But then if you click on one of the product, it will send a request to the server and it will send the ID of that particular server. 
of, of the particular product. So this is where the, we are sending the ID. So of course on the back end we have to handle that. Okay, uh, so that's something we'll do in this video. But before we do that, I want to make for some more changes, or maybe I will do it uh, do it after. So once we complete this, we'll make those changes. What I was talking about. Okay. So how do you make it work? How do you get this particular ID, or how do you get a product with the ID? Uh, so let's run this and to see what we are expecting. So I have to run this. I will say npm install, and there is no problem. I will say npm run dev. It's running on this port number. Let's head back to this port number here. Okay, it says something went wrong is because we don't have our database. Okay, uh, or we don't have a server running. So let's go back to the code and let's run the server. Okay, no problem for the server. You can say it says Tomcat started. And now it, if I head back here, if I say refresh, uh, you can see the products on this page. But then with the new UI, I can actually click on a particular product. So if I click on this, uh, it says loading, but nothing will happen, okay? Because the server is not configured to uh, do this. You can see the uh, request here, it says product slash one. Uh, I can just go back here and inspect element, console, and let's refresh this to see what happens. Okay, we got an error. Basically, we are not able to send the request because we don't have the backend ready. So let's go back to the backend and let's add it. So in the controller, we'll go back to this controller and add one more method. In fact, we don't need hello world at this point, so I can just remove this part now. And let's add one more method. Now this is going to return only one product, not the list of products. So I can simply say product, and the method name will be, let's say, get product. Okay, now one thing if you remember, we have talked about this before, you are sending the number, you're sending the ID right in the URL. So if you see here, we are sending product slash one. Okay, so in that case, I will just map it with uh, get mapping and we'll say slash product slash, I can't say one is because the number might change. So in that case, I will accept that in the ID format. And we have to also accept that here. So I will say path variable and then int ID. So this is where it will be mapped. And once you got the ID, I can get a particular product. But who will give me this particular product? So of course I can say return service. You are responsible to get me the product. So I will say get product uh, baby by ID. So get product by ID and we'll pass this ID here. But unfortunately, we don't have this method in this service. So what I will do is I will ask my IDE to create this get product by ID method. And of course, even the service will not do anything. Service will ask the report to give the data. So it will say, hey, report is your jobs return report dot. Uh, now we can't say find all because find all will give you all the products. We want the one. Uh, so in that case, we have to search by, yeah. So you can see we have find by ID method. So we'll use this and let's pass the ID. Okay. Now this will not work is because of this. Uh, find by ID returns you the optional product, not the product. Because there might be a chance that in the database, we don't have any product with this particular ID. So it will return null and then you will get null point exception. So we don't want it. So to save site, it says, I will return optional. It is your job to handle it. Now I can handle it. I can check if the product is present, only return, only return this, otherwise we can run something else. Or I can simply say get, it will give me the product, okay? Or better way is uh, say or else. If the product is not there, in, in that case, it will, you can return a blank product uh, by sending value, let's say of zero. Okay, there are a lot of values you have to set. Okay, so what I will do is I will uh, simply keep it empty so that you will get all the null values or default values. Not a good option, okay? Uh, properly, you should implement this uh, with the status code and something, but we'll set the status code later. At this point, just keep it simple. It'll return the empty product. Or you can even say get, even that works. But again, not a good idea. Okay, so at least if you have a product, it will give you. That's what we are doing now. So now after making these changes, I hope this will work. So I will just refresh and it says, Okay, still, okay, our table created, all the steps have been done, started on Tomcat. Let's head back to our browser and let's close this. Let's go back to homepage. We got all the products and this time let's click on some other car and we got it. You can see this says Honda City, cool. Uh, 
So this is how basically you get it. Few changes. I don't know why it is coming out of stock. We'll check this later. But if you see the date here, this is weird. Okay, we don't want to show product listed on this. You can do two changes here. Either you can make these changes in the front end. You can simply get it. And using React, you can change this value. You can read this value and convert it into DDYY, I mean DDMMYY format. Or we can directly store this type of data in the database in a different format. Let's see how we can do that. In that case, what I will do is I will go to product. And on top of release date, this is where you have to make a change. Uh, so you can basically change the way you store data in database or the data in database, okay? And the way you can do that is with the help of the Jackson library we have used. So Jackson is a library which we use to convert your object into JSON, JSON to object, but it can be used to change other formats as well, which is date format here. And the way you can do that is by using the JSON format. So this is the annotation we have to use, JSON format and specify what you want to change. Uh, so basically I want to show this in a string format. So it's a control space. It can be done with the help of shape and we have to use a format. I want to use a string format. So this is control space and we got string. Then the next thing you have to mention is the pattern in which format you want to store it. So I will say pattern and the format which I have is DD MM YYY. So it will basically make my job easy. So by doing this, we are changing the format, how it will look, okay? Uh, so restart the application. I think I've done that. So let's go back to the browser and click on home. So we got the products and if I click on one product, uh, now look at the format. So this is much more readable for the Indians at least. I'm not sure uh, which format we use all over the world. D different countries with different formats, but uh, this I'm very familiar with. So whatever format you prefer, you can change that. Uh, so you can say it says the day, uh, it says 30. Uh, this is weird. This is not 30. It should be 14th. Okay. I think I have to make M capital. You know, date formats are always headache. Okay. So I started refresh and hit. Okay. Now it looks good. So capital, we have to make the M capital. Okay. Now it looks good. So this is how basically you can uh, do that format, uh, date format stuff. Uh, what else we can change? Uh, this is working. We have made the product controller worked, right? Uh, for the particular ID. Now, there's one more thing I want to talk about. See, if you go back to Postman, so let's say if I'm not using the uh, client, uh, uh, the React client, I, I'm using Postman as a client. And if I, when I hit this, you got this response, right? But maybe it's a good idea to send your own status code. We are not sending it, okay? And sometime in the front end also, if they want to handle the errors and stuff, if you send a proper status, you have to send the status. That's important, okay? How will you send status? Because we are not doing that. It's a default, these are the default HTTP status which we are getting. So we are not doing that here. So instead of returning this, we should return the data as well as the status. And the way you can do that is by using something else. And that something else is called the response entity. So instead of returning the list of products, return the response entity object of type list, list, list product. So I will say response entity of type list of products. So by doing this, we are not just sending data, but also the response entity. So we can have status there, but then you can't return a product where it is asking you for the response entity. So what you have to do is you have to create object of response entity. And in the bracket, you pass this object. And the benefits are with the object, you can also pass the status code. So maybe I want to pass HTTP status dot. So we have inbuilt object. You can see we have uh, okay. Uh, you, can, you can send uh, something else as well. Maybe anything. You can also say found if you want to do that. I think that's the only thing matching here apart from okay. So I will say okay. Uh, we can also use created when you create a product. Now we are not doing that. We are simply sending a response. So uh, okay works. If you are not comfortable with this syntax, what you can also do is you can create a list of products separately, uh, get the products and then pass the object of list of products here. So if, I mean, it's dependent upon you how you want to do it. So this is one way, this is one thing. Uh, we can also do it for this, but let me just run this, how it will look like for all the products. Just restart the application. You know, after making the changes, we have to check if that work, that is working. So let's get back here, refresh, it is working, it is working. But then the front end, if you are working on front end as well, if you have more control, depend upon the status code, you can change the way you show data. Uh, and you can also check that in Postman. But of course, you will only get OK because we have not done that. Uh, we have sending OK. But let's see if I send something else. I'm not sure. I've never tried this found. I don't know the status code for this. We can check it. You can click on found and found returns 302. So let's check what status code you get on the Postman. So head back here, click on send. Okay, 
So I was still not started. Started now, okay. So you got data, but you can see the status code is 302 found. And this is not a good idea. So good status is always 200 series. So we'll say, okay. Let's change the product as well. So here also we'll use response entity. So from now we are going to focus on response entity, not just the product or the data. So here also we'll say new response entity. We'll put that here. Looks good. And we send the status. Now, since we are doing this, we have we can do one more thing. Now, since we are sending the status, don't you think we should also check if the product is there? Uh, so I can check if, first of all, let's get the product. Product, uh, one product. Product equal to service dot get product by ID. We'll send this. And that's what we are doing here, right? Uh, on this line. So we don't have to say this now. We can send the product itself. But we can check if the product is not null then only you send this response right but what if the product is not there in that case you can return something else you can return new response entity we have one more constructor which takes only the status so i will say http status dot uh, not acceptable you're yeah, not found so we can say not found so this is one way uh, to handle this let's uh, relaunch it so let's head back to the postman and now send a request for let's say one uh, we have it, so it will get data. But what if you said 12? We don't have any product with 12, I hope. And you got error. And this is where you are getting because of this. So I have to make one more changes in the... Because I was assuming that you will get data and we don't have it. Uh, so I will say or else return null. Let's work with null. Because anyway, I'm checking that on the client side, right? I mean, from the controller. So send, this works, 12. And you can see it says not found. So this is what I want to I wanted to return. See, there are multiple ways to handle the situations. Um, I'm going for this approach, looks easy, uh, but depending upon uh, different scenario, we can use different approach. Again, sending null is not a good idea. Uh, we have to find some other way of doing that. Cool. So this is how basically you get one product and we have done that here as well. So it is working. Now it's time to move to the next step. Now this step is a bit crucial, not exactly crucial, but then uh, difficult. To understand uh, because when I was doing this before the video uh, there are a lot of moving parts and there are a lot of uh, things we have to take care of because we are not just doing adding of the new product because that's what we have discussed right uh, so we have talked about getting all the products and we are getting those products on the page so just to show you the browser this is what we had so if I see here we got the products and if you click on this uh, you will also get the items that is working right uh, but now what I want to do is I want to basically have images as well. So with each product, I want to get their image because that will make it more interesting, right? So because when you go to any website or any e-commerce website with the product, you also get that image. And of course, when you click on this thing on the left-hand side, also, I want an image. Next thing I want is the ad product. Of course, this is not there. So we have to change the UI as well. But all I want is this option of adding a product. And when you add the product, I also want to add the image. Now the tricky part here is if you see, uh, not this, if you see our code, this is the UI. If you see our code in the product, we don't have any variable which handles the image. If we, we have ID, name, uh, description, uh, brand, price, category, uh, release date, availability, and quantity. Nowhere we are talking about image, okay? So that's something we have to add. So now, this time we'll go for the new uh, UI. Okay, so we have updated the UI for the for this particular section, and we are going to use the new UI. And the new for the link for the new UI, you will find in the description. Okay, but in the new UI, you don't need to handle this because it has been handled in the UI itself. So we don't have to convert that by uh, by doing it in Java. So the uh, in UI also we have done this, so we can remove this. So you got the idea, right? We can do that from the backend as well. Now I'm re removing it, so we'll handle that in the UI. Now what are the variables we need and what is a new UI? So let's see the new UI first. Uh, this is the front end tool for the previous section. Uh, I will open the new UI, so I will say open. So this is where I have my new UI, which is the front end three. I will open this. I should have stopped the earlier one. Oh, it was stopped. Okay, I've not stopped it. Maybe the same port now we cannot use. Let's see, let's see. So I will close this and now I will open the terminal. In the terminal, basically I'm going to uh, do the same thing. NPM install, same steps which you have done before. 
Uh, since new projects, I will just do that once again, run dev. And okay, so running on the same port number, so it was top automatically, I'm not sure. So if I click on this, it will open the new UI. It is opening on the other screen. I will open that here. Okay, this is a new one. Uh, this is an old one, or which is a new one. Okay, so it, it got refreshed automatically. Anyway, this is a new UI. And what is missing here is you can see that we got the products, but then this thing here, it was an image, and we are not able to show the images because we don't have the image from the back end. Next, when I click on this, on the left-hand side as well, this is where I want the image. So I, will, I want to do that as well. And how do we do it? And also we got the add product page. Now this is where you will enter your product name, brand, description, price, uh, which category it belongs to, the quantity, the release date of the product, and the image. Okay, now this, this is basically tricky but image, but other, other things are easy. Now if you're following from a long time, from the start, you know how do we create a new product or how do we create a new object and send it and save that in database, we know that. But the tricky part here is to handle the image. So we'll do that. We'll do that step by step. So let's get back to our IDE. Uh, in fact, we should talk some, uh, we should see the code in UI as well. Uh, I'm looking at the core UI with you, so just bear with me. Where are the changes would be? Nothing in app, uh, category, use state. Okay, we got product with ID, this was there before. It will give you, we also got cart uh, option. So if I click on cart, we can also see the cart, but we'll do the cart part later, not in this video. And we'll do add, add product, this is what I want to do. And how the add product page is built is, is with the help of this. So in this, we are changing the product and image separately. So we got two different uh, methods to do that. We got set product and set image. So basically we are fetching them individually. So we are fetching the product here, or we are sending the product. This is the post. And for image, image will be loaded, right? So that will call that function. Just calling handle image change handle image change is calling a set image. Okay, makes sense. So this this is how basically you are sending the request for the ad product. And on the home page also we have a change because not just the product data, but we also want to show the image. And for the image, we are sending the request separately. If you can see, we are sending the request for each product. So we are using a map for iteration and for each product with a different ID, we are sending a request for the image. Okay. So since in the UI we are using this format, let's say use the same format in the backend. So the request would be product slash the product ID. If the product ID is one, it will be product slash one slash image, product slash two slash image. That's how it will go. So it will fetch the image for a particular product. Uh, since it's not in database, it is giving you that blank icon, but that's what it is there in the UI. I don't think there's much change apart from that. There's also cart, but then we'll be, using, we'll be doing cart later. In product, individual product also, we are going to uh, supply the image. So same URL, you can see product slash one slash image or product slash two slash image. So same URL we are going to use. So in the back end, basically we have to build two URLs, one for adding a product and one for getting that image. Okay, so let's do step by step. Let's go back to our code. And the first thing you're going to do is change this product. So for the image, I need three things because when you send data on a client side, you have to also specify the content type of the image. Uh, not all formats are supported. Maybe someone is sending the malicious executor file or some JavaScript file. So make sure that you go for images like JPG. So that's something you can check on in the front end side. So you have to specify what type of content you are working with. So this image actually can be a file. So file name, file type, and uh, file data. So we can also say image data, that's fine. So I will say private string image name, uh, then private string image type, and uh, the data, so I will say private. Now what type of, how do you store your data? So basically, there are multiple ways of handling with images. You can store the image on some uh, cloud storage, okay, and you can get the link of it. So you can store the URL of that cloud storage in your database, that's one way. Uh, we went for the simple way because otherwise we have to sign up the AWS account, store the image there, so multiple steps, right? So just, just to keep it simple, I'm storing the image in database. Again, not a great idea, but it works. So I'll be using a byte array because we are going to store that in a byte format and I will say image data. Now, whenever you work with this type of data like byte array, which you want to store in database, we have to store that as a large object. So we have to use annotation for from persistence, which is lob, which is large object. Okay, so this is what we have done. 
And now if you run this, you will get a different database, different table. And since I'm working with images, I don't want some preloaded data. So I will, okay, let's have the same preload data and let's see what happens. So let's reload this to see what is a database change we are getting. So this is loading. Okay, Tomcat started. Uh, I will be going to my console, S2 console. Okay, refresh, default data. I will say product and star. So you can see we got this data, but we got three more columns. We got image data, image name, and image type. And all are null. You know why? It's because we have not specified this thing in the data.sql. But I don't want it actually, because image is not there. Uh, I have to manually update each image. We can do that in the update feature, but then we are not working on update now. So I will just go with the blank data and I will type each object. Tedious task, but we have to do it, right? So what I will do is I will just delete this or maybe I will just change the name of it. I hope by changing name, it will not be loaded. So let's do SQL1. Uh, next, I want to, so we have, the, we have made the changes in the product and we have seen that it is reflecting in database as well. It's time to accept the new uh, product. So I will create an object, I will create a method here for the new product. So I will say public, will return the response entity itself with some data. And I, I may return any type of data, so I will say put in question mark because I'm not sure we might return the data or we might return exception. So we'll have it both. Uh, I'm not exception, but only the status if something went wrong. Uh, next, I will say add product. Now the question is what kind of mapping we are, we are going to do. So of course we have to do the post mapping. So post mapping and the URL is simply slash product. Nothing else, just a product. Because we are sending, sending data in the body, right? So this is where you are send, going to send data. Now, if it is a normal product with it, without the image, it's very simple. You can use request body and we can simply say product, product. Our job is done, right? It will accept the product object. But the tricky part here is we are sending the image as well, which is a different format. So instead of using a product uh, or request body, we'll be using the request part. Now request part and request body is a bit different. Request body accept the whole object or the whole JSON as object. Request part will accept in a part, in a part, as the name suggests, right? In two different parts or multiple parts. So request part, for product, you will accept in product, but for the image, we'll do that the next line. So I will say request part and we'll accept the image. Now image itself is a file and we'll accept that as a multi-part file. Yeah, multi-part file. And we'll store that in the name called image file. You can also say image, that works. But image file is here. Now once you got your data, we have to send this data to the next layer. Who's the next layer? We have service layer, right? How are we are going to send this? So I can simply say, hey service, uh, add the product, whatever I'm accepting, and I'm going to pass you two things. I'm going to pass you the product, and I'm going to pass you the image file. So you just take care of storing that in database. But I also want to check if it is actually getting stored. So what I will do is, I want it to return me a product. Mm, I will say product, okay. And what if something goes wrong? So we also have a product name here. Let's say product one. And okay, how we are going to get the error? So let's say if something goes wrong with the add product, it will throw the exception, right? So what I can do is I can set that in a try catch. So I will try to add the product. If it is not working, if I get the exception E, so in this case, I will simply return the uh, some other response, okay? But if, some, if everything goes wrong, I will return new response entity in which I'm going to save the product, which is the new, which is the saved project in, in the database and also the status code. The status I want to save is HTTP status dot created. But what if something goes wrong? In that case, I'm going to return the response object, new response entity, but we'll send only the status, not the object itself. Or maybe I can send the message. So e dot get message. So it will send the other message. Again, uh, these things will be handled from the client side. So whatever message you're sending, client can decide they want to show it or they want to handle their own way, but I'm sending the message. With message, I also want to st send the status. I will say status dot uh, for error, it should be internal server error, something went wrong, but also we are sending the message. So at least the client will know what is going wrong. Okay, so we got add product, but it's not there in the service. So let's create this. I will just click here and say, hey, create this method called add product and now the next step goes here. How do we do this? How do we add a product? It's actually quite simple, right? 
we can add a product by saying hey repo save the product it's so simple right get the uh, product from the uh, from the controller control send it to service and we are getting in the service from service send it to repo job is done right uh, but actually no because we don't just have to send the product we have to also send the image right now this is tricky to send the image basically we have to get the image and we have to convert that image into bytes remember this database we are showing that in a bytes format okay so we have to get the bytes format and not just that we have to also get the name of the image and the type of the image so in the product we'll say uh, set the image name and how will you get the image name so i will say image file dot get name in fact not name it will not return we have some other method yeah it's original file name product dot set uh, image type so i say image file dot get content type and then we have to set the image as well so image data and this will be your image file dot we have to convert it into bytes and we have a method called get bytes okay it might throw an exception yeah so we have to add the signature it might throw an exception so i'm throwing io exception and once you have all the image data in the product i can simply say return uh, so whatever you save will be returning it here and it, it should be stored in database i hope this will work so what we have done is we got the product we got the image uh, we got image details and set that in the product data or product object and then we are saving it so this should be stored in the database that's the first step let's try let's see what happens i will relaunch it and if something goes wrong we'll solve it right we know how to solve it as now so tomcat got restarted i will go back to my browser i have to move multiple pages and here i will click on home okay it says nothing is visible so i will click on add product let's add some product i will say sam mobile the brand is samsung some description price 99 dollars uh it's a type of mobile stock is let's say four date release date is let's say first june image i got in my downloads so that's the image here available yes click on submit okay it says product added successfully but when i click on okay and if i click on home image is still not there okay so we'll solve this but i want to see if the image actually has been sent on the in the database for that i will go to h2 and if i click on product okay so i think i have to reload yeah connect product run okay we got the product and if you can see uh, we got okay something went wrong with the description we'll check that later uh, but we got we got the image we got the image name we got the image type we got the name of the phone price quantity okay so this two things we have to sync up i think there is something wrong with the communication between the client and the server but that is something will resolve it it, it is might be some name issue but the problem but the main thing is we are able to send the image but why the image uh, product details are not coming up what i will do is i will just go back here and just i just want to print whatever we are receiving in product just to see uh what is missing from the client side add product also sam m brand samsung some description 88 dollars so phone stock 6 release date 1 image available submit product added but now i want to see what is coming on the console on the console it's sending id0 makes sense and one okay so description is not getting sent from the client itself so some there's some issue with the ui we'll get it resolved and we'll replace the link if i got it to that but the most important thing is we are sending the image separately and that's why you got null here but we'll we'll solve that it's nothing not a big issue i think these are the names we have changed right that's why there was a issue anyway uh okay i also we are not even loading the default data so that is working but what about the image why it is not loading the image it's because if you see the ui the image is getting fetched as a separate url and this is something we have to build okay so uh, we need to work on this not just on the product page but also on the home page it is requesting for that uh, url and now we have to search for that url where it is doing that yeah it's here 
So we just have to build this thing and it will work. We just have seen how do we add a new product, but with the help of image as well, uh, with the help of multi multi-part file. And we are getting the details about the image and storing that in the product. And then we are saving the product in database. So now let's work with that image part. So in the UI, where is the UI? Where is the UI? In the UI, when I click on home, you can see the image is not coming here. And even if I go inside, it's not working. And apart from this, there were multiple issues. The first one is it's still showing out of stock. So we'll solve that. And I think I know the problem. In the description also, we were getting that empty, right? So if I click on here, there's no description. We have entered the description. Also, it is not showing the stock. It's because in the UI and in the, uh, in the backend, there's a name issue. So name is same, brand is same. Description, what we are using is only uh, the dis disk, not description. So if I change this, I think it will affect some somewhere else. I'm not sure, uh, but I think I have to change that in the front end. Yeah, so I have to change it everywhere. So I know the problem, you will solve this, I know. Uh, so in your code, uh, in the back end, change this uh, names, or maybe I will just change that fast. Okay, what I will do is I will just go back to the product. Now, since we are making this mistake from start, so let's resolve it. Description, what is what available? It's product available, stock quantity. What else was there? Stock quantity, product available, release date. And there was one more issue, description price, category. Yeah, I think these are the only issues. Okay, but if I change this, I think I have to change somewhere else as well in the service. Anywhere we are using it, no, good. In rep also no change, in the controller also no change. Okay, looks good. So those are the thing, uh, things we have to change. And now let's work with the image. So in the controller, uh, we have to work for that URL, right? So which URL I'm talking about is in the home, this URL. So product slash, I will just copy this. This is what you have to work on. So let's go back to our code and create a method for this or create a mapping for this. So it's public and we are going to return the response, response entity in the entity, the type will be byte array because we are going to send the image, right? Byte array, and I will say get image by product ID because that's what we are going to pass because the mapping is get mapping in the URL. This is the URL, right? So instead of saying product ID, I will simply say ID. Or maybe product ID will look good. Why there's a mistake here? Okay. So let's complete this method now. And there was an issue with the method name. And here we have to accept the name. So I will say product, uh, product path variable, uh, integer product ID. And let's work with this. Now, how will you get the image? So of course the image will be coming in the product itself, right? So we'll fetch the product and we'll save that in our product. So I will say product, product equal to, and who will give me the product? It is service. So I will say service, hey service, get our product by ID and the ID we already have now. So this will give me a product. Now from this product, I want to get the image. In which format? In the bytes format. So I will say byte array image file equal to. How will you get this? So I will say, hey product, get me the image data dot get me the bytes. Okay, get image data is itself is a byte, right? Yeah, it's a, itself is a byte. So we got the bytes. We don't need the name of it, but we'll need type because on the client side, we have to send the content type, what type of content we are working with because there might be some issues, so we'll send the content up as well. So let's return the data now. So since we have the image, so I'll say return, this time we want to send the content up as well. So I will use a different format, response entity, because it has multiple ways of doing this. Uh, you can send the okay, which is the status, and we can say dot, I want to send the content type as well. The content type is, okay, content type is media type. So we have to say media type, dot, uh, we have to use value type, value of, and you have to mention the type of the content. And how will you get the content type? So we'll say product dot get image type. Uh, apart from this, so we, have, we are sending the status, okay. Then we are sending the content type. We have to also send the data, right? So data will be going, going in a body, not boy, body. And the data itself is image file. Okay, looks good. So we got the product. Then we got the image in the byte format. We are sending a response by sending okay. We are sending the content type, which is the get con get image type. And then we are sending the image file. Uh, you just try out without the content type. I tried before this, there was some issue and uh, this has resolved it. You try it without it and let me in the comments if it is working for you. So now with this, let's refresh. I hope this will work. 
scope. But again, when you restart, we have to create the object once again. So let's try. So Tomcat started. Uh, let's go back here, click on home. You can see no product available. I will say add product. I will say Galaxy M. That's the phone name. Brand is Samsung. Best phone, $999. Okay, that's a huge price for this phone. $500. It's a mobile phone. Stock is five. Uh, release date is let's say 1st June. Image picked. Product is available. Click on submit. It says product added successfully. That's great. Okay. Click on home. Oh, we got the image. Okay. So that's a good thing. Click on this. And uh, okay, description is still not there. Okay, description is there. Yeah, it is best phone. Uh, stock is now five. So we have solved that problem. It says add to card. So yeah, the names were the issue. And we got the image. It's huge, but then that is something CSS issue, not our issue, right? I can click on add to cart. It says add it to the cart, but we have to manage this in the back end. Oh no, that's a UI, UI feature anyway. Uh, now I will add more products. I'll say sports shoe. Brand is Nike. Walk-in code, price 99. Category fashion. Stock is let's say only one. Uh, date of release is today. Image, I hope I have picked this shoe image. Available, submit. Product added successfully. Great. Click on home. Yeah, we got two products. So like this, one, uh, like this, we can add more products and we can see that here. And if I click on this, this is what we got. Okay, things are working out, looking good. So this is how basically you integrate the front end and back end. Uh, so for a particular URL, you have to build the API so that the front end will get the data. And that's what we have done. Cool stuff, right? Uh, we can handle this more because we are actually not checking while sending the data that if the product is already there. What if you are sending an ID and the product is not there? What you will send? So we can handle that here using try using if else stuff. And yeah, so this is working. So once we have done with the create and read, it's time to do the update and delete. The thing is, uh, the UI which you are working with, I'm not sure it has the update and delete feature. I can't see that here. So we'll be going for a new UI. So we'll replace this. First of all, I will just stop this, what was running here. And let's open the new UI. So I will go to file, open. And this is where I have all the UI. Now this is the latest one. So this ecom uh, frontend 4, I will upload that in the, I mean, you will find the link in description. I will open this and open. So this is our new UI and we need to make it work. So again, the same steps which we have done before. I will go to terminal. I will click on new terminal. And here I will say, okay, don't restart now. NPM install, that's the first step. The next step is we have to say NPM uh, run dev. Okay, so this is running. I will click on this thing. It is opening on some other page. I'll just take it here. Okay. So here we got two products. Now this is because in the database we already have uh, two things I have not restarted my uh, database yet or the back end yet. It's only the front end which is uh, changed. And now when I click on any of the product, you can see we have this button now which is update and delete. I'm not sure in the old UI it was there. Please let me know in the comments or I will just check that after the video. But we got this button now, update and delete. And when I click on update, it should open the update form. So we'll have all these details and I can change the category of this. Maybe I will just put that into electronics now. And the number of quantities, I want to make it seven. Uh, let's keep the same image and we click on submit. So it says failed to update the product. Try again. So what went wrong? Of course, we don't have a URL or we don't have an API which will handle the update. But which URL it is heading? So let, let me just uh, check my UI. So if I go here in the components, I don't see update. Yeah, we have the update. So we have update product and it is, the, it is hitting the URL for put, okay, where's a put request? Yeah, so this is a put request and we are hitting a URL which is uh, localhost colon 8080 slash API slash product slash ID, but the put request, okay, that's important, put request. And what type of data we are going to send? So from this, we are going to send three things. One, of, one, of, one thing is, of course, the ID. Next is the product and the multi-part uh, image. Okay, so we are going to send three things, the ID, the multi-part image, and the product. So for this, we have to create a API. We also have a delete option. I will show you the delete one. 
so delete product is getting called. So I'm into product.jsx and yeah. So this is the delete request. So for delete also we have the same thing, same URL, but the method is different, okay? And in delete we don't have to send the product data or uh, the image, we just have to send the ID, okay? So these are the two URLs, just remember, these are the two URLs we have to work with. And for this we have to create the API. So let's head back to our project and let's create these two controllers. Uh, so the first control I'm going to create is this for the update. So let's say public and we are going to return the status with some text. So I will say response entity and it is string and I will say update product. Now as I mentioned we are going to accept three things but then what will be URL? Uh, we have to use put mapping for the update and the URL is slash product slash the ID and that ID we have to accept here with the help of path variable. So I will say path variable int ID. That's the first thing. Apart from this, we can just take it from the uh, post mapping. You can say we are accepting these two things. So I can simply use it. Are we on the copy pasting? We are just reusing the code, right? That sounds better and open close. So this, this is the update method which we have. Okay, so when I say update, who is going to update this? Of course, I will ask my service to update the product. So I will say update uh, product. And I want my update product to also return me something. So it should return the product which is updated. And maybe based on that, I will return something. Maybe I will say product one. And here we have to send those three things. We have to send ID, we have to send the product and we have to send the image file, three things, okay? And if you receive the product or if, if there's nothing wrong, so product one, if it is not equal to null, in that case, I will return the new response entity by sending two things. I will send the text first, which is updated. And then I'm going to send the status, which is okay or created. Okay, okay looks good. So I will say, okay. And else I will return new response entity. We'll send the message, failed to update, and we'll pass the status dot, uh, maybe bad request or bad, yeah, bad request works. Okay, so uh, this is the thing, but then this is not working, right? So the actual logic goes into the update product now. This is a bit complex. So what I will do is I will just go back here and say create method update uh, product. See, it is complex because we are also working with the image. If it is simply product, there is no problem. But since we also have an image here, then we have to make some changes. Now, it's very simple actually. You can simply use your repo by saying, hey repo, uh, I want to save because even if you want to update, you will use a save method. You can simply pass product, okay? Uh, it's our, it's, I mean, it depends upon us if you want to use the ID or if you don't want to use the ID because I can simply skip ID if, if I want. I can simply update this. But there's one more issue with this. What if the product is not there? Of course, no one can send an update request if the product is not there, right? Because we are working with the UI. But anyway, let's imagine if someone is sending a request directly with the, the update request and the product is not there, it will create the product. So maybe you can have a check if the ID is present so that for that reason, we can use the ID. Otherwise, the code which I'm going to write, I'm not going to use the ID. Okay, so what I was saying is we can uh, return, uh, we can return repo.say because this will return the product and that's what I'm returning here. But then it will not have the image. We don't have the image data right in the product. So before doing this, what I will do is I will uh, add, I will say product dot set image uh, data and I'll pick that from the image, image file dot get bytes. Now this get byte might throw an exception. Okay, so I will add to signature, I will say throw IO exception, but in the controller, then we have to use try catch. Yeah, this works. But then we are throwing the exception, we should return I will return this, yeah, bad request. Okay, yeah, the code looks big, but then if you see, we have a line for try, catch, uh, if else. So the simple code is just this update product, okay. But if I go back to service, this is the first thing you have to set. Uh, next, I also want to set the name of the image. I will say set image name, and that thing I will get it from the image file dot, uh, get original file name, and the type, product dot set image, and if you have a better option, let me know. I'm just trying what I have uh, explored, but if you have some other way of doing this, let me know in the comments. So what I'm doing is I'm updating the product and storing the product, and this should work now. And I hope this will work. Anything need to check? It looks good. Maybe we'll also write the code for the delete in one go. I don't have to type these things again. Uh, I will say delete mapping for which request. Delete mapping for slash product. 
slash id and here we'll write the method name as public even this will return the status so i will say response status with message so i'll say string and delete product this will accept the id so i will say path variable and accept the id we can check you know before uh, deleting it we can check if the id is there uh, i will go for a simple way so i will say hey service say delete delete product and pass the id you know actually which we should check otherwise we'll not be able to return the status right uh, so what i will do is i will just get the product first i will say product product is equal to service dot get product by id i will just pass this id and we'll check first if the product is not equal to null in that case it should uh, uh, delete and return something so I'll return the new response entity by passing a message deleted you know we should print uh, product successfully deleted or deleted works and then we'll send the status so http status dot uh, do we have anything for deleted let's see yeah we'll go for okay okay but what if the product is not there so in the else case I will return new response entity and we'll pass the message uh, product not found and return the status http status dot not found okay but then we don't have the delete method so i will just go back here and say create the delete method and in this we'll do very simple stuff i will say uh, repo dot delete and pass the id but i think for the id we have to use a different method it should be delete by id and pass the id that's it. And now we have basically worked with two methods. One is the update, uh, which is the put and delete. Uh, so put will work with the update. Uh, that's what we have done here. And this will send the request to the service. So things should work out. I'm assuming it will work. So let's restart the application. Okay, looks like there's no issue. Tomcat is running. And now I will open my uh, browser, okay? And in this, let's click on home. Now, the moment you say home, you lost all the products because we are... Uh, we have restarted the application. So I will say add product, Samsung Galaxy, uh, which will be M, brand, Samsung, some description, price, let's say $99, category, phone, or let's give a wrong category. Let's say, let's put it in electronics, and stock is, let's say, nine, date of release, 1st June. I have kept everything in the images. I will click on this. This, I hope that's a phone. And now, product available, submit. So we got the first product and okay that's here let's add one more gaming laptop not laptop laptop brand asus some description price 999 uh, category let's also put that in electronics we'll update this as well uh, stock 7 uh, release date is 1 or maybe we'll have a release date 12th of june images of laptop product available submit okay so we got two products now the first thing we are going to do is we'll update something. So let's go to the first product and what I want to update. Maybe I want to update this description and also the stock. So I'll click on update and we'll change this description. Best budget phone. Stock, I will reduce it to, let's say six. I don't want to change the image. Category, I will, uh, yeah, we have to also change the category to mobile. It was laptop. Uh, it was electronics, I think. And click on submit and we got it says updated you can see the message here and if i click on home now let's go back to this product description got updated the stock got updated and we have also changed something or maybe two things so that's how basically you can update what about delete so what i will do is i will delete this laptop here and click on delete so it says delete successfully uh, i can still see here maybe it was not refreshed refresh it's gone okay so again, the UI things, UI things need to be changed, but things are working out. So we have worked with the update and we have worked with the delete. Uh, so just to reiterate, what we have done is we have added the two methods, one for the update product and one for the delete product. In the update, we are accepting three things. Of course, we are not using ID, but we can if you want to check if the uh, product is there or not before updating it. Uh, otherwise, the save method will create a new product. Okay, so that's one thing you can check. Uh, again, that's up to you. If you if you have done it, let me in the comments. Others can also see your work. And we have done with delete. In the service, basically for updating, uh, it's very easy actually updating. We can simply use save method, but since it's, we have also have an image, uh, that, that's why we have this three extra lines. Otherwise, simply say works. And delete simple line because we're not working with images. We just say, hey, delete the product and our job will be done. 
So that completes the basic operation, what we wanted to do with this. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed. And if you have enjoyed, please do share with your friends. So now it's time to implement the next feature, which is a search feature. Now why search is important is because we are using data JPA, right? Which is Spring data JPA. And if you look at the repo layer, it's quite empty. So we are not defining any method or we're not even declaring the methods. We, we got all the methods from the JPA repository. So when things are simple, like uh, CRUD operations, it can be done with the help of JPA repository. But let's say if you want to find something which is not a primary key, because whatever we are doing now, if you're searching for a, if you're searching for a product by the ID, it is very easy, right? You can just use a product by ID and it works. Uh, but what about if you want to search with some other things? Example, if you want to search with uh, the name or I mean, the product name or the description or the amount, the quantity. I, I mean, that's weird, right? Why someone will search for by quantity? By quantity, uh, doesn't matter. You got the point, right? So if you have other fields to, to check with, how do you make it work? Because by default, it will not support. Example, if I go back to my product service and let's say in any of the method here, uh, let's say in the update itself, just just to check what can do we do. So if I say report dot, there are multiple methods, right? Uh, one of the methods is find by ID. So if you have the ID, you can do it. But we don't have a method using which you can actually find by name or any other field of the database. Now, what are the fields we have? If you go to product, uh, we got description, brand. Yeah, so let's say if you want to search by a brand. In that case, what you can do is, let's say when you search with a brand, and uh, of course, you can have multiple products of the same brand. In that case, you can define, you can declare, not define, you can declare your own method, which will return you the list of product and, okay, list of products. And then you can define, you can mention the method, you can mention find by, and you can mention the variable or the type, which is brand. And then you can, you can pass the brand here. Okay, so this is how basically you can achieve this. Now, your GPA does support this. Right, but then this is only for one field, or maybe you can have two fields. You can also have your and, and you can mention the next uh, variable. But let's say uh, you have multiple things to check with. Example, if you want to search, but then not just based on one field, or maybe multiple field, or maybe you have to you want to mention some customized uh, query. In that case, you can literally write the query, not the SQL query. You can, but then I don't want to write the SQL query. And that's where we we got something called a JPQL, which is JPQL, which stands for uh, JPA query language. So it is similar to SQL. The only difference is in SQL, we use tables. Here we have to use class name. In SQL, we use column names. Here we have to use the field names. Okay, so those are, those are the changes we have. Okay, uh, so the method which I want to do is, uh, which I want to write here is a method which will return the list of product. And maybe I will have the method name as search products. And then here you can pass the keyword on, on which you want to search. Right, so we can have this method, but this will not work. So by default, JP will not understand what search products uh, means. So, and that's why you have to mention the query. And the way you can do that is by writing at the rate query. So you can write the query here, okay? Now, what is a query? We'll see that in some time, but we have to mention the query in this uh, in this brackets. Okay, and of course, in the query, we are going to use keyword. Uh, so example, if you want to search something in, uh, in uh, SQL, so you say select star from the table, it's a product, where the product or the brand is equal to, and then you, you can use a like keyword and uh, you can put that in single quote, right? So what's a keyword you want to search with? So that's something we are, to, we are going to use here. But then if you want to achieve this, we have to also change our front end, right? So let's start with front end and then we'll come back here. So let me go back to my front end. Now this is a front end, right? Now in this front end, basically we don't have the search feature. So for that, I'm going to open the new front end. So, and you'll find the link in description. So I will say open folder. And this is the thing, which is ecom front end four. So this is the fourth front end which we are using. Of course, everything is iteration, so nothing new. Uh, and if I open that, uh, okay, I can simply say npm install. And by the time it is happening, let's look at the place where it is searching. Again, with you, I'm doing this for the first time. So I'll go to navbar. I'm assuming that it is navbar. And here it is. Uh, so you can see there will be search box and then every time you hit the keyboard or whenever, whenever you hit a key, it will call this function called handle change. Uh, let's see, where are we calling it? Yeah, so if you can see, uh, we have a handle change here. So with every input, every time you press the button, it will hit this query. Again, there are different way of implementing it. Maybe you can have a button. So once you type the entire text, you can hit the button. Uh, which is much more efficient in terms of uh, server load because you're not going to search the server for every key, but maybe we want to make that uh, 
more user uh, friendly just by typing a few letters if you can get the suggestions. Uh, so it is hitting that. And it's requesting for this URL. So this is what we have to work with. So search and then the value. Okay, so we are using question mark here in the front end. We can also use slash, but let's, so question mark makes sense here. So we are not going to use path variable because this for this we have to use something else. Again, we'll see that. So this is the URL we have to work with. So install done. Let me just say run dev and enter. So it's running on this port number now. Maybe earlier port number is busy. It says something went wrong uh, because the server is not ready. And this is what I was talking about. So if I search something, it should give some suggestions. There's no button here to say go, so you have to give the suggestion. So now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go back to my server or the backend. And in this, basically I will go back to my product service. We have, we have written this, let's remove the extra line. And go back to controller. So basically we need a mapping for that particular search. So I can create a public, it will return the response entity, which will return the list of products. And let's say the method name is search products. Now this will accept a string, right? It's a string keyword, which is coming from the client side. And for this, we are going to do mapping as well. So I will say request uh, or get mapping for the URL. So now we know the URL, it is slash product, slash. Okay, we don't know the URL. Uh, so slash product slash search is the URL. Okay, but then how we are going to accept uh, this particular thing here, which is name is value. Now in that case, of course it should be keyword, so you're searching for name. Okay, looks like I'm using a wrong front end. Okay, so we, let me open the fifth one. I think fifth is a correct one. I was, expe I was expecting that it will be keyword, but I got name. Uh, let me just check the fifth one. And yeah, so just keyword. So this is the correct one, not the earlier one. Uh, so what I will do is I will just do the same thing for this, which is npm install and npm run dev. So when this is using the same port number, Okay, uh, this is what I was looking for. So we have changed the uh, front page if the backend is not ready. Uh, okay, so my bad. So I was using the wrong UI. So I will share this link in the description, the fifth one. Okay, anyway, so let's get back to the code. And here I'm going to use the same thing because we are searching for keyword. I mean, we are passing the keyword in the URL. So it will accept that in the same name. Okay, once you have that, the next thing you have to do is we have to basically call the service method, right, to search it. Now the service method is going to return you the list of products. And I will say products is equal to, and I will use a product service. So I will say service dot uh, search products. Unfortunately, we don't have that method there but uh, we'll, we'll create one, so I will say keyword. So I want this method in the service. But let's say if you got the products, how will, you, how will you return the value? So I will say return, and now we have to return the response entity, not the products, and in the response entity, we have to return the products. And then you have to also give the status, which is dot okay, and done. But then we don't have this method, so let's create one in the service, and in the service, we are creating this method, now again, service will not do anything. Service will simply say return, and it will ask the repo, hey repo, search the products. And since we have created the method in this uh, repo first, we have that there, just pass this keyword. So service job is nothing much here, just pass it to the repo. Now in the repo, we are going to do the actual work, okay? I'm just confirming if everything is good in here. So looks good, nothing wrong. Let's go back to repo and let's write our query. Okay, now basically we have to use the JPQL, right? Not the SQL query. So it looks similar to SQL, so I will say select. And we don't say star, we say P. Now what is P here? Uh, so I will say from product, and mind you product is not a table here, it's a class name. And then this is the allies for it. So this P is allies for product, and that's what we are using here. And then we say where, and now after this where, we have to check for multiple fields. We got for name, brand, so we'll do that here. So I will say enter. Uh, now the first thing we can do is we can check for the name field. So I can say p.name because in the p we got the name, right? So we'll say p.name and let's match it with the keyword. Now how do we match it? Basically we can use like for matching this uh, text and then we can use the uh, percentage symbol because it might be having something front and back of it. That's how we do it in SQL. And in between we can pass the keyword. Now since keyword is basically, this is what you have to, it has to pick up, right? So we can use the uh, colon. So when you say colon, it will search for this field in the uh, parameters which you are passing. So that it, it solves. But this may not work. Uh, maybe because the text which you're searching for is small and in the database you got capital. So what you can do is you can convert everything here. So you can say lower. So these are some inbuilt functions we have. And here also I want to lower it. 
the keyword. Okay, so we are lowering, so we, these are the inbuilt functions we in JPQL, so we can use lower. It will convert this into a small letters and even this will do it. But the problem is we are concatenating this uh, percentage percentage with the uh, keyword, right? So instead of doing this, we have to use the method. So the method name is concat. I want to concat this particular percentage with the keyword and this keyword with the percentage. And since we are opening the brackets here, that is closed here. We are opening it here. We'll close it here. Now this is only for the name. What about uh, you want to have some more things? So you have to say or and enter more things here. Now, since I already have all the things written, so I will just use it here instead of typing. So I want to add more lines. I'll just paste it here. Looks like we got an extra bracket. Yeah. So this looks good. I'm just confirming if everything is correct. It's, it's tricky because even if you want to check what is happening, basically we have to first add those products and check it. Uh, and I have to do things multiple times. So I will just check it once. Okay, so from P where? Okay, looks good, looks good. So this should work. So basically what we are doing is we are converting every character, every text into lower and then comparing it with the keyword. So now once we have done this, uh, let's restart the application. Or in fact, we have not started even started this. So let's restart and see if that search is working. In fact, what I want to also do is here, uh, every time you call this search, I'll just print searching with, and let's also specify the uh, keyword on which it is searching. And doing that, let's restart. Okay, okay. So it's running on port number 8080, so no problem. Let me just go back to my uh, browser and let's refresh. So you can see it's no product available, so that means server is connected. And let's click on the search and search something. Let's say I want to search for Samsung phone. If I say S, okay, this is not working. Let me, let, uh, let me just add a product here. So I'm saying Sam phone, Sam mobile, Samsung, price 33, it's a phone, stock is three, date is this, choose a file, this is a phone, open. And now when I click on, Submit, product added. Okay, let's see if that works. Yeah, it is working, but now why it is not printing anything on the console? Let me restart once again. Okay, let's hit that. Now, again, when you restart, you will lose data. And if I say S now, what's wrong? Why it is not printing anything? Let me try for the home page. This is weird. Okay. It is saying hi, but why is not doing for the search? Okay, okay, I think I got the problem. The problem is we got here products, not product. Okay, I thought there's something wrong with the ID itself. <laughs> okay, let me remove this hi from the top. Oh, suddenly I started questioning my Java knowledge. Now get back here and if I say S, so you can say no product name with such name but it is searching with S. Now if I say something else there, if I say SA, it will hit it with SA. So every time you type something, it will search. But now to actually test it, we have to add some product. So I will go back here and let's say I'm saying Sam Mobile or brand Samsung and some description, budget phone. And here price 666, it's a phone, stock is two, date is current date or maybe 23. Let's pick up the phone image and Add, so that's the first product you have, which you have added. And now we got home here. Let's add one more to test it. Also giving laptop, brand is Asus. And fast machine, it's a laptop. Date selected, image selected, submit. Okay, so you can see we got two products now. How we are going to search? Let's say, let's say I want to search for Sam. And you can see when I'm searching for capital A, it is doing that, right? And if I click on Sam Mobile, we are getting this. Next, if I say a phone, so it still so shows Sam Mobile because in the in the uh, description we are saying it is phone, right? Next, we can also search by uh, something else, maybe gaming with the name itself. So we got gaming laptop. Uh, we can search a brand which is Asus, so we got gaming laptop. So that's how your search is working. Again, the UI is good and that's why you can see such uh, beautiful text here, but then you have to also make your backend work to get it work. Uh, 
So at least you now you know how do we write our own queries with the help of JPQL. So what you do is you use select uh, from similar to SQL. The difference is instead of using a table name, you have to use a class name. And then uh, these are not compulsory thing, but then since we wanted to make sure that the search should happen even if you write, don't follow the capital and small, and that's what you got here. And that's why we're using lower and all this stuff. So yeah, that's it from searching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. So now let's, in the upcoming videos, let's see something else and uh, we'll have fun. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.